Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this regular session of the Bloomington Common Council for Wednesday, December the 21st. We will begin this evening by asking our clerk to please call the roll. Smith? Yes. Volin? Here. Sims? Here. Scambalori? Here. Sandberg? Here. Rollo? Here. Flaherty? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. And Piedmont Smith? Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. To summarize our agenda this evening, uh, there are no minutes for approval. We will begin with reports from council members, followed by the mayor and city offices, council committees, and then our first opportunity for public comment this evening. We allow 20 minutes for people of the public to speak on matters not on this evening's agenda. We have a big agenda this evening. There are six items, so those of you who want to speak on each of those, there will be plenty of opportunity for public comment then, but this first opportunity is only for matters that we're not hearing on the agenda. Uh, we may limit the time depending on how many people are in chambers and also at home on Zoom who may want to make a public comment. Uh, then we move to appointments to boards and commissions before we move to legislation for second readings and resolutions. And those will be um, starting with A, Ordinance 22-40, an ordinance to amend Ordinance 22-26, which fixed the salaries of appointed officers, non-union, and AFSCME employees for all the departments of the City of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana for the year 2023 regarding to for reflect changes due to the execution of a collective bargaining agreement between the City of Bloomington and Local 2487 CBMC, AFSCME, and also a change affecting one additional job title. That is followed by Resolution 22-21 to approve the interlocal agreement between Monroe County, the town of Ellisville, and the City of Bloomington for animal shelter operation for the year 2023 followed by Resolution 22-22, approval of interlocal cooperation agreement between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County, Indiana regarding building code authority. And then next, Resolution 22-23, to approve an interlocal cooperation agreement between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County, Indiana in regards to the 2022 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant, or the JAG Grant. And then, Appropriation Ordinance 22-06 is next, an ordinance appropriating the proceeds of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds of 2022, together with all investments, earnings thereon, for the purpose of providing funds to be applied to the costs of certain capital improvements for public safety facilities and paying miscellaneous costs in connection with the foregoing and the issuance of said bonds and sale thereof and approving an agreement of of the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission to purchase certain property. Last on the agenda for second readings and resolutions is Ordinance 22-38 to amend the City of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning an 87.12 acre property for mixed use employment, ME, to mixed use institutional, MI, regarding the northeast corner of West Fullerton Pike and South State Road 37, Monroe County Government Petitioner. Legis there are no legislations for first reading, and so we will then go to a second opportunity for public comment that we allow 25 minutes for anyone wishing to make a comment on matters not discussed in tonight's agenda, followed by a, a discussion of our council schedule before we adjourn for the evening. This is our last council meeting of 2022, and again, we have a lot to get to. So without further ado, let me start with reports from council members, starting on my left with council member Piedmont Smith. Thank you. Thank you, council member Rosenbarger. Thank you. Thank you, council, council member Flaherty. No report this evening, thanks. Thank you, and to my right, council member Smith. No report, thank you. Thank you, council member Bullen. Two short things. Number one, please drive safely. Tomorrow and Friday, we are expecting blizzard conditions throughout the Midwest. Uh, the other is, uh, if you uh, haven't, if you're of the, the, a certain age, I think my age or older, you haven't gotten your third booster yet, they're now available, your third COVID booster. Uh, it's back on the, the increase. There are some people present tonight who are masked. Mask mandates are beginning to come back. It's wintertime, and 
uh, it's important that everyone look to their, if, if you're eligible, you should be looking into getting your uh, COVID booster when you can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Council Member Sims. No report. Thank you. Council Member Scambellori. Yes, three uh, quick items this evening. Um, first, at the request of President Sandberg, I want to follow up on Council Member Volan's statement regarding the winter weather that's coming uh, and share news from a public um, announcement earlier today. Warming centers will be open this Friday through Monday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the following locations. The Bloomington Fire Department Station headquarters at 226 College Avenue, Bloomington Fire Department Station 2 at 209 South Fairfield Road, the Ellettsville Fire Station at 5080 West State Road 46, and the Monroe Fire Protection District at 5081 North Old State Road 37. In addition, local community centers and shelters will be providing resources for those who need shelter, warmth, and other resources. Those include the Community Kitchen at 1515 South Rogers, the Shalom Community Center at 620 South Walnut, the Stride Center at 312 North Morton, and in addition, people needing overnight shelter can contact a friend's place at 919 South Rogers Street or Wheeler Mission at 215 South West Plex. Uh, two additional items. Um, first of all, it's a bit in advance, but I, my next constituent meeting um, will be coming up on January 7th at 1.30 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, the link for that, there is a join button on, at sue4citycouncil.com. Um, many of our issues will focus on District 2 in particular, but certainly anyone from throughout the city is welcome to attend. Um, finally, I wanted to provide an update for council members um, regarding the reproductive health care emergency grants. Um, by way of reminder, on October 19th, we passed Appropriation Ordinance 2204, um, making funds available for the reproductive health care emergency grant program. Uh, since that time, um, Beverly Callender Anderson, under her leadership, we have convened a committee that includes Debbie Herbenick, Shaquilla Smith, Marissa Parr Scott, Doris Sims, and Brooklyn Payne. That group met on Monday, December 12th, to review uh, the one application that we received in this round. Um, and as a result of those, that review and discussion, awarded a $15,000 grant to All Options uh, Pregnancy Resource Center. So I, I'm happy to answer additional questions or to share additional information. Um, but the remainder of, just to let folks know too, the remainder of those funds, um, we appropriated 100,000. The 85,000 that is remaining will be carried over to next year and will be made available for possible awards then. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Council Member Rollo, do you have any reports this evening? Well, just to say that, uh, thank you. Uh, one important topic that was raised at uh, Council Member Sandberg's and, and my constituent meeting was uh, pedestrian crossing on 7th Street. And I think that we should uh, consider placing stop signs back there for safe crossing, something maybe the council would like to uh, think about. In the meantime, uh, I, I might come forward with legislation uh, in the in the coming weeks uh, or months, uh, but I would like to to have a full throated discussion about that. Um, other than that, I'm just wishing all Bloomington residents a safe and happy holiday season. Thank you. Uh, that concludes reports from council members. I don't see any from the mayor and city offices, uh, but if there are any, uh, feel free to come forward. I don't see anything that's on the agenda, uh, so. If we have none, we will move on to any council committees that may wish to make a report. Do we have any this evening? And seeing none, we are to public comment, our first opportunity for public comment. Again, if I could ask Deputy Attorney Kulak to make the invitation to those folks who may be watching at home on Zoom uh, for anyone who wishes to make a comment not on this evening's agenda. Comment, you'll have to raise your hand you can do that using the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen or the more tab if you have a mobile device. Very good. If I could just get a show of hands of who here in chambers might want to make it public. One hand in chambers. All right. Any at the one hand on Zoom? Let's say five minutes then. So feel free to sign in and uh, state your name for the record. Make sure the microphone is pointed down to your mouth. It's uh, easier to hear you that way. And welcome. Thank you very much. Hello, 
Um, my name is Sydney Bolam. Um, I'll get signed in here. I'm sorry, that was Julie Vaughn? Sydney Bolam. So it's S-I-D-N-E-Y, B-O-L-A-M. Um, so I'm coming today from 4th Street Festival of the Arts and Crafts, and I am the committee president for the time being. This is actually my last act as committee president, and with me is the new president, Susan Hingle, and also our executive director, Brendan King, as well as a few of our other um, committee members. But anyways, um, we've come here tonight just because uh, we've come to thank the Board of Public Works and City of Bloomington for everything that they've done for us in almost our almost five decades of doing our art festival. So if any of you are not very familiar with Forest Street Festival, um, I printed out this nice statement written by Don Adams, who is a former president of our committee. And um, there's some nice details in here about our numbers and things like that. Um, it's a real undertaking. We've really grown through our almost five decades. Um, let me just go ahead and look at our numbers. So, yeah, we first began in 1977. Um, in that time, we've grown to the size we're at with more than 120 artists, and we bring in millions of dollars to our local businesses and our community. Um, and we just wanted to express our gratitude to the Board of Public Works in particular, especially over the last couple of years where we've dealt with a lot of interesting unexpected things like, you know, a pandemic and also the flooding that happened downtown that sort of changed some of the things uh, around our footprint, like damage to the fire station and things like that. Um, also with the construction, it is just such an honor to work with people who have such patience and diligence for um, our organization. And we have some pretty hefty demands to pull off a show of our size and importance. And so it's wonderful to work with the city and also the Board of Public Works. So if anyone wants to see this printout I made, I've got four of them, so. If you can, when you leave, give them to the clerk. She'll make Wonderful. sure to pass them out. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, let me know, but I well, think that's it. Thank you very much <laughs> for your comment. Yeah, thank you. All right, and we do have someone at home, correct, on Zoom? Yes, we have uh, Jenny Shelton, who I will ask to unmute, and if anyone else would like to make a public comment who uh, just joined, um, you'd have to raise your hand in the reactions or more tab. If you have issues doing this, send a message to the meeting host and we can help. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Welcome, and you have five minutes. Good evening, Council. Jim Shelton with the Chamber, but speaking again at the moment on behalf of Court Appointed Special Advocates or CASAs. Just briefly want to remind everybody that CASAs winter training will start in just a few weeks. It's going to run from January 18th to February 8th, it'll be Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And the staff has decided to try a different time and hopes that this will make it available to a different bunch of people. Instead of being in the evening, it's gonna be in the mornings from nine to 12. So Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursday from nine to 12 from January 18th to February 8th. You'll learn all that you need to know to become a CASA. And then once you've graduated, be sworn in uh, by Judge, uh, well, probably Judge Harvey after the first of the year. And uh, then you would be assigned a case and you would work the case along with a CASA staff member. So if issues come up that you are unsure about, you'll have somebody to turn to for advice. Uh, we have some 20 children right now who we do not have a volunteer to assign uh, as their CASA. So I invite people to please think about this. Uh, applications will be due here in the, right after the uh, holidays. You can go to MonroeCountyCasa.org, click on the volunteer link. You can find a frequently asked question page. It'll help you learn a lot more about the details of, of volunteering to be a CASA. You can also actually fill out the application there online if you want to, or you can download it, print it, and mail it in. And then once you've applied, you would be interviewed and undergo a background check since you will be working with children. And uh, then you would be trained and be sworn in and again, be signed a case. So please think about that. As uh, I just said, we've got over 20 children right now who don't have a CASA. Statistically, children who have CASAs are in the system uh, a much shorter period of time than uh, without a CASA. And these are children who are in the court system, not by anything they've done, but because their parents have either abused or neglected them. And most often 
it's been, uh, well, it's been abused, but it's been abused by virtue of not taking care of them. And most frequently because of, of addiction to either, well, mostly drugs or sometimes alcohol. So the children re really need somebody to advocate for them in the court system to well, let the court know how the children are doing, what they may need, what kind of services they may need. And then the CASA will also monitor how the parents are doing. The parents will have been given a uh, list of things that they need to do in order to be reunited with their children. And the CASA helps monitor and report that to the court. So please think about that. It's a wonderful way to volunteer as the new year comes up. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, spread that word. And I wish everybody a wonderful new year and happy holidays. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Do we have anyone else on Zoom this evening? I have a uh, comment from Sam Dove um, that I would like that he would like to read, have me read into the record. Um, he says, people need help shoveling because they need help. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Dove. And at this time, there are no other hands raised. All right, very good. If there's no one else from Chambers here this evening, we thank you all for your public comment. We will now move on to any appointments for boards and commissions, if there are any. Seeing none. And again, if you have things to leave with our clerk, please do, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to read them. All right, now we are ready for legislation for second readings and resolution. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2240 be introduced and read by title by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Yes. Ordinance 2240, an ordinance to amend Ordinance 2226, which fixed the salaries of appointed officers, non union, and AFSCME employees for all the departments of the City of Bloomington. Monroe County, Indiana for the year 2023 regarding to reflect changes due to the execution of a collective bargaining agreement between the City of Bloomington and Local 2487 CBMC AFSCME and also a change affecting one additional job title. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Ordinance 2226 which set the maximum 2022 salary for all appointed officers, non-union, and AFSCME employees for all the departments of the City of Bloomington, Indiana. The changes reflect the recent execution of a collective bargaining agreement between the City of Bloomington and Local 2487 CBME, AFSCME, and also include a change affecting one additional job title unrelated to the collective bargaining agreement. Thank you. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2240 be adopted. Second. All right, very good. And with us this evening to present is our HR Director, Carolyn Shaw. Welcome. Good evening, Council Members. Thank you for having me this evening. Caroline Shaw, Human Resources Director. And thank you for working this legislation into your busy calendars. It's very important, as you know, there's a lot of discussion about the AFSCME contract during budget hearings. And I'm here to amend the salary ordinance that reflects the changes of the recently executed contract. And that legislation is Ordinance 2240, replaces Ordinance 2226 in its entirety that I presented to you during budget hearings. It's the simplest, cleanest way just to do legislation. The year hasn't even started yet, and here we're changing it. So thank you again, and I'm gonna go over the highlights. It's a lot of details as I covered in the work session with Council City Attorney Rooker. Um, there is one change to this, as the clerk mentioned. It's a fire a change to fire titles. Uh, everything else related to AFSCME though, uh, the title change in the fire department, the position called the community care coordinator title changes with community EMT or community paramedic. There's no fiscal impact on that change and that's something Chief Moore requested. It aligns with a, uh, some grants that he's applying for and we're happy to be able to do that. So again, very excited to report that we have a recently executed 
four-year AFSCME agreement, which starts on January 1st of 2023 and ends on December 31st of 2026. This is agreement is between AFSCME and the City of Bloomington and necessitates quite a few changes. The total estimated fiscal impact of the contract for four years is $7,277,000, and the total estimated fiscal impact of the first year, 2023, is right around $1,116,000. This new agreement includes nine pay schedules per year by division or group of divisions, and as you may recall, for years we've had a single table, 101 to 113 in the actual salary ordinance, and now we've broken it out by department or by division, public works in each of their divisions, same with utilities in their divisions. And with regard to utilities, we put a U in front of those pay grades to differentiate them better. I'm gonna go into more details now. Meter readers will now be returned, referred to as meter service laborers, and there's no fiscal pay change to that. Line persons, which were formerly grade 110, will now be specialized crew leaders. Grade U, U there's the utilities, reference uh, 119, and laborers grade 104 in the environmental division and Blucher Pool will now be referred to as utility specialists, U111, U113, oh, so uh, utility specialist two will become U113, and utility specialist three will become grade, grade U115. And certain laborers in TND will also be changed to utility specialists one, two, and three. Heavy equipment operators one and two will become U116, and U118, this replaces the apprentice MEO and the master MEO, grade 104 and 108 in utilities, transmission and distribution. The apprentice MEO, master MEO, and utilities environmental is added to the number of heavy equipment operators, one, two, and three. In utilities TND, and both, and both the plant maintenance mechanic, apprentice mechanic, and utilities Dillman, and the lift station mechanics, and apprentice lift states and mechanics and utilities transmission and distribution will go into pay grades 107 to U113. For the apprentice level, 111 becomes U118 for the non-apprentice level. This ordinance also increases on-call pay for all of our employees are on-call for a 24-hour period from $40, which it currently is, to $47 per day. And employees in the labor, trades, and crafts Asks me, who work night shift or sh swing shift will now see an increase in their pay of 10 cents more per hour. Mechanics and fleet maintenance will be reimbursed for up to $1,000 in tool purchases or the cost of automotive service excellent testing provided the technician passes the test. Currently, they are reimbursed at $500 for, for tool only purchases. And then certification for wastewater plant operators has doubled. The salary ordinance also specifies which additional certifications besides those that are unique to their positions. Wastewater and water plant operators may be compensated at 50 cents, an additional 50 cents per hour. CDL pay, which is something we're having a hard time recruiting for, and as you've probably recently seen the press release that went out today, I believe, announcing a new program for training employees to get their seat, paying for the training for employees to get their CDLs. We're also very excited about that. And that's a good, good thing for our employees new and, and current who don't have them. Uh, that pay for CDL Class B will go from 30 cents to 80 cents per hour, and then CDL Class, I said that wrong, sorry. CDL pay has increased from 30 cents to 80 cents per hour for Class B, I did say it right, and then 50 cents to a dollar for Class A, which is the higher level CDL. Certification, I'm almost done, believe it or not. Certification pay for fleet mechanics is increasing to 20 cents per hour for each automotive service. Excellent test passed to 40 cents per hour, and certifications that were previously paid at 20 cents per hour will now be paid at 25 cents per hour. And those holding a certified playground inspector or a certified bucket truck operator, operator certification may now be eligible for a 25 percent hour premium. Your, your approval of this ordinance is requested, and I forgot to mention the fact that you are helping us get this done now will let us go ahead and make these pay adjustments at the beginning of the year and not have to do retro pay. It's good for the employees, it's good for HR, trying to do all the, the data entry. So thank you so much again for having us, letting me come here tonight. Any questions? Very good, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Shaw? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you for the presentation, um, and I'm very glad that uh, an agreement was reached. Um, the, uh, the 
uh, my questions are not necessarily about the revisions, but uh, things that were already in the ordinance. So where does the extra $1,000 per employee come from? Is that from ARPA funds or from general funds? I believe that's from ARPA funds. I would, I, would hope to, I would like to confirm that with the controller, and I'm not sure he's with us tonight, so I will check on that and email you back, just to okay. confirm that. I was looking back at my budget hearing notes, and I didn't take note of that. Um, and the gain sharing option, which is part of the ordinance, um, what, when does that become applicable? I didn't know that we had a gain sharing option. I believe that's, I believe that's always been in the contract. Corporation Council, Kate, would, would be the best one to address that. Thank you. Um, uh, Corporation Council, Beth Kate. Uh, with respect to the gain sharing provision, that provision had been in prior AFSCME agreements, and it basically uh, says that we will sit down and talk through and try to develop a gain sharing program. Uh, and that has not. Uh, uh, really being utilized in the past, but we are planning to go ahead. We've had some conversations with ASME about trying to identify a group that will sit down after the agreement was reached and talk about that. So there is no program in place as such. Um, I've had some conversations with uh, Dave DeKid, who's our Director of Innovation. Uh, she had already uh, pulled together some information and some research for us on other uh, programs that operate in various other cities to take a look at, so that's something that we will be doing going forward. Does that help answer your question? Yes, I'm glad that those conversations uh, mm -hmm. are in planning stages. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as long as I'm at the mic, let me just take uh, this chance to thank uh, our Human Resources Director, Caroline Shaw, for all of her help in achieving uh, this contract, all of her help with everything related to it. Uh, it's been outstanding, and because she is leaving us, I really want to just take the opportunity to recognize her, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kate. Any additional questions from council? Council Member Sims. Thank you. I do believe this is for the lady who was just given great accolades, so you must well come back up. No, I'm sorry, HR Director, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. So um, I, I, I'm going to get you, Beth. <laughs> I, I, I don't like a lot of attention. I don't know if you all know that about me, but thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been a joy. I've loved every minute of this job. It's, been, it's hard at times, but I'm going to miss you all. It's been it's bittersweet. All right. Thank you, and I'd like to offer my thanks as well. Any other questions for? What? Um, I don't know. Oh, there is a question. Yeah. OK. <laughs> it's not all okay, about that's, praise. This has never happened. And it's the last time I'm calling Corporation Council to the, the podium. <laughs> Okay, Literally. My, my question has to do with um, the community EMT and paramedics positions. Um, are these, didn't we approve these as part of 23's budget? We did. And these positions will help, I'm, into, I'm thinking gain grant money to support that program? Or, I'm, uh, as I, I, under, as I'm, I understand. I'm looking, I'm looking to see how this will be sustained. So will this be budgetary general fund? Uh, it, what, it's already budgeted out of the general yes. fund, I believe, and we have four of those positions at the original title and the current salary ordinance uh, that we're replacing. Um, and that, so we, we added two more during 2023, if memory serves. And Chief Moore just asked me recently if we'd be willing to change the title because it better aligns with other fire agencies and the grants that they're applying for. So he's applying for some grants, always looking for other funding sources. We really appreciate that about him and the other department heads who were able to do that. So we were just trying to accommodate his request. Okay, thank you. And if we do get the grant, how will that be handled? That's uh, a finance question, idea? Council Member Sims. And I don't think I have my, my favorite controller backing me up tonight. I'll, I'll find out and get back to you, though. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, one other question has to do with, let me get to it, um, non-union positions. And we have the minimum and maximum, but it also says that those that, due to past merit or market increases or in attraction retention, will nonetheless receive their total salary. So is that, that means they're at the maximum, plus they're getting more due to seniority and retention and Okay, I'm clear on that. My question is, about how many people do you think we have are in that position? 
who are over the maximum of their pay yes. grade. Yes. Uh, I don't know right off, but there's always a handful. When we have employees who've stayed in the same grade for years and have right. the benefit of the annual COLA, that you know, as the as things change, they they sometimes inevitably, if you've been here 30, 35 years, you may be over your pay grade. It's not a lot of employees, right. but we don't penalize the employees by saying you've maxed out at this at this pay rate. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Other council questions, Councilmember P. Munsman. So it looks like the, the lowest hourly wage in the ordinance is 1529. Is that the new um, living wage level? That, I believe that's right. Um, and again, that's something I, I can look that up and get back to you. I covered that uh, in 20, the 2023 budget hearing. 1529 mm -hmm. sounds right. Um, as I've, as I'm, my memory is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I will double check that. I understand. I believe it's 1529. Thank you. If it's the lowest amount, it should be. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, what that, I thought. that's how we make we bring the, everything up to at least the living wage, and it was mm -hmm. a decent increase because of the uh, the cost of living yeah. increase and in inflation. Okay, if you could just confirm that along with the uh, the funding source. I will, and I hope I remember all the questions. I'm going to get back to you. On. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right, thank you. I don't see any more council questions at the moment, so why don't we go to the public comment on Ordinance 22-40, see if there's anyone there who wishes to make a comment, either on Zoom or here in Chambers. Zoom, if you'd like to make a public comment, you will need to raise your hand using the uh, reactions button, which you can find um, either in reactions or in the more tab. If you're having difficulties, um, please send a chat to the meeting host. No hands flying up? No, no hands at this time. All right, I see no one here in chamber, so we're back to council for any final comment on Ordinance 22-40. Councilmember P. Mont Smith. Yeah, I'd like to um, also thank Ms. Shaw and everybody involved in the negotiations, the people from Ask Me as well. Um, and I just request that uh, the next time we have an ordinance um, before us or, uh, and also a contract that uh, we try to use gender, gender neutral language. Um, there's at least one place in the ordinance that says he or she. Uh, so just as a best practice in the future, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I would just like to say uh, for the record that I have appreciated working with you, Ms. Shaw, over these many years, and we certainly wish you well in your next ventures from here, and we will sorely miss your pleasant demeanor. You always present the information with a smile, and we're always very grateful that uh, you've worked so hard on behalf of the personnel and employees here at the city. Um, <laughs> regarding the ordinance itself, uh, I do want to remind everybody that our AFSCME workers are just about ready to go into some overdrive with the weather conditions that also includes our first responders everywhere, but particularly those workers that uh, take care of our streets and are going to be dealing with some pretty frightening and, and potentially dangerous weather. So uh, all due respect for them. I am grateful that we have finally worked out the uh, collective bargaining for their, their increases and uh, we give them a debt of gratitude, all city workers, but particularly those that have to work in the snow and the ice and the cold. So thanks, thanks to them all. Sanitation, road crews, fleet, everybody. All right, uh, that will um, take us to calling. Oh, do you have a comment? Oh, Councilmember Rollo, I am so sorry. I need to look up more. Oh, that's quite all right. Um, I just wanted to add that um, I think it, this was mentioned by a number of council members that we should start to conclude negotiations of contracts before budget our budget hearings so that we have a full uh, uh, idea of impact. And um, I wanted to uh, thank Ms. Shaw for all of her work at the city and it's been uh, a pleasure working with you and good luck with everything going forward. All right, thank you. Any other comment? The council member mm -hmm. vote? Here, here, okay, very good. And with that, I will please ask the clerk if she will call the roll on ordinance 22-40. Yes, Councilmember Volan. Yes. Sims. Yes. Scambalori. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. 
Flaherty? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Thank you. That passes 9-0-0. Zero, zero. Thank you. We now move to the next resolution. Madam President, I move that resolution 2221 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Volin? Yes. Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Resolution 2221 to approve the interlocal agreement between Monroe County, the town of Ellettsville, and the city of Bloomington for animal shelter operation for the year 2023. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution authorizes execution by the mayor and director of animal care and control of the animal shelter interlocal agreement for fiscal year 2023 between the city of Bloomington, Monroe County, and the town of Ellettsville. The agreement provides that Monroe County shall pay the city of Bloomington the sum of $353,467 for 2023 in return for the space the city provides the county and services it renters on the county's behalf. The agreement further provides that the town of Ellettsville shall pay to the city of Bloomington the sum of $26,036 for 2023 in return for the space the city provides the town of Ellettsville and services it renters on the town of Ellettsville's behalf. Thank you. Madam President, I move that resolution 2221 be adopted. Second. All right, we now move to the presentation. I understand that is coming from who? Very good, welcome, Mr. Souter. Good evening, um, Virgil Souter, Director of Animal Care and Control. Um, before you is the resolution for the interlocal agreement for us to continue our partnership with Monroe County and the city of Ellsville in the year 2023 to house and care for and adopt out um, animals from those sources. In exchange for those services, um, the Monroe County and Ellsville has agreed to fund a portion of our budget in 2023. Um, this amount has come from looking at our previous full year's figures. Um, in this case, that is from 2021. Um, in order to come with that figure, we look at our what's considered our direct animal care portion of the budget from 2023 and come up with a per animal amount based on the amount of animals taken in that year. Um, in 2021, we took in 3,145 animals and the cost per animal we figured of that is $283. That was then applied to the number of animals from um, Monroe County sources, which was 1,341 that arrived at our total of $379,503 that will be um, provided to us from Monroe County and Ellisville for our budget in 2023. Um, this has been a good partnership for both parties over the past years and look forward to continuing it in 2023. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you very much, Mr. Souders. We come to council for any questions. I am not, oh, council member Rollo. Thank you, Mr. Souter, um, Director Souter. Uh, my question is on a topic that I often revisit, and that is that there are animals that are brought in um, to the shelter outside of the county. And we used to subsidize this, and now we, we charge a fee, and I believe the fee is $20 per animal, if I'm not mistaken. But being concerned about animal welfare, do we turn anyone away? Are there people that simply, you know, can't afford the fee? And are there other resources people use in that case? Is this a topic that we need to think about or revisit in your mind? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, in 2021, we took in about of our total animal intake um, for that year, 
about 16 and a half percent were from out of county sources. Um, so we continue to take in a fair amount from that. We do not turn away um, animals in need um, blanketly. We do try to, um, with individuals that can't pay, if there are other options available, um, such as on our website, we do post um, individuals, animals that they're looking to rehome so that they can rehome themselves, but um, use our sources to kind of spread the word. So we do try to balance it out with that. Um, so we're not um, getting an over influx of animals so we can actually handle um, what we do. Um, it's been, Last in 2021, that percentage was higher um, than previous years. So it's um, some of that could be due to the pandemic and changes in income. So it's something we will be looking at um, going forward. Could could I just ask a follow up, Madam yeah, President? Yes, please. Um, could you define, Ms. Director Souter, an animal in need? So we don't turn away animals in need, but I don't know what what you're referring to. Could you? Clarify that. Uh, sure. Um, if if somebody arrives with um, a stray that's not housed or an animal um, that doesn't have the person doesn't isn't able to um, feed the animal, provide the medical care that is needed, um, we won't turn those away. If they are providing those care, we'll ask them to hang on to that um, and provide sources. Um, so they're not coming into the shelter. So that's what I, I refer to um, the difference between the two. Okay, thank you for that. That's that's important. I appreciate your uh, answer. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council? Council Member Sims. Thank you, Mr. Powell, report. Um, for the last couple of years, at least that I'm aware of, we've had discussions on some sort of a wildlife management plan, um, specifically with deer or the development of such a plan. Um, and I'm not so sure if that was a part of the conversation within your board or your staff, but has there been any progress on that, on a wildlife management plan and maybe activation? Or am I misremembering? No, um, we have talked about this before. Um, you should have information coming to you shortly if you don't already um, from what um, both um, my division and public works as well as the Animal Control Commission and recommendations for moving forward. Thank you. Additional questions from council. Council Member P. Mon Smith. Could you remind us how it works? Did, does the, the county pay the city and then Ellettsville pays the county? How does Ellettsville get sorted into this? <laughs> um, currently, they are both um, paying um, us directly to the controller. So we have, we have split that number based on the number of animals that come from the different sources to come up with each um, entity's portion. Gotcha. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, we go to public for any comments on Resolution 22-21, the inner local regarding our animal shelter operations. Um, in order to uh, make a comment, you'll have to raise your hand using the reactions button. You can find that in the reactions tab or the more tab if you're on a mobile device. If you're having issues, um, send a message to the meeting host and we will help. So far there are no raised hands. All right, seeing no more public comment, let's come back to council for a final statement. Or council member Piedmont Smith. Thank you to all the folks at the animal shelter. Um, I know that the, the euthanasia rate has been going down in recent years and um, that's uh, in large part thanks to the outreach efforts. Uh, and spay neuter efforts of the shelter staff. So I, I really appreciate what they do and I'm glad we have this arrangement with the county to recoup some of the expenses. Thank you. All right, anyone else? I'm sure we all thank Mr. Souter for the good efforts. And seeing no more public comment, I'm a, no more council comment, let's go to the clerk and ask to call the roll on resolution 22-22, oh, 21. Resolution 22-21. Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. 
Flaherty? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Piedmont? Smith? Sorry. Yes. Smith? Yes. Volin out of the room. Sims? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That is 8-0-0. Once again, we thank you, Mr. Souter. We are now ready for our Madam next President. Speech. Yes. Uh, Madam President, I move that Resolution 2222 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan, still of the room. Sims? Yes. Scambolori? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see. Will the clerk please read? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Resolution 2222, approval of interlocal cooperation agreement between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County, Indiana regarding the Building Code Authority. The synopsis is as follows. The interlocal cooperation agreement extends through January 1, 2024, the long-term arrangement between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County to combine and coordinate the provision of certain building code services. This interlocal cooperation is authorized by Indiana Code Section 36 one seven one. Thank you. Madam President, I move that resolution twenty two twenty two be adopted. Second. Thank you. And with us this evening, Mr. Rooker. Michael Rooker, City Attorney. State law allows governmental entities to jointly exercise power through interlocal cooperation agreements. Uh, as you can tell from your agenda tonight, the city and Monroe County have many such interlocal agreements, including one regarding the administration of local building code. Through the building interlocal, which is before you, the county handles building permit application processing, project inspection, and permit issuance for all properties both within the city of Bloomington's corporate boundaries and within the unincorporated areas of Monroe County. The building interlocal has been extended several times since its inception. Uh, vesting local building code administration in a single entity, the Monroe County Building Department, continues to be a cost-effective and convenient way to provide necessary building code services to the citizens of the city. The building interlocal that is presented to you is in the same form as last year's iteration. The agreement will expire at the end of the day on January 1st, 2023, and will be extended for another year through January 1st, 2024. Thank you. Very good. Are there any questions for Mr. Rooker? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, hi, Mr. Rooker. Uh, I wanted to ask about the, um, in the memo that we received from uh, the council office, it um, talked about um, Indiana Code and um, how uh, interlocal agreements must include various items, and one of them is administration either through a separate entity or a joint board, parentheses, which is the approach taken here. Um, so what is the joint board uh, that is um, represented, you know, through the building authority? Yeah, I don't think there's any joint board that represents the building authority. So I think maybe there's a typo. I'm not sure. Was that the memo that came from staff or from? No, it came from um, council staff. So I don't know if... Uh, Ash Kulak Certainly might. that would be, so like in the dispatch in our local, the dispatch policy board is a joint board where members are appointed some from, by the city and some by the county. I don't think there's a corollary in this context. So. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that was just left over from a previous memo or something. I don't know if Mr. Lucas can speak to that, who is uh, joining us via Zoom. Yes, I, I'm, I'm trying to pull up that state statute that we were referencing. It may be that if, if the entities have agreed on administration through a separate entity, that that needs to be spelled out in the agreement. As Mr. Rooker has uh, stated here, uh, that's not the case. And so apologies for any confusion um, uh, that that caused. Okay, so there is no separate board. It's just the Monroe County Building Department that handles these. Okay. And then um, my second question is, uh, I think I, I've asked this the last few years. Um, in the interlocal, it says something about um, 
uh, the planning and transportation staff will walk over to the Monroe County Building Department once a day and pick up the um, permit applications until such a time as the Monroe County Building Department is able to electronically transmit the materials. Are we making any progress on being able to do this electronically? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I'm not sure precisely how the transmission is happening these days. I think they've done it different ways, particularly given the pandemic, uh, but I would have to check with the individual staff who, who does the actual handoff for those sorts of forms to see what they're doing these days. But I could get back to you on that, Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. Sure. Very good, anyone else? Seeing no questions from council, we go to the public. If anyone likes to make a comment on resolution 22-22, interlocal agreement on building code authority. If you'd like to make a public comment, um, you can raise your hand using the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen or the more tab if you're on a mobile device. If you're having issues, uh, send a message to the meeting host and we can help. At this time, there are no hands raised. All right. Seeing no public comment, we are back to council for a final statement or a calling of the question. Seeing no council comments, will the clerk please call the roll on resolution 22-22. Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes, and that passes 900. That is behind us now. Thank you very much. And we now move on to the next resolution. Madam President, I move that resolution 2223 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Piedmont stepped out of the room. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. Thank you. And will the clerk please read? Just one second, please. Resolution 2223 to approve an interlocal cooperation agreement between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County, Indiana in regards to the 2022 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant, also known as JAG. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution approves the interlocal cooperation agreement between the city and the county for 2022 JAG funds. JAG funds are divided between the city and the county based on violent crime statistics reported to the FBI through the Uniform Crime Report. A three-year review of violent crime statistics shows that the city is entitled to 91% of the grant funds and the county is entitled to the remaining 9%. The overall JAG award for 2022 is $49,363. The city will receive $44,920 and the county will receive $4,443. The city will use its award toward the purchase of ballistic helmets and face shields. The county will use its award toward the purchase of tire deflation devices. Thank you. And is Council Member Rollo frozen? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I move that resolution 2223 be adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rooker. Thank you, Members Michael Rooker again. Uh, federal law authorizes the city to participate in the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program, or JAG program for short. Uh, this program allocates grant funds to a variety of law enforcement agencies across the country. Communities that receive an award from the program may generally use the funds allocated to them for things such as technical assistance, training, equipment, supplies, contractual support, and information systems. Uh, BPD and the Monroe County Sheriff are jointly allocated one award each year. 
as the award is jointly given to both BPD and the sheriff, program guidelines direct the city and the county to enter into an interlocal agreement to document the allocation of the funds. As noted in the interlocal, BPD and the sheriff divvy up the funds based on a three-year review of violent crime statistics. The present interlocal divides a total of $49,363 between the city and the county, with $44,920 going to the city and $4,443 going to the county. The city will be using its grant funds to purchase uh, radios for squad cars, while the sheriff will be purchasing tire deflation devices. The grant funds will be received by the city and then distributed in accordance with the uh, division outlined above. And excuse me, I said that wrong. They're receiving ballistic helmets and we're buying ballistic helmets and face shields, not radios. Sorry about that. So. All right, very good. Are there any questions anyone may have regarding these allocations for our JAG grant? Seeing no council questions, we move to the public for any comment on this particular resolution. Um, to uh, make a comment, you'll raise your hand using the reactions or more tab at the bottom of your screen. If you're having issues, send a message to the meeting host. At this time, there are no hands raised. And no hands flying up? Still none. All right, with no public comment, we come back to council for any final comment. And seeing no comments from council, will the clerk please call the roll on resolution 22-23. Councilmember Rosenberger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith is out of the room. Councilmember Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And that passes 8-0-0. Before we move on to our last two ordinances, um, we had thought maybe if the evening was going to go long, because of six items on the agenda, we might want to entertain a motion to uh, limit debate on council comments. I really don't see the need to do that at this point, although I will always urge my fellow council members to keep comments brief, especially in the final debates. But uh, what say you? Anybody want to make a motion to limit council comment time? Council Member Volan. I don't feel the need to limit comment tonight. Um, I do think that um, you know we have big decisions to make. It maybe not all decisions can be made tonight, um, but uh, for now, for these things, seeing that we we had very few preliminaries, I think it's okay to proceed. All I'm right. not going to make a motion. Thank you. Very good, and that's kind of my feeling. But if anyone else thinks differently, speak now, or we shall move along. And. Uh, Mr. Parliamentarian, let's move on with our next ordinance. Madam President, I move that Appropriation Ordinance 2206 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Okay. Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? <clears throat> yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Sorry, missed that one. Um, Rosenbarger? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and will the clerk please read? Just one moment, please. Appropriation Ordinance 2206, an ordinance appropriating the proceeds of the City of Bloomington, Indiana, General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds of 2022, together with all investment earnings thereon, for the purpose of providing funds to be applied to the cost of certain capital improvements for public safety facilities and paying miscellaneous costs in connection with the foregoing and the issuance of said bonds and sale thereof and approving an agreement of the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission to purchase certain property. The synopsis is as follows. 
This ordinance makes an additional appropriation to be provided for out of the proceeds of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds of 2022, authorized by Ordinance 2230, together with any interest earnings thereon, which will be applied to finance costs of constructing, renovating, replacing, repairing, improving, and or equipping certain facilities for the city's police and fire department, together with the costs of issuance thereof. It also approves of a purchase agreement between the City of Bloomington's Redevelopment Commission, the City of Bloomington, and CFC LLC for the purchase of a portion of the Showers Building Complex for $8.75 million. Thank you. Madam President, I move that Appropriation Ordinance 2206 be adopted. All right, thank you. And before we get started with the presentation, we do need to at least get through the public comment period for this as it is required. And I don't know if uh, uh, Attorney Lucas, you can speak to that or Deputy Attorney Kulak as to why we need to do that. Yes, thank you. Uh, Stephen Lucas, Council Administrator and Attorney. Uh, just want to remind the Council that there is a notice public hearing uh, for this item uh, that was published in the paper and, and posted. So. Uh, regardless of, of whether the council is ready to act on this ordinance tonight, um, I would suggest that uh, going ahead with public comment and, and holding that public hearing uh, should happen. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Mayor, if you would, please. Thank you very much. Mayor John Hamilton, I appreciate uh, the chance to speak briefly. I want to begin with a reminder of the context brings us here tonight. The Economic Development Local Income Tax passed in May this year provided for $2 million annually to invest in public safety facility expansions for fire and police departments. As we looked at numerous options, we shared several months ago with Council the potential plans to acquire the Showers Building CFC property and began 120 days of due diligence exploring that option as well as dozens of alternative locations or approaches. Four weeks ago, we provided an extensive memo sharing the results of that due diligence work, including the recommendation to proceed with purchasing showers building and rehabilitating fire stations one and three and building a new logistics operations fire center on South Walnut. Three weeks ago, we provided a detailed presentation to Council uh, and followed that two days later with additional written information, including responding to numerous specific questions and sharing more background information. Two weeks ago, we had a second extensive presentation to and discussion with this Council on all the issues, and you voted to allow us to price and proceed with the public safety bonds, which we did and greatly appreciate, and you'll hear a report on that shortly. And we've had numerous conversations, many conversations and in information sharing since that meeting two weeks ago. Tonight, we are asking you to appropriate those bond proceeds and to implement the plans that we have been discussing now for many weeks and months, including purchasing the Showers CFC property. We'll be happy, of course, to answer any and all questions. I'll begin briefly, and then you'll hear from outside counsel, Brad Bingham, to summarize uh, the p posture here and the, and the sale. Then a Police Chief Decoff, a Deputy Fire Chief Washell, uh, our, our uh, uh, Architect Advisor from JSL, Deb Kuntz. We also have available, of course, numerous other folks to answer questions if needed, Controller Underwood, Corporate Counsel Kate and Attorney Allen, uh, Financial Advisor Crone, uh, Deputy Mayor Griven, and others. So I will speak directly tonight. You know I'm not running for anything. I'm just here to focus on what is best for the city's future. Our downtown fire station was destroyed in the 2021 flood. Uh, the crews have been displaced for 18 months and we need to bring a ladder truck back downtown. The police station also was flooded, uh, the headquarters downtown and still is in harm's way and they are operating out of a 60 year old building well past its prime. I will note that after seven years of leading this city as your mayor, it is clear to me that integration and coordination of public safety services is the right direction, continuing the integration and coordination that we've been doing, uh, and which means co-locating police 
and fire administration and their non-sworn uh, entities. We see serious synergies, efficiencies, and better services when we do that. After reviewing the alternatives, including building a brand new unified public safety facility, or rehabbing the current police station, or purchasing the Showers building and rehabbing it, it is a clear choice, the only responsible choice, to purchase the Showers building and move forward. It is the least expensive choice, most efficient with our money. It offers the greatest room to expand in coming decades. And it has the great, benefit, great added benefit of coordinating with City Hall, not just between police and fire, but with City Hall generally. Is it perfect? No. Is it optimal? Yes. Change is hard. We understand that some staff prefer current situations, have raised concerns. We absolutely can deal with those imperfections like any facility will have imperfections, including the ingress and egress issues and parking issues. Uh, I do want to remind you that sworn police officers generally are out on patrol during their shift. They're not like firefighters with equipment in a garage waiting to be deployed, but they're generally on the streets uh, out in our community as they're deployed. And there's a lot of design work ahead together to be done with our frontline personnel and administrators, architects, and others. But fundamentally, this is about looking forward, integrating our public safety services, coordinating their personnel and those services, and providing room for expansion so that our social workers and our integrated mobile health providers can be co-located and work together, so that our community service specialists can work more closely with the Housing and Neighborhood Development and the Community and Family Resources Department, so that our fire prevention and inspection services can be well connected with building permits for our public, so that public safety can be integrated more closely and coordinated with parks, hand public works, and others. We're asking tonight to purchase a 64,000 square foot piece of this historic building, a purchase price of less than $140 per square foot in the acquisition. It achieves critical goals, it solves looming problems, and it sets our city government up for decades in the future. Uh, I'll ask, I believe Brad Bingham is there. There, Brad will uh, take it next and then hand it off to our two chiefs and deputy chief. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. Great. <clears throat> Uh, again, uh, good evening, council members. Uh, Brad Bingham. I'm with the law firm of Barnes and Thornburg. We're serving as outside uh, legal counsel to the city on the on the financing side of this transaction. Uh, as the mayor alluded to, you know, on December 7th, the council adopted Ordinance 22-30, which was the bond ordinance itself that authorized the issuance and sale uh, of the bonds for the purpose of, of financing the public safety projects, which were identified on Exhibit A uh, of the bond ordinance. This uh, particular ordinance, 22-06, would make an additional appropriation uh, in the amount of $29.5 million, and that would be provided out of the bond sale proceeds plus all investment earnings on those proceeds prior to them being spent on project costs. Um, those would be, again, to be applied to the, to the costs which are or the projects which are identified on Exhibit A of the bond ordinance. In addition, as the mayor alluded, uh, you know, as has been well discussed, uh, a portion of the bond proceeds would potentially be used by the Redevelopment Commission to purchase the Showers building. And because that purchase price uh, exceeds $5 million, uh, the, the Redevelopment Statute requires that the property, uh, the purchase agreement be approved by the council uh, prior to such purchase. So, so this ordinance does have specific language which would uh, give the Redevelopment Commission the authority to move forward with, with purchasing Showers. Uh, lastly, again, just to touch quickly on the, on the bond sale itself, uh, following the, the December 7th council meeting at which the bond ordinance was adopted, we did in fact sell the bonds on December 8th. Uh, they had a total uh, interest cost of, of 3.89%. That was about 70 basis points below uh, what was estimated in the pre-sale uh, kind of financial model. So the pre-sale model assumed that an all-in interest rate of about 4.67%. So it was very, uh, very good results for the city. Uh, as was sort of feared at the time, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee held their meetings on December 13th and 14th and raised the prime rate by 50 basis points and has indicated that they will continue to raise rates until uh, the, the inflation target is below 2%. Uh, 
Uh, Buzz Crone with Crone Associates is also on uh, this evening. So I think once we get to the question and answer session, if you have more questions on the financial side, uh, Buzz will likely be able to, to address those as well. Thank you. And now much. I believe uh, turn it over to, is it Deb? Are you on? Yes, please, Ms. Koontz, are you muted? I believe you are. Yeah, I think uh, I think my I think the police chief actually is going to go next. Oh, okay. Good evening. My name is Mike Decoff. I'm the police chief for the city of Bloomington. I'm here tonight uh, to speak in favor of the purchase of showers. We are um, in desperate need of more space at the police department. Many of you have been there. You've walked around. We um, had an extensive flood last year that. Um, we just now are um, finishing up some of the repairs from that. Uh, the building continues to periodically um, still leak and weep water in from the walls. Um, there was, uh, as you know, the, the, the big dig continued and we replaced a lot of culvert, but um, we still get a lot of uh, rainwater around the building that seeps in and it's still, um, it still is an issue. So we. Um, as we continue to grow, we certainly don't know the future of annexation, but um, if that goes through, we'll be adding people, and we simply just do not have space in our current facility to be able to continue to provide the, the services and house the, the, uh, uh, the programs that we have in our department with our personnel. Um, Showers offers some attractive um, components to that. There is a parking garage which will provide covered parking. Um, there is room for growth. There's lots of windows which we currently I think have like three in our building. And so there are some attractive things. You've also heard some of the things that are problematic like ingress and egress. However, um, we've had extensive conversations with um, our consultants which Deb's going to I think address some of that uh, when she speaks. Um, and we're confident that we can resolve some of those issues um, that um, I have concerns with, I think council members have concerns with, um, but we're certainly not the, the first depart police department to be located next to uh, a heavily pedestrian area vehicle, so I'm sure we can figure out a uh, suitable um, resolution to those, to those concerns. Um, here, you know, to answer questions, I think Deb has things to follow up on. Again, um, please keep in mind that we, we do need space. Um, this provides um, plenty of space with room for expansion as, as the department continues to grow. Um, being, being located um, close to City Hall, basically back doors, the discussions are having uh, passageways between the two, the two sides, does offer some benefits to some of the other departments that we work with on a daily basis. So again, I'll be available for questions as those come up um, once you hear from the other presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Jamie Washell, Deputy Fire Chief, Bloomington Fire Department. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of Bloomington Fire Department. I'll try to be brief, and I'm available for questions if needed. I first want to thank Council for all the support over the years. It's greatly appreciated, not taken lightly by the members of our department and the fire administration. That support is directly related to purchasing necessary equipment and fire apparatus that has helped our firefighters quickly respond to over 5,000 calls, emergency calls annually, while providing superior fire service and care to our community and visitors, yielding a high rate of positive outcomes. The Bloomington Fire Department needs in the near future include reconstruction of Fire Station 1, Fire Administration relocation, building a logistics building to accommodate storage of equipment, personal protective equipment, EMS supplies while, ensure, while ensuring excellent department-wide training and a remodel of Station 3 that is over 60 years old at the current Woodlawn location. 
The immediate need of a reconstructed Station 1 is essential for many reasons. This would enable us to maintain the excellent fire and EMS service the community has become accustomed to, while enhancing daily operations that formerly housed additional fire department apparatus, such as our ladder truck and personnel crews, now displaced while we're currently at the temporary headquarters. The former headquarters location enabled BFD personnel to respond quickly to a variety of mercy, mercies enhancing positive outcomes. Having the fully staffed downtown station is essential to maintain national standards for emergency response times and deployment models established by the National Fire Protection Association by giving us appropriate resources, apparatus, and staffing to fully mitigate those mercies occurring in the downtown and surrounding areas. This was also a major reason why we scored very high in our last fire department ISO evaluation. That is up for reevaluation in 2024. So that's an important, also important for timing. Fire administration is in full support of the showers location as it fully meets our current needs and future needs for expansion of fire administration. Current estimates of our spatial needs are approximately 5,000 square feet, with expansion estimates of 7,500 square feet in approximately five years, based on grant funding possibilities and future expansion of the newly established mobile integrated healthcare program. The showers building meets all of those previously, previously needs uh, mentioned. From the fire department perspective, fire administration being in the same location has advantages of interdepartmental functions as well as enhanced emergency operations during a major event, essentially operating as a, as a centrally located emergency operations center. While we recognize and understand that no plan is perfect, the showers building will fully meet the needs of fire administration personnel. Thank you for time and consideration. I'll, I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Okay. I believe I'm next. Uh, Deb Coons, I'm with JS. I'm a vice president with JS Held, and I've been an advisor uh, for facilities for the city of Bloomington for several years now. Um, I'll share a few slides here in a second, but first I thought it would be uh, good to, I, I know that you had, there were several questions from our last meeting, and so I want to be able to address those and the questions along the way about timelines, design process, and cost details. But I thought it's also good to just sort of restate where our uh, study, what the studies have gotten to the, this point. You know, we've been work, work, really working on feasibility and our, the, what we consider a due diligence phase, which is a 30,000 foot level view of what's happening. Um, I know that there are many drivers for the decision uh, that's be, they're being presented. You know, the deadline for the showers building purchase, the obviously the certifications that were just identified um, by the assistant deputy chief and, you know, looking at that looming spring of 2024. So we'll share some dates on that. In fact, I was just in a meeting today with two construction professionals and they were reminding me that costs are not going down. Uh, costs, unfortunately, even though they, their feds keep raising the interest rates, uh, there is, it, it is still not changing. So um, I come here as a registered architect with 30 years of experience. Uh, I'm actively working on two other police stations, one in Lafayette, that's a $50 million brand new building uh, for in, right across the street from City Hall and a $25 million addition to the Carmel Police Station, which is about a block away from their City Hall and their City Hall complex. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the studies that were done for the City of Bloomington um, are considered feasibility studies, we took all of that information, helped to validate the space assumptions, particularly with the police team, but also with the fire team, and incorporated that preliminary study information, as well as included them in, in all of the meetings, almost all of the meetings that we had with uh, the police chief and applied some current cost models. Uh, additionally, there was a question about the Tabor Boost study uh, at our last meeting. 
So we did go back to Tabor Bruce just to get a little bit more information about um, what that letter uh, question or what that why their letter cited a three to five year time frame. And apparently in there, keep in mind that Tabor Bruce study was done in September of 2021. And as they worked with JD, your facility manager on that, uh, they were asked to look at what would be the uh, first, what would be the investments that were necessary for the first three to five years. Um, and so that is what the focus has been. And they, they identified in their study that without any major maintenance expenditures, would they be good to go for three to five years? But we know also that CFC has been a great landlord and they have kept up on their systems. And that was definitely cited by the team. Uh, of course, continuing to check on motors, fans, pumps, uh, ceiling, above ceiling HVAC units will be in critical as well. So that gives a, just a little bit more about what was, uh, what's was what been happening with the study information. And I wanna pull up screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that. Can we see that? Yes? Okay, yes. good. So um, the, a question came up about timeline and um, the, I would say, Maybe the first statement is design and construction is a process, right? It takes probably for some, it probably takes way longer than it should, um, but yet it, it is a process and there is a design phase, a bidding phase and a construction phase. And I'll be touching a little bit more um, in a few minutes about the design phase, but you can see based on both the size and the complexity of the construction, uh, we've outlined a, what the, and again, have, have touch base with the architects and engineers who did the studies for you to just verify that these are in fact good assumptions at this point. Um, we know that um, design can take anywhere from six to 12 months, depending on the complexity of the project. It'll, we are publicly bidding this work, so it's gonna be a couple of months for each of that. But we also are gonna have a couple of um, significant supply chain issues. Uh, the generator, for instance, for the showers renovation, um, generators are running over 50 weeks to receive right now. So if we are serious even about thinking about a total, you know, 18 month construction period, we are probably gonna have to order that generator even faster than we think. Uh, that is just part of the supply chain challenges that we continue to have in our industry. Um, it is, uh, you know, the design phase takes time, but I think the, the, the uh, blessing of that is it does give us time to consider what are the other challenges that we think maybe still are in the project? Several were mentioned earlier, um, but I think it, it's important that we understand that, you know, the, the question about ingress and egress, we have talked to planning and engineering. They are involved in these conversations already uh, about how, um, how do we diminish the uh, interaction or address some of the concerns that have been raised about the egress and ingress, particularly as it relates to the beeline, you know, are there calming mechanisms? Is there additional signage? Are there Bollinger elements? Are there additional lights? Or are the lights and the sounds of the police car gonna be enough for that? So I know planning and engineering, um, while we are not at all prepared to say this is the final solution on how to deal with that particular area, I know that they stand ready to talk about and ready to explore those options. There's been questions about parking. Um, do we have enough parking? Uh, what about the parking that's uh, below grade in the trades garage? Can it be separated out? All of those things can happen easily throughout the design process. So we know that those things takes time, but we know we also have the time in these months that it's gonna take to work through those particular incidents. And again, knowing that when I think about the fire station and the fact that the IOS certification is gonna be back in, um, in the spring of 24, I look at these timeframes and think um, that this is really puts us on track to be starting something before it is time for them to even come back because I know that's critical for the city to be able to show progress in their uh, construction area when it comes to making sure that they get this certification. There was also a question at our last meeting about leases. Uh, and we know that we have lease information um, the best, what was been provided to us from CFC, and we know at least 64 of, of those leases are due at the end of 23, several in um, kind of the spring mid-year of 24, and that leaves us only about 15% because some are not uh, actually, uh, there's vacant space in there, I should say, uh, that even goes beyond mid-24 to deal with. So that that area, those concerns about, you know, we're going to have to re relocate everybody is shouldn't be a concern because it's a very small amount 
of people when you look at all of the leases. So things to keep in mind and questions that have been coming up, we wanted to update you on those. Now, in terms of the design process, I mentioned earlier that it is a process. We are currently in that feasibility due diligence phase at that 30,000 uh, foot level. And uh, you see the spiral off to the side. I, I like to use the spiral as the acknowledgement of how the design process works. Um, we have been through the feasibility and the due diligence phase, and we are basically going one time around the spiral. And then we're gonna get to what's called the schematic design phase, and we'll get more and more information every time we go through another design phase and we get to the design development in DD, more information. Every time we get more and more details until we get to construction beginning. That is a industry standard design process all over the world that's used on every project. Now, how do we get more and more detail? One, it's hiring a design professional, architect or engineer to continue with that due diligence to get into more details and analysis. It's also having regular coordination meetings with leadership, with the fire chief, with the police chief and their key staff, probably their deputy chiefs as well. So, and that may mean meeting every two weeks with them to go through the details of what is being planned in the design and literally going from answering questions like which departments should be next to each other to what is the type of key or what is the kind of uh, type of door handle that will go on a door. It's that wide a variety of, ch of choices and decisions that are going to be made. Now, they we know that they don't make that alone. And by all means, we the design team will not make that alone. There will be multiple user groups with the different department heads or representatives, um, both from within police and within fire, but also JD, for instance, your facility manager or IT, there are other groups who are going to get involved in this process. And of course, uh, progress up to dates are going to be critical uh, to the council. Identifying other key stakeholders who also need to get those updates is going to be uh, important to the process. But again, this is a tried and true process. It happens a day in and day out across our, um, our world. Um, and what it does is it allows more and more detail to be understand, understood, more and more challenges to be overcome and to make sure that everyone is comfortable with where the direction is going. But we know that right now, because we're in that feasibility study due diligence phase, that there are questions, right? You continue to want more and more detail, more and more detail. And that detail comes when you continue forward with the next design phases. You have, oh, this is the slide that we shared at our last meeting last week. Um, it's the big picture comparison of the three main options. And on the next slide, we'll um, break down the detail. And I know you've gotten the detail in your packet, but I thought it would be good to share on a slide as well. Um, I, I think, you know, when you look at these options, um, as was stated, I firmly believe it will still be the least expensive to do the renovation at the showers building rather than expand at the uh, police station existing site and or do a new building at the uh, existing police department site. But I think what's just as important to point out it, beyond just the cost side of it is the square footage that you are gaining as a result of the investment. I like to call it, what is the value that you're getting? What are you getting for your dollar? And in this scenario, you are getting more square footage for the investment for the dollar, which also says that not only is it the lowest cost, it is also the best value overall because it does give you the opportunity to do that expansion as you need it, uh, as it may come up in the future. Um, now, uh, cost per square foot is the um, standard under which uh, our industry provides cost at this ver very, very early phase of the process. Um, you know, you've asked, some of you have asked, why is the cost so high? Is it really going to be that high? Um, we know supply chain issues still con continue and persist. We know interest rates continue to go up. Um, we know that we are uh, have a low, we have a, uh, a tight market, which means we have a labor shortage in the construction area. Um, and quite frankly, over the last year or so, um, construction costs have continued to rise sometimes 30 and to 40% higher than what they were before pre-COVID. So um, we are still uh, making adjustments as we go in the cost here, but I do not believe um, that we can be too um, safe in our numbers here because right now, uh, again, as I said, even this morning in a meeting, a construction team said they, they just are not going down yet. Um, I've been asked, well, why are the quit? Why are the equipment costs? When you look at this on a detailed level, between again, these are the three big options that we've been comparing. Why are these so similar? 
And shouldn't they be different? Shouldn't we have less equipment cost overall, particularly in the IT and in the security? Why are we getting more cost in the in, in terms of overall? And uh, shared with individuals, but I'll sh and I shared at the last meeting about the fact that we will be um, plan to upgrade all of the cameras. We do plan to upgrade all of the recabling to a category 6A cable type. Um, and so we are going to be see similar costs here. I, the reason that it's coming down a little bit more in the brand new building is we do get some efficiencies when it comes to just all new construction. So that is a, a that is recognized there. Um, if you continue to look at um, land acquisition at other sites, obviously the, the numbers will just go higher. So that's obviously something important to keep in mind. Uh, we've also been asked, um, why are you assuming that all of the square footage at the police department uh, building, the existing building is actually going to, uh, why is it, or I should say, uh, is it really gonna be all renovated in a heavy construction area? Um, I do believe that it will. I think the police department is going to need all of that square footage. I'm sure the chief is not excited about using that basement level, but there are strategies that we can put into place to keep that water from coming in, including a bentonite waterproofing that goes on the exterior foundation walls across all of that. But there are strategies that we can do. And I do believe that it will be important that as we renovate, if you decide to do something on the existing site, anytime we would do something at an existing building with an expansion, it would be done with re-looking at how are the departments organized within the existing building. So that is why um, I, made that as I made that assumption that the entire police department, which makes the cost higher. And again, I know there may be some who are looking at us saying the cost surely can come down. And of course we can continue to talk about through the next design phase, um, could you scale back the renovations? That question should be applied to both showers building and the existing police department, quite frankly. And we will continue to ask that question. Um, even if the uh, police department, right, even if it gets close to the showers building, I think I would just remind the council to continue to look at not just the bottom line, of course, that's very important, but also the value that you're getting. What is the square footage that you're getting for the overall investment in the building? And ultimately, I think as you consider what is the best location for your public safety headquarters, um, consider that best value calculation as well. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So that concludes the uh, presentation to get us started here. Let's come to council for questions before we move to the public comment. Council Member Scambalori. Yes, thank you. Um, I think this question would be directed to Ms. Coons. Um, thank you all for the presentation you shared this evening. Um, we've heard a fair amount about ingress and egress issues related to the shower site. Um, and you briefly mentioned um, the discussions with engineering around possible solutions that would take care of that. Could you say more about that? With the understanding that you're not committed to anything and you haven't picked a solution <laughs> and so forth. Yeah. And so, uh, so uh, what did so you talk about? I, I did have conversations with um, Andrew Seabor and with Scott Robinson about them. Um, and they are hesitant without studying it more to say this is a solution or this is the right solution. Um, so we, we, we have kind of tabled um, looking in depth at any of those solutions until we get into that first schematic design phase to make sure that we're considering all aspects of it and are not being hasty about it. But obviously I threw out a couple of things that have been discussed. Frankly, some they liked, some they didn't like. Um, so we'll, um, but that I know that they will be integral players in that discussion. Um, I, I mentioned um, that, you know, when police are going through, if they're in their squad cars, right? Lights and sound um, are gonna make a big difference as you're traveling through there. But some have said, well, what if a bicycler is going through at the same time that my squad car is going through, will they stop, right? You would think as we all are conditioned to do when there are lights and sounds, we should stop for police. I would think that same thing happens. I, I know the chief also mentioned that there are many uh, police, even your fire station crosses the B line at one of your fire stations. So it is, you have a great city, you have a great beeline, and I'm confident that both can coexist. We do cross the beeline with emergency vehicles many times every day now uh, as we go back and forth across the city. And it's, it's also useful to note that 
when the fire station was displaced, as you know, they located their temporary facility immediately next to the B-Line at 4th Street, so they crossed that frequently uh, every day from there. They've put up additional signage, has not been a problem, but those are the kind of uh, responses that we'll look forward to figuring out as we go forward, too. Thank you. May I follow up? Um, thank you to both of you for that. So it's, if I'm understanding correctly, the lights and sirens option, in other words, have police cars use lights and sirens and trust that people will stop and get out of the way, it seems to me that's the only free option um, that can help us with ingress and egress issues. It seems like anything else we might do, whether it's reconfiguring parking lots or reconfiguring roadways or anything like that, is going to come with a price tag. Is that correct? So um, it depends on what you do. Um, if you're going to add a light there, right? Because sometimes we use lights to stop. Um, that um, that is would be a minimal cost. That I think we have got two hundred thousand dollars, I believe, in the site cost. So we can accommodate things like that. Uh, reconfiguring the entire parking lot is not included in the budget. Okay. So uh, I, I guess maybe this is bordering on a comment, but it seems to me then that that ingress egress is an issue. We need to deal with it. S dealing with it will cost money, and yet none of those costs are reflected in the cost comparisons that you projected just a minute ago. What would it take to start including those figures and including those costs in the actual cost comparisons? Yeah. Uh, so l let me offer this. I, I believe that the $200,000 that we have included in the site cost can accommodate, um, I would say, low impact adjustments at that location, right, that can help address it. I personally do not believe that reconfiguring the parking lot is a solution that is going to help address the ingress and egress. So therefore, we have not included that in our scope. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bowman. A couple of questions. Um, first of all, oh, by the way, thanks for the presentation for everyone. Um, just to be perfectly clear, uh, in the case that eventually the administration has to undergo Plan B, uh, one thing we can say about this plan or Plan B is that stations one and three are going to get rebuilt no matter what else we do. Is that a safe thing to say? As we described Plan B, if, if we don't proceed with showers, we, we would intend, assuming the appropriations are made, to use those for rebuild of Station 1 and probably rehab of 3. It depends on what resources we had. We, we could do a whole new 3 if we, if we switch, but certainly at least a major rehab. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, the other question I have is, um, uh, well, it's hard to summarize. Uh, so uh, I spoke with Ms. Kuntz earlier, and um, tonight she uh, quoted again uh, the statement that this budget uh, that they've presented is a 30,000-foot level view of the proposal for, again, we've been colloquially calling Plan A. And I suggested to her that I would like to see a 20,000-foot level, uh, something that is not every single uh, jot and tittle, every nail, but something with some more, de I mean, we have not had, the council has not had a lot of time to study the presented numbers. And she suggested that 20, 000, the 20,000 square foot, or 20,000 foot level uh, was the kind of thing that happens after a site is chosen. And I said, well, then what about a 25,000 foot level? We don't have to have hard numbers, but we need harder numbers. Now, I'd like to get harder numbers, and I understand that the deal, the, the price for the purchase of the Showers building, uh, uh, the offer expires January 31st. Um, uh, what problems besides the advancing cost of building that might happen in 30 days um, would we be facing if we took an extra month to make a decision? And I don't know who to, whom, to whom to direct that question. I'll, I'll let um, Ms. Kuntz answer in a moment, but an extra month won't give us 
much more information. And uh, this is, uh, from my experience and, and our work, this is a standard level of review to make this kind of decision. The next level costs a lot more to get, requires a lot more time than one month. It's probably several months. And to do it on multiple locations is just not typical. And, and I don't think we're recommending it and would encourage against it. Maybe but I should. Ms. Ms. Kuntz can answer too if she wants. She's more expert than I am on it. Yeah. Um, I, I, so between now and the end of January, I don't believe that the costs are going to dramatically change even with more scrutiny on them. They might change slightly, but I do not believe they're going to substantially change. It also is not going to change the bottom line value proposition, I think, that you're getting with the Showers building. Okay, but we've already heard a, a perfectly good question from Councilmember Scambaluri about additional costs here and there. Um, we normally spend a lot more time on the city budget than, than we've been given here. Uh, I'm not addressing this to any particular person again, but uh, here we are asking to approve $29.5 million in spending with a single uh, spreadsheet uh, that has sort of round numbers. Um, what I'm suggesting is, uh, I mean, I know that at least two of my colleagues are interested in um, sitting down between now and our first regular session, January 11th, and doing an intensive dive into those numbers to fully understand them. What assumptions did you make to put $10 million here or $18 million there? So, um, you know, like, is there a problem with us more fully understanding these numbers? I would suggest you ask those questions right here. This is our third time with you. Uh, we're happy to answer more questions about that. The question about the, Ms. Scambleri asked was there's $200,000 in the budget for site adjustments, which, which we, we discussed, and happy to answer any of those questions now about assumptions. I appreciate that, although I will correct you and say that this is our second time discussing the actual expenditure of dollars. We spent most of our time discussing the bond. And I think that it's fortunate that the question of the building to be purchased was separated from the bond because I, for one, would have voted against the bond if I'd had to decide on the bond and the building two weeks ago. So uh, I, mean, I think the only reason that we're even being able to think about this is, I mean, I, I think some of my colleagues would agree, I don't think it would have passed. Uh, but we did pass the bond because we do want to fund public safety improvements. But this building has more questions than we've had answered. So, um, you know, it, let me put it this way. If we were to form an ad hoc committee to do an intensive one week uh, breakdown of the numbers presented by Ms. Kuntz, could we count on the administration to bring the uh, experts to bear that might be able to answer que reasonable questions of council members who want to drill down slightly, not all the way to the bottom, but just one level down to each of the assumptions made on this spreadsheet for the first week of January. Again, I would encourage you to ask those questions now. We have all the experts here. They're not easy to assemble and they're expensive to assemble. We've provided that, we've had conversations and we'll continue to have those, but I would encourage you to ask it now. If there are questions about the, the, um, the, the numbers, please, use tonight to ask those questions. And we've spent multiple hours going over the questions, so we appreciate it. I don't think it is difficult to schedule this group, and I don't think we will have much more information than what we can share with you tonight at, at your pleasure. Mr. Mayor, all I know is that um, the council has been considering this question for two weeks. It's the administration and everyone else who's been considering the question for months. Uh, to say we is sort of unnecessarily includes us. So with all due respect, um, I'm not prepared either tonight to, to ask the question. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've uh, been shown a different set of numbers by members of the police union. I don't know, I mean, those are also, uh, you know, very, very generic. And I don't have the ability to even ask those questions right now. That's kind of the point. Of, of, of forming a, you know, a week-long committee to research these questions. We have provided architecture-based, expert-based uh, analysis that's been done over a period of months. We shared that four weeks ago in a written form. 
uh, with all of you in significant detail. Happy to go over that some more. At, in, at the bottom line, the question is, do you agree with purchasing a 64,000 square foot building at the estimated cost versus the approach, which we don't recommend, of a 35,000 foot expansion at an estimated apples to apples comparison or for other purposes, the comparison of a completely new building, 35,000 square foot, and we strongly recommend the former, which is a much better value proposition. Uh, and if you, if you don't agree with that value proposition, so be it, but I don't think the refinements are gonna change that value proposition that we're talking about. I think they will, but thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Question from Council Member Rallo. Thank you. Uh, I agree with my colleague, uh, Council Member Volman, that um, you know it is our fiduciary responsibility to to make sure that the decision is appropriate and correct uh, regarding all of the estimates. And so, I think we need to do due dil diligence on that. But since the mayor offered uh, us to ask questions, I have one. Uh, Plan B. Uh, would involve ex uh, renovation and expansion of the existing headquarters. Is that a, a commitment by the administration that if we if we don't purchase the the showers uh, building, that the administration will uh, uh, provide the the needed renovation and the expansion of the headquarters that we require for public safety? Thank you for the question, Council Member Allo. No, Plan B is not an expansion of the existing facility. It would be a rehab of the 20,000 square feet that are there. We would not proceed with an expansion. That's not a prudent use in our view, but we would uh, invest in rehabbing the, the current space, the 20,000 square feet. Council Member Rallo, did you have a follow-up question or are you finished? No, um, I, I understand that uh, the, the mayor is reticent to, to commit to that, uh, and I make note of it. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Uh, following up on the, the plan B that was shared, that would likely put the fire headquarters um, co-located with a training facility on the south side of town somewhere. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yes, as, as you asked about Plan B, as the council asked what we would do if we didn't do the showers building, um, because the fire administration is in a place that it has to move, we would look at where to put them, and the, the most logical, efficient place would be in a new logistics center down far on South Walnut, just to join the 5,000 square feet with that. Thank you. And a, another yes, question, please. that's okay. Uh, digging in more deeply to what council members Volan and Rallo were asking about with respect to um, assumptions and uh, cost, cost estimates and trying to um, unpack those a bit more. Uh, Councilmember Volan mentioned specifically that he has received different numbers from the Fraternal Order of Police uh, than what the city uh, administration has provided to us. Um, I think I've seen that as well and I think others have. So I guess my question is, uh, we have representat representatives here tonight. If they mention in comments, uh, during public comment, specifically which line items that they have different estimates for and what the basis of their estimates are, would the administration be in a position tonight to respond uh, to their comments as well as what your line item estimates are for? So I, mean, I think that's the idea of this ad hoc committee is to, to dig into these disputed numbers. I'm happy to do that as well, but I, I share your comment that you sort of made earlier, Mr. Mayor, that we, everyone's here tonight who should be able to discuss that. So let's do it. We'd be happy to do that. We have not seen such numbers. I don't know that they're created by architects and construction engineers, uh, but we'd be happy to react to those uh, and, and again, defend the numbers. Now I'll repeat again, these are estimates. They're apples to apples estimates by a series of professionals who have looked extensively at these buildings and are using industry standards. Happy to answer any challenges to those assumptions tonight, absolutely. Thank you. Additional questions? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Um, yes, I wanted to inquire about the uh, the administration's estimates for 
um, a possible rehab and expansion of the existing BPD facility. Um, I, and I did speak with Ms. Koontz earlier uh, today, but I wanted to just uh, ask for the public record. Um, it's my understanding that the cost estimate for rehab and expansion, especially the rehab portion, um, in, in order to compare that with showers, uh, the estimate um, for the rehab is, is a kind of a complete overhaul of the current police station and reorganization based on most efficient placement of various um, facets of the police operations. Um, and is that right? And, and if that is right, then is there not a, um, an uninvestigated or unspecified uh, additional option, which would be to just rehab and do um, and without reconfiguring the current police station? Council member, you are correct. Um, I, uh, the existing police station, the assumption is, is that we will be reconfiguring the existing police station, moving walls to ensure that we have all of the departments co-located together within the police station and also in the right locations. When you do a significant addition, in my experience, um, leaving an existing building and leaving all of the walls the way they are typically does not work. And so we have made an assumption that that is going to happen. Um, thank you. And so your, if- your last, Yeah, your, your last question. I'm sorry, I should have answered the second question also, which is, is there a, I, I think that in essence was, is there, an, is, there, is there some additional analysis or some additional findings that could happen in a, in a next phase of design? Yes, absolutely, there could be. Uh, you, we might find that in the lower level, uh, we keep uh, the corridor walls the same and we don't change anything there. That, that would lead to some savings for sure. What I don't believe is that it will be significant enough savings uh, in particular, it may get it closer to the showers building estimate. I will acknowledge that. Um, I do not believe that it is ever going to reach the value proposition of the amount of square footage that you will get with the investment that you would have for public safety with that initiative at showers. All right, thank you. Thank you. Additional first round questions from council. Anyone who has not yet asked a question? All right, let us go to Council Member Rollo, whose hand is up. Well, I wanted to ask a question about co-location of emergency services. Um, I understand that there may be efficiencies that could be demonstrated with co-location, but it also implies, I think, vulnerabilities. So as I mentioned last time, uh, in the events of natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, fire, and so forth, I mean, we were talking about emergency services, after all, that everyone depends upon. Uh, wouldn't it be prudent to separate these? Um, you know, one of the blessings in Bloomington is we have multiple emergency providers, of course, the county, as well as Indiana University and others that have facilities. Um, we have a separate dispatch center um, we have, of course, five separate fire stations. Um, we, we will be prepared for any emergency like that, of course, uh, but I guess m my view is, um, and, the, and the review of this approach has been endorsed uh, by the re those who, public safety reviewers, but um, so we absolutely would be prepared for the destruction of any facility in the, in the city whether it's our 911 center or whether it's the city hall or whether it's um, uh, whatever might be, be hit. I do think it's, it, we shouldn't underestimate the value of the co-location for the future of public safety services. That's a, that's a very positive thing. If any others want to comment on the co-location, that's fine. Of course, police and fire were co-located many decades ago, I think, uh, I forget, but, but uh, we certainly will prepare for any contingency like that. Councilmember Rollo, is your question answered? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I see this as a vulnerability. I, I, when it comes to emergency services, I pray, place a very high value on redundancy and resiliency. That's what I'll say. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any questions? Councilmember Bolan. Question back to you, Madam I wonder if you could characterize for us the past few weeks of scheduling. I know that there's been a lot on our agenda. Um, what would you say were the two or three biggest issues we've had to consider in the past month or two that you've had to schedule? Well, <laughs> this for one. This for one. The one coming after us. Um, the bond. Council members, Camelard, can you help me out? Yeah. A lot of things that have really kind of taken priority that we've kicked other things down the hill to 2020. I mean, that's actually what I'm going for is would it, would it be safe to say that we've had a full agenda the past few months? It has been pretty intense over, I'd say, the past two, three months, yes. I mean, to what extent would you say you and uh, Councilor Scambaluri have been able to keep track of, keep up with all the different items that you've been asked to vote on? We've done it. It has been difficult. Thank you. Additional council questions? Seeing no more at this point, it is time to go to the... Yes. Oh, Council Member Sims, sorry. Thank you. Um, and I'll take note of our parliamentarian who said this is a question, so I'll try to roll comments within all that. Um, first thing, I do want to say that um, I've heard that there are some numbers, additional numbers that's been provided apparently by the police union members or something that's been given to a few or a couple of my colleagues, and I would just request that we get those numbers as well, um, or me particularly. And if we're going to talk about it tonight and some people have the numbers, then the rest of us are at somewhat of a disadvantage in that discussion, and I'm not so sure I really appreciate that at all. Um, let's talk about my question has to do with future expansion. So if we do the current police station, That'll go from 20,000 square feet to 35,000 square feet. And then we'll almost have not quite double in this facility. So what is our future expansion needs? So even if we renovated our current facilities, how soon before we're out of space in there? Our best guesstimate. So I can, I can address uh, one part of the question, which is, um, how much additional square footage is available, right? So if you just look at what else is available after the uh, initial police headquarters and initial fire headquarters, there's about 18,000 square feet then remaining um, that could be uh, reallocated to other city functions. So I'll just I'll, I'll leave that in terms of what will be that capacity once uh, all of the leases, uh, once you don't have any tenants, so. Okay, more directly are at anticipated expansion needs? How much, in five years from now, how much more space do you think we'll need? Well, so, Mike Dekoff, police chief. So as we, as annexation talks and, and everything continues, um, you know, obviously we would be adding people there, but keep in mind we're 20, I think as of today, 22 officers down. And um, so when we put, those back in place in our current building, we're going to be pretty tight on space. Um, you know, and we've, we've those, those numbers currently are spread out through our detective division, our DROs, our patrol division. So it's spread out. Um, but if we are fully staffed and then we start adding more people, which, you know, hopefully with, with the mayor's approval and the council's approval, we can continue to grow because our community continues to grow and we have lots of challenges. But um, I can't give you a specific number, but um, you have been provided numbers, I think, as to annexation, if those go, those go through and how we would grow with annexation. And those, those numbers um, would add at several, several more officers to the force. Okay, so those numbers include uh, possibly adding more of our non-sworn officers? Yes, so that, there's, those, there's, those numbers are built into that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Smith has a question? Um, the additional, um, one of the things that's hanging me up is the additional square feet that uh, are, is in showers. Uh, if the move takes would take place. So I, I think 
so we're spending public safety money. And so I, I am uncomfortable with the appropriateness of we're going to have, we're going to use the public safety money and then we're going to have about, you know, 18 or 20,000 square feet left over. So I get a little bit like uncomfortable thinking about that because then the public safety money wasn't spent for public safety issues for those additional 18,000 square feet. So can, can you kind of like help me think through that a little bit? Well, thanks for the question, Council Member Smith. I, I'll tell you how I think about it. Um, uh, I view it as a, a bonus investment in the future where public safety, we are buying uh, what we need now for uh, excellent expansion, integration, all the things we've talked about. And we are having in reserve leasable space, which as we don't need it, we can lease and earn revenue to help pay for the building that public safety is occupying. And as it's needed, if it's needed over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, that can be converted over time. Lease, privately leased space can be, leases can be ended and we can use that space. I view it as kind of an insurance purchase that uh, is very prudent to do. It's, it would be, I mean, the challenge of building a 35,000 square foot building that will open in three years is, it may be too small when we open it. Uh, we just, you know, we don't know exactly. And this gives us a lot of uh, good flexibility for the future. Yeah, I, and I do have this follow-up question. Can I ask this? Yes, please. Um, and I don't know if it's to you, Mayor Hamilton, or if it's to Deb. Um, it, so that the showers is the optimal recommendation from the administration. Is there a recommendation number two that comes out of this, and I know you said option B, but we don't know what that is exactly. Is there like, a, is there like an option B that we can think about, and then the, the follow-up to that is, you know, how do we know what the cost of that is either? Thank you for the question. Um, we did try to answer that last time, and when asked, well, if we don't do option A, what, what would the administration do? What is the next best choice? And option B that we outlined, I think in, in some writing, was that we would proceed with the uh, fire investments as described with the addition of having to find space for administration, which is what Council Member Flaherty was asking about, saying, well, that might have to be moved into the Logistics and Operations Center to add the fire administration space, and we would likely spend some money, a couple million, I don't know exactly what, on the existing police facility, the 20,000 square feet to upgrade it, improve it, do the best we can with that facility. Uh, and then, and that's it basically for these new facilities. It would mean we would have additional revenue for the 10 year PS lit plan, capital plan, which is not completely funded either. So it would probably let us do some other things in that plan, but in terms of the buildings, it would be those, those four major things would be plan B. And I, you know, I think we would do what we can with the police station. I don't think it would be optimal um, and I don't think it would be a long-term solution, but it would be what we would do. Thank you. All right, any other additional questions before we go to public? All right, seeing none, are there public comments either here in chambers or at home from Zoom? comment, you'll need to raise your hand using the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen or the more tab if you're on a mobile device. If you are having trouble making a comment or raising your hand, um, send a meet, uh, chat to the meeting host and we can help. Thank you. And before we begin the public comment, there have been some council questions kind of probing more about the information that's coming from the um, police department itself. And we just were handed some uh, additional uh, information about cost estimates. So I don't know if the council wants to hear from the FOP representatives in a more uh, sub substantive manner, almost similar to a presentation, or if you want just them to comment in a public comment period. Councilmember Smith, do you have a, I mean Sims, do you have a, an opinion about that? 
as far as them doing a presentation, I mean, has this been some sort of a survey and they've used other architects to use or this just numbers that's been generated? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm okay with it being public comment, but to give a whole other presentation on, on numbers that's not been vetted, I have no reason to question them. But okay. Agreed. Say what? I agree with them. I agree with them. So we just go ahead and public comment. Okay, very good. We do have people here in chambers. Are there any hands raised at home? I don't see any hands on Zoom. All right. Well, just keep me posted and we'll begin here uh, at the podium. Sorry. A time limit in terms of a public comment. Can we allow five minutes? Dave Askins, B Square Bulletin. Good evening, Council Members. Um, so first of all, thanks to Council Member Sims for raising the point about everybody being on the same page with respect to the information. Um, I think that every member of the public would also like to have the same construction estimates from the FOP that, uh, that Council Member Sims um, talked about. What I want to ask about tonight actually is a different kind of number, namely the purchase price for the property. So. Uh, normally, for general government, the purchase price for real estate can't exceed the amount of two fair market appraisals, and that is, I think, a pretty familiar fact. The transaction for the Showers building would exceed the amount of two fair market appraisals, but that's still legal because it's the Redevelopment Commission, that is the RDC, that is the purchaser, and the RDC is kind of special when it comes to buying property. The ability of the RDC to exceed the average of two fair market appraisals is expressed in the state law about the procedures that the RDC is supposed to follow in order to buy real estate. So that state law is IC 36-7-14-19, Acquisition of Real Property Procedure Approval. So I'll quote from that law, quote, the prices to be offered may not exceed the average of two independent appraisals of fair market value pro procured by the commission, and then there's some other stuff, the prices indicated on the list may not be exceeded unless specifically authorized by the commission or ordered by a court in condemnation proceedings." End quote. So I think that is the sentence of state code that makes it possible for an RDC to pay more than the average of two fair market appraisals. Maybe there's something else in addition, but I don't think so. I think that's the one. So what I just quoted talks about the, quote, prices indicated on the list. What list is that talking about? I mean, it's not Santa's list. It's a list that's referred to earlier in the same uh, section of state code. Quote, the Redevelopment Commission shall first approve and adopt a list of the real property and interest in real property to be acquired and the price to be offered to the owner of each parcel of interest." End quote. So just as a matter of historical fact, the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission did not approve and adopt such a list for the Showers building transaction. I asked for that list under Indiana's Access to Public Records Act, and it took a few weeks for the city to tell me that there was no such adopted list. And along with the denial of the request, came an interesting explanation, which I'll paraphrase, as saying that this part of the statute that describes the list uh, and the requirement of making a list does not serve any us useful purpose in this particular situation because this section of state code is about what has to happen when the RDC is defining a new TIF district, which is not what's happening here. So, you know, I'm gonna, of course, dispute the idea that the taking of an act by a public body at a public meeting serves no useful purpose. It lets us in the public know sooner than we otherwise would what the RDC's plans are. I don't even think that requires an argument, so I'm not here to argue that point. I do have some questions. Question one, if the making and adopting of a list is not actually legally required here, because that part of the law is not relevant to this situation, then why is a different line of code in the same part of the law, which allows the exceedance of the average of two fair market appraisals, still somehow relevant? So put another way, why can we let ourselves off the hook for making and adopting the list, but still leave ourselves on the hook 
for exceeding the average of two fair market appraisals. A second question, why is the RDC acting as the purchaser in this transaction? Given that there's no tax increment revenues at stake here, which is the money that the RDC oversees, is there some, some reason for the RDC to be acting as the purchaser other than the fact that it makes it possible to offer more than the average of two fair market appraisals? And finally, a third question. The state law that I just quoted from mentions condemnation proceedings. That's eminent domain. So why, in this particular situation, did the city not just say, look, CFC, we need the rest of this building for a legitimate public purpose, so the regular city government, not the RDC, is just gonna take the building under eminent domain. And I'll wrap up with two observations. Uh, I'm gonna go two seconds over time. Uh, just one observation. This is the first time that the public has had a chance to weigh in on the specific question of the expenditure. It's 10 days before the end of the year on the eve of a major snowstorm. Look at the hour on the clock. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Anyone from home on Zoom? At this time, there are no hands raised, but there is a comment from Samuel Dove that he would like to be read. His comment is, why IU Basketball Stadium change name, not football stadium? That not sense for public. All right, thank you. We're coming back to Chambers, we have public comment. And once you state your name, you will have five minutes. <clears throat> Good evening, council members. Paul Post, President of FOP Lodge 88. I'm here tonight to ask you to reject the showers building purchase idea. Uh, we have spoken out against making this very expensive purchase, providing with uh, the opinions of the rank and file who will be the day-to-day -day users of this property. We've spoken about the ingress and egress concerns, and we appreciate hearing those brought up again tonight. Um, I'd like to focus on another area uh, of that report that was referenced earlier, um, the seismic design requirements, something I haven't heard mentioned a, a lot in this. The Tabor Bruce Architecture and Design Incorporated report brought up, quote, various code issues. These code issues are due to police and fire buildings being deemed essential and rated as risk category four buildings. The code issues were addressed later by Jim Lewis at LNJ Engineering, LLC, who made several statements in that report regarding his findings at Showers. Just as a reminder, I'm going to read them. Quote, these walls are not reinforced, they have aged mortar, and in most locations are load bearing. Therefore, it is my opinion that these walls would not meet the required design loadings for the proposed use. Quote, these timber connections were built with mainly vertical loading requirements and will not meet the, designed si the required seismic provisions without significant uplift. Quote, these connections will not satisfy the connection requirements of the applicable codes and will therefore require significant upgrade and retrofit. Quote, overall, the building appears to be in good structural condition, especially considering the 1994 remodel. However, it is my opinion that without significant structural upfit, this building will not meet the proposed requirements. Uh, later, it goes on from William Horton at Fink, Roberts, and Petrie Incorporated, quote, the seismic design requirements, however, do not appear that they can be met without extensive structural rehabilitation. And quote, based on this information, a review of the soil borings that were done, it does not seem feasible that the building could be assigned to a risk category four for the structure without extensive additional analysis and retrofit. It sounds to us like after a $9 million purchase price, a large portion of the funding will be needed just to satisfy the significant and extensive seismic design requirements. Uh, also, I'd like to bring up a phrase uh, that was used by the mayor last week with, uh, talking to us about this purchase. Um, the phrase is income generating property. We've started to touch on that tonight just a little bit, but I think it bears uh, pointing out. Uh, this plan now appears to have sections of the 64,000 square foot purchase remain income generating property for the city. So we would ask, where does that money go? Is it debt service on the bonds? Does it go back into public safety? Is it just absorbed back into the general fund? I don't think we've heard that. Uh, was this the rationale all along, to use public safety funds as a guise to purchase this prime office space? One thing that we recently found out is that CFC appears to have signed yet another lease uh, that will be a multi-year uh, lease in that building. <laughs> Council members, we ask you to reject this bad idea, slow down this process, get answers to your questions, and hopefully uh, involve the end users to make a better plan that will serve the community for years to come. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Next speaker here in chambers. Good evening, council members. Jeff Rogers, representative with the Bloomington Police Department. I first want to apologize uh, to any of the council members that re received information and then also didn't receive information. There was nothing officially sent out until about 10 minutes ago, so I apologize and you should all have the uh, information now. Um, what I would like to do, can we go to the second page first? Um, this was brought up a couple of times, uh, Council Member Flaherty, as well as a couple of others regarding the line items, so I wanted to specifically bring those up. Um, I will tell you that these line items, uh, the way that they were obtained and the cost estimates for each were obtained from an individual who consistently contracts and subcontracts with the city currently. We obtained these estimates from them and then we took each of these estimates for renovation and we actually increase them by 30 to 50 percent each in order to make sure that we are giving a healthy cushion and taking inflation into account. Um, specifically, whenever we talk about, you know, they keep saying over and over again that it's going to cost much more money to do the BPD renovation and expansion. Well, the first thing that they say is a $2 million parking level. We've made it clear that we do not need that. That is not necessary. It values at $133,000 per parking space. It is not necessary. Um, whenever we talk about putting the actual expansion in, that will remove a north-south uh, uh, walkway that actually is existing. It also has uh, landscape on both sides of it. If you remove that walkway because it's no longer necessary and you remove the landscaping on both sides, you've just now added approximately six parking spaces. We also have another additional nine parking spaces on the east side of the building on Lincoln that are currently being used for pool vehicles. We move those vehicles down to the training center. So there's our 15 spaces that we've just recouped and we haven't spent $2 million. Um, they are taking a very broad brush in saying that it will cost $5 million to renovate the police department. A few of the council members have actually come over to the department and we walked through and spoken about the things that would actually need to be done as far as renovation and how we would continue to use the building. I would invite any of you to come over, whether it be throughout the holiday, first week of January. If you reach out to either myself, Officer Post, we will make ourselves available and do a walkthrough, specifically the renovations that were determined between the administration as well as the officers as far as what would be needed in order to upfit that building and continue to use it in the future. Again, line items, I'm not gonna read them all off, but a specific example, a perimeter drain in order to make sure that along with the additions that they have done to the current uh, sewer next to us in order to avoid future um, future flooding, a perimeter drain would also be installed basically to almost guarantee there wouldn't be. I, I don't want to say guarantee because it can always happen, but a perimeter drain would make sure that would never happen again. That was valued at $250,000 as far as the cost, so we indicated $400,000. Again, whenever you talk about the line-by-line -line items, they indicated $5 million. We indicate it would be less than $600,000. Um, I'll let you look through it and, and see specifically. I am welcome, uh, I welcome any of you to ask specific questions as far as what actually would need to be done in that renovation. But I think whenever you talk about $5 million um, as well as the $2 million parking, again, it's much more than, than what we would need for that building in order to keep it maintained. Um, whenever you talk about further down, um, line item 15 through 17, again, IT, security, and AV, they're indicating it would be the exact same cost for our current building as what it would be for us to move over to the showers building. Half the building already has brand new or very new TVs. I don't understand why it would cost half a million dollars in AV, again, whenever we're talking about increasing by 15,000 square feet versus increasing by 30,000 square feet. Um, whenever you talk about further down as far as line 22 through line 25, again, I don't understand why the cost of all of those fees, $800,000 in furniture, I, I, 
just don't understand how it would cost. You're, you're keeping the exact same numbers for what the move to showers would be, and you're translating those same costs to what increasing by 15,000 square foot would be. Um, it, the numbers are just overinflated whenever you talk about those expansions. And whenever you talk about moving into a 35,000 square foot versus a 64,000 square foot, I understand 18,000 square feet would not be used, but again, Maybe we talk about all that. I've run out of time. I invite you all, please respond to my email. If you have specific questions, we'd be happy to go through it with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other public comment from Zoom? I'd like to remind the public that if you'd like to comment, uh, you need to raise your hand using the raise hand feature um, in the reactions tab or the more tab if you have a mobile device. Um, if you have trouble uh, uh, raising your hand, send a message to the meeting host and we can help. Seeing no hands popping up. No. All right. One hand. Oh, it's. Oh, is there another? Is there a hand? It's a hand from um, Council Member Rollo. Okay. All right. Back to Council for either questions. I assume that you will have questions and we will begin with Council Member Rollo. Thank you, I jumped the gun there. Uh, well, I'd like to begin with the uh, architect. Uh, Ms. Kuntz, could you respond to Mr. Post's reference to the engineering assessments about risk category four building, uh, that is the showers, uh, having seismic uh, vulnerabilities? Um, did you incorporate those costs? If so, where are those, um, where are those in, your, in your spreadsheet? Yeah. So I'm happy to address it. Actually, if you, yeah, when you think about it, you had three studies done, right? So the first study was that Tabor Bruce, and then subsequently Spring Point Architects uh, with their Boston consultant did their study. And if you look at what the information that they provided in Exhibit A of their study, they actually um, contacted the Indiana State Building Commissioner and addressed the directly the uh, citing that Tabor Bruce did on the risk category number four. Uh, and in the email on exhibit A of the Spring Point study, it specifically identifies again from the Indiana State Building Commissioner that per the GRRs 12-4-11, um, it, it is that it prevents the IBC from ever coming into play into the question whether upgrade or existing structure unless the proposed occupancy group or subgroup represents a change from the existing classification. So what does that mean? That means that um, this is an office building right now. It is an occupancy group two, and it will continue to be an occupancy group two for uh, when it is the headquarters for police and for fire. And so because the occupancy has not changed, therefore the risk category will not change. And that is by the Indiana State Building Commissioner, again, Exhibit A on the, on the study. So no, that has not been incorporated into our um, cost estimates because of the uh, determination from the Indiana State Building Commissioner. So no upgrades are needed, in other words? Based on the commissioner's assessment, it is not, does not need to be upgraded to risk category four. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Additional questions, Council Member Piedmont Smith. I would like to move that we postpone further consideration of appropriation ordinance 2206 until January 18th, 2023. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to postpone this discussion to January 18th. Uh, do we have any discussion on the matter before we? Yes, Council Member Flater. If, um, if it's all right, I'd like to hear from the administration uh, specifically with respect to not necessarily their preference about this motion, but any uh, fiscal, legal issues, et cetera, that we might run into by um, moving this back uh, close to a month. With respect to the appropriation of bonds we've already issued, um, we received proceeds from option to purchase on showers, et cetera. Okay, uh, thank you. Corporation Counsel Beth Kate, um, thank you for the question. Uh, one thing I would point out is if you're going to postpone everything, uh, including the appropriation of any of the bond proceeds, we do have costs that are associated with 
uh, the financing itself. So we have bond counsel, we have uh, financial consultants, the people who are involved in placing the bonds. Uh, there are costs associated with that that would be paid out of the appropriation of the bond proceeds. I'm sure they'd like to get paid sooner rather than later for the work that they've already done and quite successfully, as you heard earlier. So it would affect the timing of that. Uh, and in addition, I think, and others can speak to this more than me, but uh, any impact on costs from delays in terms of uh, getting funds uh, encumbered and into place because there's a range of projects that the appropriation of those bond proceeds are relevant to. So does that help answer your question? I think so. To say um, there are costs associated, but nothing uh, catastrophic with respect to uh, being able to appropriate these funds and or legally purchase the showers building. Well, <laughs> catastrophic. I mean, I like, to, I like to pay bills on time. <laughs> so, you know, there is that, but uh, yeah, so. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes, did you have a follow-up? Yes, I wanted to follow up, um, Ms. Kate. Um, as far as the bond financing expenditures, um, is there a way that the city could pay those with an, another source and then reimburse with bond funds? I will probably defer that question to the controller's office for the machinations on uh, the money, and I think he may be on. There he is. Mr. Underwood. Good evening, uh, Jeff Underwood, city controller. Uh, no, not at this late date. Uh, we would have to, that, that, those funds were not appropriated anywhere, and we do not have a way to pay those, uh, and it's too late to appropriate that through the normal process. Okay, and while you're there, Mr. Underwood, thank you for that. Um, is there, uh, what, what are our legal obligations to make those payments? Can we delay in making them? Uh, typically, they're due within 30 days of, of, the, of the close of those. We've received both of those, but typically within bonds, uh, it, you know, it gets appropriated when you approve the sale and, and those are paid immediately thereafter um, out of those bond funds due to the fact that they've worked without pay for anywhere from four to six months. So we have people that, um, you know, they, they're out funds for their payroll and rents and everything else. So we, we generally try to get those paid within a couple of weeks uh, of the bond closing. So, uh, but no more than 30 days. Thank you. Mr. Allen, did you have something to add? Yeah, Larry Allen, Assistant City Attorney. The only other thing I'd point out is just a, a slight logistical difficulty of, it provides a very tight window for providing on the property closing, as you know, under the agreement we have until January 31st to essentially obtain that approval and to have closing uh, happen on the CFC Showers building. So there, we are just a little bit nervous about, that's a pretty tight window for that turnaround time and just getting all that done. So I just point that out also to the council. If I could just add one more comment. I know this isn't on exactly the bond proceeds, but I do encourage we have an expert who is happy to discuss these financial questions that were just raised about costs, who is available and would be delighted to respond to that at your, at your direction tonight, who is available here. Thank you. Council question? Council Member Smith? Go ahead. Okay, so uh, financial expert, that's who, I, that's, that's who I'd like to ask this question to, and uh, forgive me for asking it, um, but um, w the difference in the figures that, you know, we, we got just a little bit ago, in the figures that we were presented with, uh, with the three different options, uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around this still so that I do the right thing um, in a, uh, and spend the taxpayers' money in a good way. So how, how do we, how, do, how can I look at these numbers and resolve this? Uh, one says 20 million, the other one, you know, says a lot more. <laughs> how can I do that? I, I would encourage you to, if we could, ask uh, Deb Koontz to respond to that. Yes. We're engaging in conversation around the, the motion to postpone until January 18th. Mm -hmm. I want to, ah. perhaps this is relevant in some sense to it, but it's really just substantive discussion of the appropriation ordinance. If we're going to get back into that, we should probably vote down the motion to postpone and, before doing so. 
Okay. I hope we can. Thank you. Okay, so on the motion to postpone, are there any comments, questions? Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you. Just to follow up on the um, deadline for the, the cl property closing, what is there some kind of, is it like an agreement right now? Or, I mean, would it just make sense to, is there, I mean, I feel like normally there is um, maybe a deadline for a purchase agreement to be signed. Is that what we would be running into? Or is there, you know, an actual closing? So in this, in this instance, we have the purchase agreement, but it is their conditions precedent to closing includes the council's approval because council needs to approve any purchase by the RDC over $5 million, as we've, we've mentioned. The deadline within the agreement for that type of approval was set for January 31st, 2023. Okay. Is, that, is that possible to change? So we don't know. I mean, that's obviously contingent on the other party here who's eager to get going. I think the other aspect of it uh, that Mr. Griffin also negotiated as part of the due diligence period here was $500,000 off the purchase price. It would also remain to be seen whether that would still be valid after that or, or they would negotiate some other type of different term because that's, that's usually been our experience is that there's, they want something of value uh, for a change in the agreement. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions regarding the motion on the table? Council Member Volan. Um, you know, the, uh, there's a precedent for what the administration is proposing here. City Hall was once, it was now the Waldron Art Center, it was once City Hall. Uh, what is now WFHB was the former fire station number one, and the building immediately north of the old City Hall was the former sheriff, uh, the jail and sheriff's house. So. We've been co-located before, not only with um, city services, but with county services. There's a precedent for it. Um, I agree that the potential investment uh, into Showers West is a logical expansion for City Hall. I get it, I don't dispute it, but we're proposing to use PS Lit dollars for it to be a public safety facility and non, not non-public safety office space. Some of the concerns expressed by Mr. Post of the FOP about seismic issues apply to this building itself. I mean, they were all built, to, it's, this is the same building, it was built at the same time. Um, the, there's still due diligence work um, that the council has to do. Like, there just hasn't been enough time for us to do all the work that we think we need to do to vet this. Um, and I don't see this as any different than approving a budget. Uh, council members are expected to know and understand the numbers in the budget. Uh, now we're being asked to spend $30 million in capital spending, but we have not been discussing this purchase for many weeks and months. Everybody else but us has. The mayor broadly stated that earlier. We've been considering it solo for two weeks and the bond for a couple of weeks more than that. Uh, we, the council, don't necessarily want, quote, more and more detail, unquote, as Ms. Kuntz said. We want some more detail, a limited amount, a little lower than thir the 30,000 foot level that she's presented. We, the council, do not appreciate being told that we should decide quickly simply because costs are going up. We should not be asked to approve this simply because bond council needs to be paid. We're not the ones who structured the proposal. Perhaps the administration should have anticipated this possibility and brought separate app ordinances. If, as Ms. Kuhn said, the administration has the time to make many design decisions in the process after this is approved, then they had time for us to take one more month to fully understand what they're asking us to improve. But the numbers from the administration are insufficient. The numbers from the police union that question the assumptions made by the administration are themselves unsubstantiated and insufficient. We need to look into them. Ms. Koontz talked about the 30,000 foot level. I asked her about the 20,000 foot, but really I really want is the 25,000 foot level. If I'm forced to vote tonight, my vote would be abstention or no, simply because I don't feel I've had enough time to vet the administration's proposal at the 25,000 foot level that I described or the counter proposal from uh, police union. I recommend, in addition to approving this motion tonight, whether we do it on the 18th or the 11th or the 25th, but probably the 11th or the 18th, that in the first 10 days of the new year, an ad hoc committee of three or four council members conduct a quick and dirty series of intensive meetings in the, uh, to research both sets of assertions at the 25,000 foot level. I know that Councilmember Rollo and Councilmember Piedmont-Smith uh, are interested in this, as am I. I'm agnostic about which three or four members would serve on it, but 
I think we're all interested in those details. Uh, I am not a yes and I am not a no, but I cannot be a yes tonight. So I would ask my colleagues to uh, support uh, some research in the first week of the new year and to approve the motion to postpone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilmember Flaherty. Um, I, I share Councilmember Boland's uh, desire to better substantiate these numbers, uh, but I have a hard time supporting the motion at this stage of the meeting because um, I feel like we probably could get through the, the, the spreadsheet that uh, uh, the FOP representatives shared with us. Uh, there's only a handful of items we could literally just talk line by line and hear the response, and maybe at that point uh, we feel like we need further conversations to sort of validate. It might be that these two sets of numbers aren't actually inconsistent that the numbers that were shared with us by uh, the administration entail more things than the, for instance, six line items that the FOP <coughs> shared with us, um, and that we just don't know because we haven't actually haven't tried to dig into that substance in this meeting that is uh, the purpose uh, of which is to dig into that substance. Uh, so I'm, I'm not opposed to the, to the taking more time, but there's other considerations here, and we, I don't feel like we've given it a fair shot in this meeting yet, and in particular because of the um, ongoing costs associated, I'm going to vote no on this motion, but I actually would be open to such a motion later in the evening if we haven't satisfied, after actually trying to, um, uh, our ability to reconcile these. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Bola? I would respectfully disagree with my colleague. Uh, we could get through the spreadsheet tonight, but at what expense? It's already after nine, and we have another important issue on the agenda, and the county commissioners are here to address that issue. It is no less important than this, even though this is more important to us because we represent the city. But I would argue that, you know, this is public safety night here at City Council. And uh, I mean, if Mr. Flaherty wants to stay until midnight, we could do it. Uh, but at, at what further expense? Furthermore, I don't agree that we're going to be able to get answers uh, tonight that. Uh, I mean, if, if there's any research that needs to be done, how many times have we been told the administration will get back to us with numbers? They don't know everything tonight. Yes, Ms. Kuntz or other members of the administration could tell us a thing or two, uh, maybe some things. I, I can't. I just can't. I can't rely. I need more time. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. Uh, yes, I agree. I think that more time is needed, and I support the motion. Uh, just uh, quickly, I, I, I'm highly skeptical of the, uh, of the ingress, egress uh, challenges at showers to begin with. I think that it's self-evident that the uh, Third Street location is superior. I don't think that, uh, un unless the architects can come forward with some sort of proposal that uh, offers uh, uh, something that's comparable, I, I, I think that's a, a very, uh, difficult proposition, I think, for officers. And if uh, I, I don't think it's just uh, my objection. I, I have yet to find a single rank and file officer who believes that, that uh, uh, to moving to showers is advisable for that reason. But there are other questions uh, as well, including the uh, cost of uh, $2 million for a parking garage that uh, isn't needed, uh, at, at least as Mr. Post and uh, Mr. Rogers has, has stated, I, I tend to think that might be accurate and I need to investigate that further. Um, there's, I, I understand there's a cost uh, required to move a communications antenna that w might be underestimated. I need, I need to have some harder numbers on that um, because that seems to be a floating decimal right now. I'm intrigued by the drain option uh, for the existing headquarters to prevent flooding. I think that that might be a, a, a very cost-effective way in which we preserve the site and, uh, and maintain the, the uh, facility there. So there's more to consider, and I just would say that this is an extremely significant topic. Um, it's going to have huge implications for public safety. It's going to exist for uh, decades to come, so the, the, so the significance of this can't be overstated. And I think that Councilmember Volan is correct saying that more time for this deliberative body uh, to make this commitment is, is, is needed at this time. And I appreciate the motion made by my colleague, Councilmember uh, Piedmont Smith. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, if I could weigh in here, I also support the motion to postpone for a variety of reasons, not the least of which I don't think due diligence has been done with respect to the actual people who serve in this public safety capacity. These are individuals for which we painstakingly did the ED lit, having public safety be a primary bucket of our increase in those taxes that we're asking the public to pay. And so with respect to what the FOP have brought forward, what many of us have been talking to them about in the interim, as we're all trying to do our due diligence here, I agree with the motion to postpone. And also, I appreciate the idea of a 10-day period in the new year for a study. And I would also like to be a part of that if there is a four-member uh, team of people who are going to be tasked with looking at these comparative numbers and doing so in as uh, responsible a fashion as we can before we come back to revisit this. So at this time, is there anyone else who would like to make a comment before we vote on the motion? No other comments? All right. If I could ask the clerk to please call the roll on the motion to postpone to January 18th. Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? No. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? No. Rosenberger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. All right, and that passes seven, two, zero. All right, and with that, we are finished with this. We move on to our next appropriation ordinance, our next ordinance, rather, sorry. Madam President, uh, I move that ordinance 2238 be introduced and read by the clerk by the title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Clarity? Is out of the room. Rosenberger? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Thank you, and will the clerk please read? Okay. Um, ordinance 2238 to amend the city of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning a 87.12 acre property from mixed use employment to mixed-use institutional regarding the northeast corner of West Fullerton Pike and South State Road 37, Monroe County Government Petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2238 would rezone 87.12 acres from mixed-use employment to mixed-use institutional. Thank you. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2238 be adopted. Second. All right, and here we are with, uh, looks like Ms. Jackie Scanlon is here to present. Good evening, I am. Just a second here. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the petition tonight uh, is Plan Commission Case Number ZO4022, and the request is a zoning map amendment, otherwise known as a rezone, um, located here at Fullerton Pike and uh, Interstate 69, um, 87.12 acres that is currently zoned um, mixed-use employment 
uh, and, and being requested to be rezoned to mixed use institutional for the purpose of building a new county jail facility. Uh, the property is uh, here, it's vacant currently. Um, it is zoned ME, the comprehensive plan designation at this location is employment center as well as I-69 interchange. Um, and surrounding uses include uh, more vacant ME to the north, uh, quarry to the um, east, and a single family across the highway to the west, and a couple of single family to the south, and one to the northeast. So again, the request tonight is a map amendment, uh, the technical name for what we more commonly call a rezone of the entire um, parcel. Um, and that is for uh, the purpose of uh, being able to build a jail facility at this location. So again, the site is currently undeveloped. The site was used as a borrow site uh, for the I-69 construction um, and sold much of its topsoil uh, for that purpose. And so um, a different body solid at that time, this was a, a number of years ago um, when I-69 was coming through. Uh, and so um, did need some special approvals to allow that to occur, but has not had any um, significant development. Um, so the property was previously part of a plan unit development. Uh, and then when we did our larger rezone um, of the uh, entire city, uh, that is when it was rezoned um, to ME, which is in line with the comprehensive plan designation, as well as um, what uses were allowed uh, in this area um, through the PUD originally. Uh, so you can see it located here at the southern end of this kind of blue portion that is the comprehensive plan designation for employment center. So the department raised a number of concerns uh, with the plan commission um, who did recommend denial of the request uh, to common council. Um, and so I will briefly go over those uh, and then um, answer any questions that you might have. So those we kind of split into um, the following categories, uh, environmental considerations, access, site design, comprehensive plan compliance, um, site size assumptions, and location assumptions. So for the environmental considerations, you can see here a map prepared by the petitioner. Um, this site has a number of environmental constraints. Um, and uh, I believe actually uh, this these designations of the sloped areas and the Karst Conservancy easement areas were determined um, during the uh, I-69 borrow site petition. Um, but basically you can see here, there's about 30 acres um, of area that's 12% slope or less. And then uh, much of the rest of the land is restricted in some way. Um, so this is a bit of a concern to the department, um, being that we have heard a number of size requirements from the petitioner, one of which being over 40 acres uh, for being able to develop this site, um, which may not be um, available uh, at this location without having some detrimental effects um, on the areas surrounding. Access is another concern. Um, obviously, uh, building a large facility um, that uh, would need to be able to be accessed by members of our community um, across all um, uh, all members of our community um, across different scales uh, and people who have different levels of access. Um, this area will eventually have uh, vehicular access from West Fullerton Pike. That isn't completed yet, of course, but does have the um, interchange um, so you could get there from the West. Um, there is not uh, a Bloomington Transit connection um, indicated here at any time in the future uh, when we reach out to Bloomington Transit. The petitioner did indicate that they were going to be working with them on that. Um, so having this area be rezoned for a specific purpose, uh, a purpose that highly, um, that heavily uh, depends upon being able to be accessible via foot traffic as well as transit in this area um, is something, um, something of a concern uh, for the department that we raised with, um, that we raised with the plan commission. Additionally, with access, uh, as many of you know, um, through subdivision, the subdivision process, if you have a roadway um, on your property that is in the transportation plan, which was adopted um, by this body, uh, you have to uh, plat and build that road. Um, this 
petition and the in discussions that we've had with the county about uh, potential site development do not include a subdivision at this time, um, but we have made it clear to them and want to make it clear to you as well and into the plan commission that there is a roadway plan for this property. Um, so were they to want to subdivide in the future, they need to um, be thinking about that and how they will incorporate that into any sort of site design that they do here because it is required and it's not something um, that they can uh, waive through the plan commission process. Uh, so wanting to keep that in mind because, um, you know, that is a, a, an important connection that was included in the adopted transportation plan. Um, our main concern, I guess, would we would call, we would say is a technical one, which is uh, that this, as I mentioned before, property is zoned employment center, I mean, excuse me, is designated employment center in the comprehensive plan. It has also been identified um, as uh, I-69 and interchange focus area. So again, I have it here circled, obviously very Southern part of town. Um, the comprehensive plan envisions that employment centers will quote, will allow Bloomington to keep pace with the changing economy, the main, which is the main purpose of the district. Um, the department has concerns about whether or not uh, doing a rezone of this nature is supporting the basic goals of the employment center designation. So the site is currently zoned mixed use employment, uh, which seems to more support the goals of the employment center um, uh, district than changing the property to a mixed use institutional. Um, Additionally, the employment center designation, um, as well as part of the uh, focus area um, uh, outlines in the comprehensive plan, that the employment center description um, would list the following uh, desirable uses, professional and business offices, light assembly plants, flex tenant facilities, and research and development centers, a mix of office and light high-tech manufacturing uses that provide quality employment opportunities, um, good access to main thoroughfares, and transit service. Um, so while MI can provide opportunity for some of the things listed in that list, the, the department is concerned um, that doing this rezone uh, for the specific intent of building a large jail does not support the outcomes um, of the employment center designation and that actually the existing zoning district of ME uh, does encourage um, what the comprehensive plan is desiring here um, more already. Um, I will also point out um, we, there has been some discussion. There was some discussion at plan commission. Um, there isn't a plan for exactly what will go here um, that the county is seeking the rezone first. And as especially those of you who have been on this body for a long time, you know that a site plan isn't required in a rezone uh, situation. However, you do, this body has often in the past requested that type of information, uh, especially when something's being rezoned for a purpose that's already known. Um, so in this case, uh, there have been a lot of potential uses discussed. Um, a number were raised at plan commission as well uh, for their consideration um, in the comprehensive plan. Uh, some of those uses for example, would be some of the uses the comprehensive plan desires, especially those related to kind of retail uses, uh, are not allowed in the MI zoning district. So we would actually be losing those uses um, that are listed specifically in the comprehensive plan with this uh, rezone. Um, so as I mentioned, site design is one of the issues. Um, again, no site plan is required. Uh, however, with this being such a large project in such a sensitive area, um, with the considerations of transit, uh, we did not feel that uh, the department did not feel had enough information to be able to um, adequately kind of assess whether or not uh, a site design could be appropriate here for this use. Um, additionally, there were a number of items that I believe were submitted to you all or that I submitted to you all that we received and not enough time to get to the plan commission related to some of the environmental impacts. So you will see those items that the plan commission uh, was not able to see uh, before they had to make their decision. Um, I, we also listed a discussion about some assumptions that were made that are kind of being put forward um, with the request for the rezone that uh, we haven't really seen information backing up those assumptions. So again, hard for the department to feel like 
uh, that we can give um, an inf informed support uh, for this type of request, not only because it doesn't match the comprehensive plan goals, um, but because uh, some things are so unclear still. Um, so you saw this in the report, but for example, a number of the documents submitted uh, you know, have wide ranges of how much acreage is actually needed here. And as I mentioned before, what, what uses are actually planned for this area, um, making this uh, map amendment would be a big change um, from, uh, from the existing zoning, especially uh, to, to arguably not be in line with comprehensive plan. We didn't feel like there was necessarily enough information presented for staff to be able to uh, support that request. Um, uh, again, related to size of what they need and what's going to go there, as well as where it should be located. So I have just included here the general um, the general compliance criteria and those other um, findings of fact that are considered by the uh, department and then the um, plan commission when making a recommendation to council uh, for zoning map amendments. Um, so in conclusion, the department does understand, of course, the practical and necessary needs for a progressive and comprehensive criminal justice system, uh, including new and updated jail facility and um, associated wraparound services, uh, which we wholeheartedly believe the petitioner is attempting to address with this rezone. Uh, the department is concerned that we that this request doesn't meet our current comprehensive plan, um, and that there isn't enough information to indicate that it that it does basically, and that, that we've missed something. Um, this was the information that was presented to plan commission. So again, you did get some additional information related to uh, the environmental situation on the site. Um, but when the plan commission made the recommendation to you, they did not have that available to them. Um, and I think the main crux, the main point we want to make is that the, the technical concerns about whether or not the map amendment aligns with the comprehensive plan designation for this location and what we're giving up um, by uh, by un, by making this uh, area no longer employment focused, um, which is what the comprehensive plan um, has designated, as well as the lack of transit access at, the, access at this location, which is something that was, um, if you read the survey that was submitted, um, of, I believe it was done by the Bar Association with the prosecutor's office and the public defender's office, something that came up quite a bit was that the members of the public who are served by um, not only the jail, but the wraparound services, uh, will they be able to access this and what sort of burdens does that put on not only those who work there, but those who um, need these types of services. And that's something we are concerned about as well. So the plan commission um, heard the petition uh, for two months, uh, ending in November, and recommended um, sent the excuse me petition onto Common Council with a negative recommendation. And I can answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. Uh, at this time, is there someone from the petitioner who wants to make a presentation before we come to Council questions? Good evening, Lee Jones, County Commissioner. I just want to start out by saying that when the term jail is used, that kind of people have a general notion of what that means. And that is not necessarily what we're looking for. We know that an awful lot of the problems that the jail is dealing with aren't going to be solved through incarceration. As a matter of fact, they're actually frequently made quite a bit worse by incarceration. We're looking to divide the jail, probably. We will always need a jail for people who are actually a danger to our community or a danger to themselves. But it doesn't need to be a jail, a huge jail. Um, we are looking to include more of a treatment-oriented component of the jail, both for treating mental illness and substance abuse. Um, we also would like to separate detox from the jail, which could allow a number of people to move to a different situation once they've gone through detox 
than just being automatically jailed. Um, so we are not looking for just your traditional notion. We want to move ahead. And this is something that the state of Indiana is actually very supportive of. They're the ones who said, we have to get over this idea that we can incarcerate our way out of these problems. It's not going to happen. It just makes them worse. So we have to look for a whole new way of approaching this. And um, Commissioner Thomas will address some of your concerns. Thank you. Julie Thomas, Monroe County Commissioner. I just want to uh, address one specific point and then um, uh, County Attorney Jeff Cockrell will provide you a quick overview of our project. Um, this has come up a number of times and it's been bothering me quite a bit. What are you going to do about transportation? Well, there isn't a road there yet. <laughs> so it's, it's a tough question, right? How do you talk about transportation when a road hasn't been built yet? Well, that road will be built. And you have to remember that this is going to change a lot about transit and transportation and routes for the whole county's population when Fullerton Pike is completed, which will be at about the time the jail facility will be completed. It's interesting to see in the comp plan a note that it's an employment area because there are transit options, but yet we're told there are no transit options. Which is it? Here's the thing, if we were an employer of a private company and we came to you all and said, we wanna put uh, an office building, a flex space building here, I don't think anybody in the planning department would ask us, what are you gonna do about transit? Because they'd say, well, look, Fullerton Pike's gonna be finished, this is part of the city, we'll take care of business. So I'd really like to ask the city, what are you going to do about transit? You are in the city, you are the city government. I know you're not the transit board, that's a separate unit. What will you do about transit? Why are you asking us this question? However, rest assured, we will take care of transit if we have to take care of transit. Uh, I'm certainly not saying we won't do that, but I just wonder why the onus is on us in this, uh, through this plan. Mr. Cockrell. And, and I would just add that the, I looked at our last uh, bond documents and the, the Monroe County is the ninth largest employer in the county, right behind the city of Bloomington, who's the eighth. So, and uh, Jeff Cockrell, uh, county attorney, um, if I do not do the advance forward button properly at first, I hopefully will learn by the end of the presentation. Um, so I, I put together this uh, presentation to, to kind of help through uh, some of the issues and some of the reasons why we chose this site, some of the, uh, the thoughts on the difference between the zonings and, and so forth. Um, this is a site, um, and, I, and I think I'd point out now so I don't have to come back as we go Ford, that little H at the bottom, that is Monroe Hospital. And so I think when we talk about some of the reasons we chose this site, that's part of, of the conversation. Um, we're asking for the uh, map amendment request uh, to change the zone from ME to MI. Uh, the purpose of this request is to allow the county to proceed with purchasing property and beginning master planning for the site, which will include a correctional facility. I think that is something that we know that we need to, to deal with immediately, and we'll talk about some of the other things as we move forward. The county is asking for a determination from the city that this is an appropriate place for this use. That's the, that's the conversation we're having tonight. Um, and while we're more than happy to provide information as to why a new facility is necessary, and we think you guys need that background, uh, it, we're not asking the city council to make a determination on, on that, that matter. We're simply asking, is this a good site for us to put this on? 
So I'm gonna give a brief history about our current site. And our current facility has been under an agreed or federal court order since 2009. In 2019, uh, we talked with the Indiana Civil Liberties Union and asked them, hey, let's, can we go ahead and extend this another year? And they said, yes, we can, but, but, but you're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to do a, a, a study of your criminal justice system. Um, in essence, they, they thought that we were utilizing the, the court order as a crutch to not make real change. And so we're like, we're not sure we agree with that you're correct, um, but we'll, we'll do the study, right? And so I'm gonna read two findings from the study that, that just goes to show that the Indiana Civil Liberties Union knows what they're doing. Um, one is the jail facility is incapable of consistently ensuring and sustaining constitutional levels of inmate care and custody. Uh, the jail population has consistently exceeded its functional operation capacity since 2012 and its total capacity since 2017. The facility does not have near the bed capacity needed to safely accommodate the growing inmate population, increases in the number of female inmates, increases with special needs, or to segregate inmates according to their needs or risks they pose to staff and other in inmates, Furthermore, the facility is ill-designed to accommodate the array of health care treatment services required to meet the constitutional levels of care or programs to prepare inmates for successful community reentry. And it also states in the next bullet point, at 36 years old, this, the jail has far exceeded its structural and functional life cycle, despite all its renovations, Remediation of the real and potential risk posed by physical defects, inadequate architectural design, and adverse impact on proper care and treatment, and security problems resulting from facility design and physical deterioration seems cost prohibited at a provisional estimated cost of $56 million. Now, I agreed with this when it came out. I will tell you that some good news is that I've looked, I look occasionally at what our jail numbers are, and you know, this summer it was 230, 240, 250, which was a dramatic improvement. Um, I looked on Monday and it was uh, under 170. So I think we're doing a better job with how many people are in the facility. I think we still have the physical issues associated with the property, we have the, or with, with the facility, and I think we really have uh, efficiency issues and lack of the ability to do some of the programming space that we think is required um, in order to accomplish some of the things uh, Commissioner Jones talked about. So now, why did, why did we look at this site? Well, we started our research um, on looking at sites uh, available in the county that, and, and at that time, and this was probably where that 40 acre number came from, uh, that was kind of when we started our search, we were looking for a minimum of 40 acres. And we were doing that for a couple of reasons. I think 20 to 40 was kind of where we thought we, we, would, we would look at. We did it for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the, the first reason is that we wanted to have a long-term place where we know this function can exist. Uh, one of the problems we have with our current site is that we, you, we're on a one acre footprint of a building and you can go up, um, but you can't really, we couldn't build a, a facility right next to it and then renovate this one to do something else with because there, there is no other real ground that's not being used um, anywhere close to downtown that would allow that. Um, we wanted to include some of these other uses and I, I've got a slide that, that kind of indicates the three the three primary uses that we're thinking about later so I'm, I'm going to reserve that till then. Um, so we wanted something long enough that you know, I think similar to what the, the city administration was talking about on the previous one we wanted to be able to grow into this space we wanted to be able to utilize this space so because we do realize anytime you move a facility like this it causes issues, right? And I think the, the, the transportation issue is, is one that we have heard resoundingly, and it's one that the commissioners are, are willing to, to make sure we fill the gaps as necessary. Um, so we want something long enough to handle all that. We wanted buffering from neighboring properties. Um, I 
understand when people say I don't want to live by this type of facility. I not necessarily always agree with them, but then I, but I, I can't say they're wrong and I, and I understand why it is. This site has an interstate on one side. It's got a beautifully wooded area uh, on uh, two sides, almost two and a half, and then uh, you've got a driveway a driveway area that I think we would put the driveway on. We haven't done a site design, um, but we would put the driveway because it, it really opens up once you get past the some of the, the features that I, that I think was shown on the, the, the uh, city planning staff's map that they demonstrated. Um, talking to both the current sh sheriff and the former sheriff, they really want this facility to be on the I-69 corridor. And so when I, I, I just was discussing this with the sheriff-elect, I asked him why. He gave me two reasons that I thought were, were pretty insightful. One is when they're, and they're both, one is if we have a medical emergency, we need to be able, and we need to take somebody to Indianapolis or something like that, we need to have a really good access point so that we can get them there as quickly as possible. Um, he was referring to both inmates and staff. And the other one is, the Monroe Hospital is really close to this and they have an emergency department. Um, I think when IU Health moved uh, to the east side of town, we really lost that cl close connection with, with a kind of medical facility and so that's something I think we wanna get back. Um, this does have, uh, or will have once Fullerton Pike is completed and I would say, you know, I believe that's going to bed, uh, to bid this summer and they expected to have a two-year construction cycle, uh, so they expect it to be completed in 2025. Um, that this will have vehicle, vehicular traffic, and that road will be built with the uh, safe street, smart street, safe street designs, where there will be multi-use paths on both sides, and so that would end up hooking into both the uh, Beeline Trail and the Clear Creek Trail, so that it would have access granted it is further out from downtown. Um, and part of that has to do with the, the, the need to be able to be able to grow and to be, have a, a reasonable size site. Um, I think when we provided information to the plan commission, I don't know if you received that, but it included a, a letter from an engineering firm who builds jails on a, a regular basis that indicated to us that a 20 to 25 acre site was necessary. Um, we superimpose, we, the county um, went on a tour of the Hamilton County Jail uh, to kind of see, because they had just done some new constructions. With, they did an addition just to kind of see what, what kind of new features are there. And their facility held, I think, three, 300 or th three to 500, I, I don't remember, I think it was 300, but the option to add another 150, and their, total footprint was two and a half acres for that entire facility. I, I think when you, when you people talk about you know, the, the size we're looking at, I can tell you that's not been determined. Um, but I think that number, the 350 to 500, has come out. And I think that was when we were comparing the size of the footprint to that building with the with this site we're looking at. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at it because it was in the city limits, um, because Bloomington Transit's uh, potential availability, and we realized that the city police is one of the major users of the facilities. And so we think them having access within city limits is important. Uh, we were looking at other sites that were not in the city limits, and you know, you know all the transportation issues that I think we've all heard about um, are exasperated uh, if you get outside the city limits. Um, all the utilities are there, which was very important to us. And, and then a, kind of as a final, I'm not sure I can really with a straight face say this was a major reason why, why we did the decision, but it certainly fit with the decision, is that when we looked at the growth in the population in the county from the 2010 to 2020 uh, census, population growth in the county was in the western and in the south portions of the county. And so, you know, we think that that's probably going to be a continuing trend is that the, the population 
is is either going to is going to go in those two directions because that's where um, available land is. Um, that may be a, a poor assumption, but that's what we we thought about. So now I want to talk a little bit about the differences between ME versus MI uh, and what the relevant zoning difference is. Um, I, just for the both allow for government service facilities, right? So both of those zoning designations would allow us to put the courts there, to put uh, community corrections there, to put probation there, to put, you know, pretty much a lot of these other functions that if there is a determination to co-locate, I mean, this, this site could al already hold those. Um, and, I, and I went through and I, I say relevant because I think these are things that in one way or another causes some kind of uh, thought um, from the county perspective. Uh, single family residential, I, I don't think we think that is necessarily the best use for that property, uh, but it is allowed. Uh, brew pub, distillery, winery, and restaurant. I think we understand and we think there is a need for those kinds of items in that area, if not on the site. We're happy that a restaurant is a accessory use. Our planning department had a, a uh, meeting talking about the county's future and the county's plans. And one of the things I talked to the county, the county staff with was we really need to look at that area to get a much more consistent zoning with it because it's, it's not very consistent at this point. And that's an area that uh, I believe Commissioner Thomas at the Plan Commission indicated that that was something that the, the County Plan Commission should really look at and work on. Um, uh, retail sales, including uh, fuel stations allowed there. I think uh, the, the, the idea of a fuel station um, makes sense given some of the other things we've talked about. It's a major exchange on an interstate and, and things like that. Again, I'm not sure it's this site, but it's certainly in that quadrant uh, of that intersection that I think is something that I, ME includes light manufacturing and, and you know that's not anything we've got planned for. Um, and self-storage, MI allows for this as an accessory use. And I, I kind of put this in there because when we toured the uh, Hamilton County Jail, they had built, uh, and I think we, we would certainly consider doing this as well, they had built more of a shell for where you put cells than, than what, uh, what they were going to use at front first. And when we toured, they actually had stored an historic bridge in the half of the, uh, of the, of the jail block that hadn't been built out with cells. And so they were, they, they were using that for storage of, of those kind of things so they could put a historic bridge in there. So that kind of caught my attention. And so that's why I, I added that to this list. Um, now, what does MI allow that ME does not? Um, supportive housing is a conditional use. I think that is one of the things we want to look at utilizing on that, this property. Assisted living facility. A small opioid rehabilitation facility, they both allow for a large one. A hospital as a conditional use and a jail as a conditional use. Um, and I say that because these are uh, three things that, that we are exploring using this property for. Uh, mental health facility, uh, provide a non-jail detox center, and supportive slash transitional housing, which, which I think those items fall much more in line with, with the MI designation. Again, I, I think there are some things there that fall much more in line with the, some of our accessory uses that fall much more in line with ME, but I, I think the core of what we're looking at are all clearly designated as something that should be in an MI zone. So the comprehensive plan. Um, I looked at the comprehensive plan and I found the, the vision statement, and this is from the, the City Council's resolution 2013-01, and it's restated in the, in the comprehensive plan, I think page 11 or so. And these are the three things that I found the most relevant in the vision. Deliver efficient, responsive, and forward-thinking governmental service. I believe that it has been described to me, and I believe it was described to me 
by the Indiana Civil Liberties Union is that our jail is the least efficient one um, that exists that may have been one of the uh, building inspectors, um, but I do not believe that notion would be uh, would not be supported by the ICLU, that it is a very inefficient building. It's not responsive, and it's certainly not forward thinking at this point, right? Uh, meet the need, basic needs and ensure self-sufficiency of all, for all residents, you know? I think when you look at mental health facility, provide non-jail detox center, supportive transitional housing, and those kind of concepts, I think that falls right in line with this. I think, you, I think you can make a pretty good argument that if we had the correctional center that Commissioner Jones has spoke about to, at the beginning of this, I think you could even include the jail into having a area that meets basic needs and ensures self-sufficiency of all residents. And then I think fortifying our process, progress towards improving public safety and civility, I think that one goes without really a whole lot of necessary explanation. And then this map is what is currently zoned MI within the city limits. Um, as you can see, Indiana University is heavily representative, uh, the city of Bloomington and their parks and other items is heavily representative, and churches and cemeteries. There really isn't a vacant space that is zoned MI that is along a road. I, I think you could make an argument that the two on the far right by the railroad tracks are vacant, uh, but they are certainly wouldn't satisfy the conditional use requirements found in the comprehensive plan for being on a, a arterial or connector roadway. Um, so there is no current zoned area within the city of Bloomington that meets, that, that is an MI zone that meets the requirements we would need for a, for a jail facility. And finally, um, the plan commission struggled with, with the nature of the comprehensive plan. So I've, I, I've put a couple of, uh, and I'll read the quotes from the, the cases. Uh, a comprehensive plan is a community long range vision for the physical development, but implementing the plan as regards a given piece of real estate may not be the best course of action for the community on a given day. A comprehensive plan is a guide to community development rather than an instrument of land use control. And that is from the Indiana Supreme Court in 2005. And then the final one is a comprehensive plan pertaining to a parcel is one of several factors that a plan commission and of course the city council may subsequently consider should it decide at a later, later time to alter the zoning application to a parcel. So I guess that's my way of saying I get that this is not light industrial. I get the, you know, it's not an office space that I can tell you we're going to have office space there. But I think given the, the explanation as to why we chose this property and why we think this property is unique within the county, um, I think that, that this gives you the ability and I, I think it gives you the obligation to consider it and uh, if you agree uh, with what we've said, then I think you should, should approve this. Um, you guys have anything? So I'm more than happy to answer questions or however you want to go forward. Thank you very much to all who have made the initial presentations. We now will come to council to ask questions of either city planning or the county. Council Member Vollen. Thank you, Madam President. I have a, a great number of questions. I'm going to try to boil them down as much as I can. Uh, first question is, if the potential population needing incarceration is growing, how many square feet does the county think it needs for actual incarceration proper, more or less than the jail has now? And specifically, I understand that it is the expressed desire of the county to have all the cells on the f ground floor only and not stacked. So how many square feet does the county think that they need for cells on the ground floor? 
want to make one one minor correction to that. Okay. Um, typically, if when you go to jails, there's a base level where there's a, a jail cell on the bottom. There's a jail a second floor of jail cells, but they, but there's an immediate ramp down, so it shares the same common areas on the first floor, but actually the the cells are stacked in in the in the back area. So. Does that make sense? Or? Well, I mean, I guess I should maybe start by asking the question, uh, is it the express desire of the county to build a jail that does not have cells on more than one floor, let alone on the ground floor? I think the, I, I think the, I think the question that you're answering, the, the answer is yes, with the technical thought that, and, and again, if, if, if you need to, if you don't understand what I'm saying, please go visit our, sale, our, our, our current jail, because I think that we have a, Row of, a row of jail cells, a row of jail cells, a little walkway, and then stairs down, right? I think that is that, that it, but we have that on two different, what I would consider two different floors. So we'd have one set of those here and one set of those there. We'd only want the ones, one set. So that, okay, but even so, yeah, you have two floors of jail, even though there may be two subfloors within each floor. And you want to go down to one yes. floor with two subfloors. Yes. You still so again, how many what's the footprint of the actual cells that you want ground floor only? Is it more or less that you have fifty it is, it is more than one one acre. It would be greater than what we currently have as a one floor. It would probably be about equivalent um, maybe a little bit more when you include programming space and, and those kinds okay. of things. Okay, yeah, I'm not talking about programming space. I see 27,000 square feet is the footprint of the Zitlow Center now, and there's two levels of it. Mm -hmm. that, so it's 54,000 square feet that you have now for cells, and an acre is 65,000 square feet. Uh, you're saying you need to increase it by about 10,000, 15,000 square feet, is that? I'm, I'm, for just incarcerating people. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I'm slowly trying to work out your, the math. Okay. So I, if, you, if our current jail is one acre, the footprint of our current Zitlow building is approximately one acre, it would be larger than that. I suspect that if you were going to do the same number of cells, that you would be looking at closer to an acre and a half, so you would have less footprint than you do now, but it would be spread over a larger area. Instead of stacking them, does it, you know. By, by footprint, I mean the, I don't mean the square footage per level, I mean the footprint of the building. Mm -hmm. That's how I did my math. I just traced it on Google Maps. It's yeah. 27, 28,000 square feet. That's the footprint of the building. Okay. And then you've got cells on multiple levels. And I mean, what I'm hearing you saying is that you want to put the cells yes. all on the ground floor. And so, mm -hmm. spread, so that would be about 54,000 square feet. I, and I, an I, acre is 65,000. So that's, that's it, I, if, if your calculations are that there's 27,000 square feet on a floor, then I would say that 54,000 would probably be a little bit larger than what I would expect. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm mistaken. There's 43,560 square feet in an acre. Mm -hmm. So you have more than an acre now. Okay. I'll, I'm going to have other questions. I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rosenberger. Thank you. I have a question about the the uses for ME versus MI, I think this is for Ms. Scanlon. Um, I, I just thought that um, the two presentations did not really match up with what was allowed in one versus the other. So if you could just clarify that for us. Sure, so of the, I, I, maybe Mr. Cockrell can maybe clarify, but some of the uses that he listed, um, I think, you know, trying to make the point that, that the, that the potentially making the point that the districts aren't that different, um, weren't correct. So single family is not allowed in MI. I mean, MI is institutional. So most of our MI is government, uh, government use property off it, you know, like uh, Indian University, um, other things, uh, uh, MCCSC properties. 
So no, single family is not allowed in MI. The brew pub example, not allowed in MI. Fuel station example, not allowed in MI. Light manufacturing, also not allowed. Everything listed under the retail sales uses. Um, so all of our typical retail, none of that's allowed. And so that, that was a point that we had made in the staff report as well, because the comprehensive plan does talk about retail uses. Um, so I don't know if I just misunderstood what he was saying, but no, none of those specific uses that he listed are, would be allowed here. Um, if, if it were to be rezoned to MI, the self storage, I think was accessory. I do think he mentioned that, uh, that's accurate. Um, uh, but the other uses are not, uh, office is allowed here. So yes, if they wanted it to just be offices, then they wouldn't need the rezone. The rezone is needed because of, uh, uh, needing the uh, jail or detention facility use, which is conditional, um, in the MI. Well, and, and, and that I, I apologize because if you look at, look at the page, that she is, I, I, I did not add the word not. ME and oh, MI yeah. does not allow for it. I, I think when I verbally said it, I said not, uh, but I apologize for that. Uh, that was a mistake on my part, and I apologize. So does that clarify Yes, question? that clears it up. Thank you, too. Yeah. Additional questions? Councilmember Boland. Yes. Um, uh, did the county intend to subdivide and sell some number of parcels of land to any private developers to build housing or restaurants at some point at this parcel? I do not believe that that is currently being contemplated. I think the current contemplation are the, the new uh, correctional facility, the ability to expand that new correctional facility in the future um, I think there is an ongoing conversation within the county about whether you co-locate other uses such as the courts, the probation, prosecutor, you know, all the justice related things. But no, I don't think that there is any thought right now of subdividing dividing it for those purposes. Okay, thank you. But now you just said something else that interests me because I thought that that was the plan, that the whole justice system would eventually relocate to this new area of town. Is that not correct? Because that's the impression that the judges and the prosecutors and the public defenders all have. Well, and I, and I think the, when, when they did their survey, I think they really, when the Bar Association with the, uh, and the legal system filled out a survey, and I think you guys have had a copy, I think you, if not, I think you have a copy of our Community Justice Reform Committee's webpage, and it's on there. But one of the loud and clear messages was that co-location they thought was going to be extremely important. Um, we need to go through a master planning phase. We need to see what that looks like, you know. But I think that certainly is the direction it sounds like uh, people want to go. The direction where everybody wants to co-locate at Fullerton Pike, or that they just want to be Every, co-located. The co-location is is the preference, and that's what we, that was discussed in that uh, survey. Okay, but not necessarily co-location at Fullerton Pike, just they want to be co-located. Are you saying that all these other entities prefer the Fullerton Pike site to the current location of justice? I, I, don't, I, can't think, I don't think that's true. I don't think I could say that. Okay. Um, I do think that the current site isn't realistic. It's a, it's, it's from 2020 report estimated to cost 56 million uh, to renovate with all kinds of, if you need more space for this, you need more space for that, you need more space for this. If you look at the survey, they talk about things, they, more space needs that they would want in, in the, any kind of correctional facility. And I, I don't know how you squeeze that out of that building. I don't know why you would want to squeeze it out when it's in the physical condition it is, and it is so it is not so efficiently designed as it needs to be. I have more, but I'll defer to other members. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Let's start with uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes. Um, have you considered other locations for the new jail, and why did you rule them out? For example, the property south of Catalan off of Rogers Street. Well, I think we ruled out Catalan, the property south of Catalan, um, really, f 
if, if you guys need, need me to step in, really four or five years ago when we were discussing with uh, Habitat for Humanity about uh, housing projects there, and actually we, we through our year of the city plan, planning department, we actually carved off a few acres to get them that early. Um, so that was kind of ruled out then, and then, uh, as you all know, Catalan came in and said, hey, we're going to put this huge investment in this community. And, you know, they were asking the, the, the city for a, a lot of things. They were asking us for the ability to, to purchase that property in the future. And so the commissioners last March uh, put together a resolution that said, hey, we'll, we'll hold that property for two years. Um, and as long as you're, you're meeting your investment goals, it, it will hold it for two years. If you want to buy it from us, then we'll do the appraisals and, and, and we'll, we'll work through the, through the code section in order to allow that. Um, I think even more recently, I think even this fall, I think I, I know I had a conversation with uh, city staff about the potential of using that for a residential TIF. And again, I, I, that, all those uses make sense to me, more sense. I mean, the, the, the city's investment in Switchyard Park um, isn't really augmented by, by this use there. I think that there's also, honestly, vehicular ac access issues. I, you know, I, I think we'd really need to look at the, uh, the only roadway that would allow for, to meet the arterial or collector road that you could utilize is, is Rogers Street. And Rogers Street, um, where the, the, our, that property is kind of has like a little 120 foot wide stretch that goes from Rogers Street to where, to where it opens up, and that's also uh, where the Duke Utility easement is. And then you know, I haven't walked that in a few months, but I know when we walked it with the uh, city <coughs> park staff because we were talking about putting the trail in along there. You know, we were struggling, and I think they, they were struggling working with Duke to try to figure out how to get a walking path through there that, doesn't, that didn't interrupt and didn't cause safety issues. And so if you, if you took that out, then you're looking at um, probably Adam Street, the connection to Adam Street, which is in the PUD that we would have to do if we built there. Um, but Adam Street, we could build the, the, the nicest road in the world, but Adam Street on either side off that site is not, is not really, in my mind, designed for truck usage where you need food delivered and you need all those kind of things. So I think there are potential access issues. I think we've, as a county, and I think, and I think with some input, at least from the city, has indicated that you know, the use of that for commercial or residential uses is, is a higher priority. Um. How many acres does the county own at that location? It's similar, um, 80 to 90 in that neighborhood. And all of that 80 or 90 acres has been set aside in case Catalan needs it for two years? Well, not all that 80 or 90 is buildable. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, old quarry pits and things like that in it. Um, I think there's about 50 of it is buildable. And at this point, the, the resolution that the commissioners approved um, was that they would hold the entire property for that, for that use. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Um, I had some follow-ups on some items that were shared in the presentation. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for the presentation. Um, what, what were the preliminary, what are preliminary cost estimates uh, of building a new, a new jail facility at the proposed site? Is, where does that come in, roughly? Well, we haven't gotten, uh, we, we're, we're in the process. We've gotten RFQs back from three different uh, developers. We're going through the interview process to do, uh, developers, not develop, the designers, um, mm -hmm. to, going through the, the process to determine the master planning. Um, when I last checked, and this was pre-COVID, I think we were looking at a 300 to 350 uh, bed jail with the sheriff's department moved with it, and it, it was between 40 and $50 million at that time. Now, okay. I, don't ex I, I, I don't expect that number to be the same today. That was long enough ago, and I think right now, 
a year ago is long enough to, ago that you, that you would not expect that to necessarily be a correct number. I saw figures of 60 to 70 million and in, in some other materials from related stakeholders. Do you know where that's coming from or is that? I, you know, I don't think that's a terrible guess at this point. Okay. Um, and I guess what, what I'm getting at, I have a handful of cost questions uh, related. Uh, and what, I, what I'm getting at is uh, part of our consideration here is, is uh, the suitability of this location, which necessarily involves the question of alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, so thinking about alternatives. And um, you, you quoted uh, the, the Ken Ray uh, report in your, your presentation about remediation of the current facility um, uh, seeming cost prohibitive, quote, at a provisional estimated cost exceeding $56 million. Um, and well, first of all, it's interesting because 56 million is less than 60 to 70 million. Um, but also, uh, so cost prohibitive might not be the, the operative word. Also, it said a provisional estimated cost. Um, and I looked at the appendix, pages 211 to 218, all 53 recommendations are, are sort of priced out with the low mm -hmm. and high range. Mm -hmm. And the sum of the high end range of all 53 of those estimates is 56 million. The low is actually 22 million. And the middle um, would be right at about 39 million. So I wanted to know. Uh, what provisional estimated cost meant. Is there more detail than that appendix and those cost estimates, um, that level of, of detail? Because it's sort of been um, stated as a, a, a foregone conclusion or given assumption that it's cost prohibitive or that you know this isn't possible. But some of the information that's been shared, including the letter from the commissioners today, didn't address that range of costs, for instance. Go for it. I believe Commissioner Thomas would like to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm not sure why that question is germane to our request, but I'm happy to entertain after. it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the thing is, those numbers were compiled in 2019. <laughs> so those are really going to be much farther off than anything else that we've looked at in terms of costs. That f the current facility has issues with flooding, which entails uh, sewage leaking into the judge's offices. Uh, it has uh, a number of um, issues relating to structure, which would require, in essence, if we were to rebuild the current jail, we'd have to find a way to add another floor because we want program space that we don't have now. Um, and so if we were to somehow magically rebuild what's there and find a way to add space for programming, and we have nothing, we haven't even talked about treatment yet, we want to add treatment. If we were able to do if, 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 we would have to house our inmates somewhere else for quite a few years. Um, that's a really pretty horrible proposition. Uh, for um, our staff, for the inmates, and uh, for county taxpayers. So it's a lose-lose-lose proposition on that front. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a matter of, and, and believe me, I was the last of the three of the Board of Commissioners to say we need a new jail. I kept saying, well, can't we fix this? Can't we remodel this? We really can't, um, and I do invite any of you who haven't visited the jail um, to please go and see it because you're not working with a lot there that can be fixed and remediated to provide space for treatment, which is really what we want to focus on. Um, and a, an important thing to remember is that this is a lot of spinning plates within county government because there are the judges, the prosecutor, the public defender, the probation services, the jail staff, which answers to the sheriff, and law enforcement throughout the county, which includes BPD, the sheriff's department, IUPD, state police, town of Ellisville, et cetera. And then there's us, commissioners and counsel. We don't control the process of judicial purview. We do not control how long it takes a case to get through the system. They are working on that on their side. We can't control that. We can only do two things here. We can figure out what size building we need to allow for the correct programming, to allow to focus on treatment and prevention and to reduce recidivism. 
And we are in charge of, with the council, of putting together the planning, the budget, paying for and constructing the facility. That's our only job. So if you have questions about process, we really can't address it. So I just want to point that out. Thanks. Could I follow up? Sure. Thank you. Um, so my question is germane to the issue because, as I stated when I asked my question, um, there are a lot of negatives or cons associated with the proposed site. It may well be justified. Uh, this council may find it justified if there aren't suitable alternatives, but that's the type of discussion and exercise we are engaged in. That's why Councilmember Piedmont Smith's question was germane as well about alternative sites and why they were considered. So in considering alternatives, I'm wanting to make sure I have a complete understanding of the information presented in the Ken Ray report and presented in this presentation to the council earlier this evening about the cost prohibitiveness of rehabilitation. I don't, I don't doubt there are many issues with the current jail site. The discussion was around costs of remediation. Um, and what I mentioned was pages 211 to 218 has a matrix of all 53 recommendations, estimates low and high end of what those would be. The range is 22 to 56 million. Is there more information that I'm missing or is that an accurate portrayal of the potential estimated, provisional estimated range of remediation of all the identified issues? It's certainly not all the economic issues. That is certainly not an accurate picture at all of all the economic issues. If you tour a, if a facility like the one we discussed, one level, a main floor, that I, with your... Okay, go ahead. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm just trying to clarify, I guess, what, um, what information is missing from the report? Well, that, okay. I, I got you. Uh, what, that, what that report doesn't include is operational costs. If you toured these other facilities, their op, their, their, the amount of staff they have is for larger facilities is at least half or less than half of what we have to have to competently maintain it in the conditions as I spoke earlier. So you're talking about a, I, I want to say it's north of $4 million personnel budget. I don't know that for sure. I don't address the county council, I, I don't know. But it is an excessive number of the, of the staffing costs for our current facility. The, the goal is to use those staffing costs and the reductions we have in operational costs, money that we get year in and year out, to put it towards programming and these other functions we have so we can afford to run these other things we have. So, you know, the, the cost of construction, you know, is one factor. All right, and I, and, I, and I think, to be absolutely honest, I don't know if even the, the 22 to 56 is all that accurate because I don't know if you can structurally build additional space on top of the jail. I don't know that, that answer. I know when it was built, it was built that you could, but I have heard from other sources that I can't confirm, but they, they worked in the facility that they had talked to experts when something went wrong that said maybe you can't. Um, we would have to do that kind of review if we wanted to do that. Um, but the operational costs are much, are much different when you're talking about the two different styles of jail. That's why when we say inefficient, that's, what, that's one of the things we're talking about. Thank you. I, mm -hmm. I do have follow-ups to wrap up that line of questioning, but if it's more appropriate to defer to another member, I would do that. Go ahead. Um, so you mentioned that more, more assessment would be needed to make those types of determinations. Is that fair to say that the provisional, estimate, provisional assessment that's been done isn't adequate to answer those questions and that a deeper assessment would be needed. Related question, are members of the Community Justice Response Committee recommending or asking for that at this point in time? Have members? I, I, I am not aware. Did anybody from CJSC asking for that study? Did Ms. Crossland, did she know? Um, if, there ha if there is, and we think there might be, um, I think we, th I read the B Square Beacon, um, and so I think there is one member who, who is looking for a, a full report on that, uh, but that, w that request would have just been made a week or two ago, um, and I think when we discussed it in this, as we were moving forward, I think the, the discussion with, with the county commissioners and county council, we had, we had discussed whether looking at renovating this facility was something we wanted to do and in the spring summer the answer was no thank you 
Thank you. Council Member Scambalori. Yes, thank you. I'd like to um, follow up on Council Member Piedmont Smith's question regarding uh, other properties that were under consideration. We spoke about the site located near Catalan, um, but what about other properties out, uh, outside of city limits, in particular the ones I'm interested in? Uh, where are they and why were they rejected? Is it just about transit? Is there more to it than that? Well, both of them. One is further south on uh, basically where Old 37 is in that area. What are 37, Old 37? I think it's 37 and Old 37. Just I-69 has got my southern part of the county messed up a little bit. But it's, it's on Old 37 south, and uh, we looked at that one. That one uh, would have we would have had to deal with uh, sanitation sewers, um, and uh, and so it didn't have access to all the utilities. I think it would have. I think it would have been. F I, I think the the, the basic answer is transit was certainly a factor when we made the decision for this one. It certainly was a factor. Uh, that one had uh, utility issues. I think it had the proper sizing. Um, but it, it didn't have as good a vehicle act, vehicular access. You know that Fullerton Pike, a roundabout right at the at the, the corner, um, the closest to Monroe Hospital were all were additional factors, and so that one was not as as good from from that perspective. I think uh, some of the other perspectives, it, it was it was big enough. It had kind of the natural wooded area. I mean, there we would have. At the time, we don't know if it would, if it's contiguous building area or if there were other issues with ravines or anything like that. We never got that far, right, because of these other issues. Um, another one we looked at was um, off Vernal, uh, close to Curry. Uh, that site was, again, large enough. Uh, the, the biggest problem with that one when we talked about it is that the seller wasn't interested, right? We, we looked at properties that sellers were interested, they weren't interested. We looked at um, the, the property we drew off by Packing House Road, that's right by where the state police, that eventually got sold to somebody else, and so we kind of lost that opportunity, although we had some access issues there because there's steep hills. Um, we looked at a lot of different sites, and so a lot of them were outside the city limits. In fact, I, most of them were, to be honest with you. And, and this one came, came back. And, and, and I think I don't want to downplay that Bloomington Transit and having access to that wasn't a major factor in that, but it certainly wasn't the only factor. Thank you. I'm going to hang on to my other questions okay. for now. Thank you. Um, let's see. Council Member Rosenberger, did you have another question? I have another question question. Um, it is about transit. Um, Commissioner Thomas asked the question, what are you going to do about transit as in the city? And um, from my past experience here on the council, when, when the city is working with a potential employer or a major housing developer where there's going to be a heavy stress on the system, on infrastructure. A lot of times the city will ask that developer to run, to fund a bus line so that people have access to that space. So I guess my question is, what are you going to do about transit? Um, I, as far as I know, BT has no plans to put, to put transit here and um, I don't think this can be located in a space where people can't get there with, yeah. with public transit. C can I respond to that? Yes. Uh, and and I, I didn't send it till yesterday, so I so I realized you you guys have had a big night. I've, I've been in this meeting, so I know you've had a lot going on. Uh, but I, I asked for a letter from the transit people indicating, um, and it indicates that they're willing. If 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 this is a site that's chosen, they're willing to go through their process to look at it. Um, they're not committing to anything at this point, and you know, you know, we have decisions to make before they have reasons to commit. Um, you know, the, the utilizing this site purely as a jail has a lot different implications than if we co-locate all at once and and you know all the all the staff from downtown move out. There's just different needs and different 
thoughts there. Uh, we had a really nice conversation with them. They talked about a potential park and ride um, at this location where people could drive in, park there from out of town, and then utilize it. And I thought that was an interesting way to maybe help uh, get more traffic and get more, you know, make it a lot easier for transit to utilize the space. So I think they're committed to working with us, they're committing to looking at it. Um, rightfully so, they, they wanted to make sure that if I ever brought their name up in any of these, they do not want anything I say to be construed as them either approving or not approving this item, right? They don't want to get involved in the rezone, and I, I respect that, and I want to make sure you guys understand that. But they indicated that they would work with us, and that if the density of use is such that they are willing to serve it, they are willing to serve it. Um, my response to, the, to what you said is, you know, I think that we are going to be responsible for transit, uh, particularly if we don't collate all at once for the bulk of it anyway. And, you know, part of it's utilizing the operational savings that we are going to have from the new facility and having to run it and just being able to keep more staff on, having a bus and allowing them to do some of those transportation work. Um, I think that's going to be a, kind of the short-term answer, and I think the longer-term answer is going to be look, working with Bloomington Transit to try to figure out how to get that utilized. You know, I would say I had our jail staff run these numbers before this meeting. Um, uh, this, uh, in the last year, approximately, if you look between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m., that's when the bulk of the people are released from our facility, right? And I think that's also, and I, and I think that's also the time when most people will want to go to the facility, right? That's when you're going to get your back and forth. After that, you're averaging about one a day between with all the rest of the hours. So I think. Even long term, I think maybe maybe the county's just going to have to commit to utilize kind of some of our resources to handle those times when we don't expect enough traffic to be there to make it worthwhile for Bloomington Transit to utilize. And if I could just provide a point of information, the letter that we, was in our addendum packet that was to you from John Connell says the identified existing attributes that make the site attractive for the new jail site are attributes that discourage public transportation, citing, you know, isolated, mm -hmm. low population mm -hmm. density. However, with that said, if a new county corrections campus was constructed, creating conditions favorable to public transit for employees and others needing uh, service to the facility, BT would conduct a feasibility study to determine the viability of providing the new service. And that's how we understand that BT operates. You know, it's got to make sense for a bus route to go where there is, there is, there is transit and transportation. I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, I did not know we're allowed to, council members are allowed to answer other council member questions. Well, this was a point of information that this was received in our addendum that, that explains the whole I, issue with BT and difficulty in providing transit out there. It was in, it was in I still didn't know that that was an addendum. I don't, I don't think that's okay. So, so you're saying that one person a day gets released between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m.? On average. I'm not saying that's an everyday thing. I mean, some well, on nights average, just one average. person a day that would not have any way potentially to get. Well, I, I, I don't know if that's that's the case, right? I and mean, you know, the the, the follow-up is, well, why are people released at that time in in such low numbers? Um, my hypothetical, which you know, I'm, I'm I don't have a in stone answer for my hypothetical is that those are the people who have bonded out and therefore maybe have people coming to pick them up and, and doing those things. I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that, but I would think that that's probably more likely than not. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sims. Um, and if not bonded out, maybe it's released on their own recognizance, which is a totally different thing, and nobody may not be picking them up. So I would, uh, in this discussion, that, that's an assumption I don't particularly want to deal with. Um, but I also think that brings us to this question. Um, what do we do with people that are released? If we were to have that Fullerton Pike facility and people were released, even if that's that one person and there's nobody coming, what do we do? Just l release them? Or have we thought that far ahead? And I don't mean I, to put you on the spot, but. 
uh, and I think we have, and maybe okay. Commissioner Thomas wants to answer. Yeah, yeah, you know, so here we are in this position, right? So we've, we've got this piece of property that we're looking at. We have a purchase order on the table with this one uh, parcel owner. We've done everything that we can do to this moment to prepare and to think through everything that you're asking us about, including transportation, transit. We had a conversation with transit when it was still warm outside, so it's been a while, um, and, um, and had a really constructive conversation with them. That was great. Uh, we know that if we don't have Bloomington Transit, whether because this property gets a no vote or we go somewhere else or whatever happens, we will have to figure it out and we know how to do that and we know we might have to do that. But to spend money on a study or to get um, final plans done or to commit to spending money, we can't do that because we don't know that this is the property and we don't know that this is what's going to happen. So I feel like we've gone as far as we can in terms of looking at the issue and I wish we had answers, but to get those answers would require an investment of taxpayer dollars on something that might not happen based on your vote today. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm not trying to dodge questions. I'm just trying to no. tell you where we're at. No, yeah, no, I, I understand that. Um, but I will say um, there was a little pushback. Um, what are you gonna do about transportation? And other folks are asking you, what are you doing about transportation? And then there's a, the, the response, what are you going to do? And then it goes back, what are you going to do? What I'm saying is in the future, when Jim Sims is involved, this at-large council member, I want to hear what are we going to do? I think that's more fruitful and productive to start a conversation. Um, but I, I, here's my question before I get chastised. <laughs> um, from a public engagement or, or a key stakeholder engagement approach that's been talked about this, what has, or maybe you can talk to us about the Board of Judges and the Public Defenders and the Prosecutor's Office, um, maybe even a county clerk that's housed in the Zitlow building. What are, what is your feeling about them or their feelings about the Fullerton Pike location? Have they, they have been involved in these conversations, and I'm assuming. Well, <clears throat> when I read through their comments, I felt that an awful lot of assumptions were made that they didn't actually look at what could, what the possibilities would be for solving some of the problems that they were concerned about. And in many, many cases, the problems... Um, kind of cons concern them very personally rather than being some a look at the overall justice system. And what we are attempting to do is actually reform our entire justice system. The jail is a very small part of that. And in the process of working through a number of problems beside the, besides the jail, many of those things will get addressed. Okay, but, but I guess what I ask is, what do, were their feelings? I mean, I know you said some of it, you, they made assumptions and all that, but what did that boil down to? Are they supportive of the Fullerton Pike location at this point or not? Um, it, well, there was some variation. Um, as a whole, no, they were not supportive of the Fullerton Pike okay, that's... Um, site. But as I said, I don't think they fully understood everything that could be done to make it a viable uh, proposition for them. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Scambolori. Can you share a specific example of, of an assumption they made? Or I, I, I guess you're speaking in the abstract and I would understand better 
if you would share an example of what you mean when you say they don't um, quite understand. I, I cannot come up with a specific thing that anyone said, but in general, what they were talking about was the inconvenience of it, um, and that there were a lot of unknowns, that they felt that, that there were problems that could occur that haven't yet been addressed, but for example, really, uh, well, mostly just most of what they were concerned about, as far as I could tell, was the fact that initially there cannot be co-location, or probably not. Um, it'll probably have to be two different phases, and they are concerned about the time it could take them to travel from their offices downtown to Fullerton Pike when they need to interact with the jail. At the same time, they asked for a number of facilities that could not be provided in the current jail. And among those were a couple of video conferencing rooms which could be used. Um, I think they were a little surprised when they asked how many people use video conferencing to discover that actually a large portion of them did. So there are, there are uncertainties over change. And I don't think these surveys are more designed to allow us to hear what people's concerns are so that we can attempt to address those concerns. Thank you. All right, if there are no other council questions, well, I'll see a hand from Council Member Boland, but we want to get to public comment soon, yeah, so. We'll one around and then ask sure. more after public comment. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, this question is actually for Jackie Scanlon, if she's still on. Hi there. Um, Hi. One of the things that Councilmember Smith and I talked about when looking at the site was, was there a possibility for a new town square to be built out there? 200 years ago, the county created Bloomington as its seat and built the courthouse square, platted it so that there would be commerce around the government function. Um, but the ME zoning doesn't allow a jail, and the MI zoning doesn't allow most everything else. So one question we had was, could we amend the ME zoning to allow a jail? Unlike a hospital, it's unlikely that there's going to be a competing jail built. I don't think anyone else is allowed to build a jail, and the county should have no interest in building more than one. So uh, would there be any objection from the planning department if the zoning stayed ME, but we changed it to allow a jail? Well, I can answer that as a process question. I don't think I can answer that as a policy question. So process-wise, yes, the council could uh, pass a resolution to um, direct the Planning and Transportation Department to prepare a text amendment to uh, uh, to whatever you want us to do. So uh, to, if you wanted us to add the use jail or detention facility to ME, you could request that we that we do that. So if we were to turn down this, this uh, rezone, but then file an amendment to uh, change the ME zoning to allow a jail, that would take a couple, three months maybe? Yes, so uh, Mr. Smith, as the representative on plan commission did uh, ask that of uh, Director Robinson uh, after the first appearance by the county at, at plan commission. Uh, and um, yes, the issue with doing that would be the ex the extension of time. So, so then I think, yeah, okay. uh, yeah so yes. Okay. Um, do the commissioners or the county in general have uh, an opinion of this idea? I, I think it's a great concept, I, but I do think we, much like what you heard in your previous, uh, our, our deadline uh, for our purchase agreements at the end of this year, um, I think we could probably extend it a little bit, um, but I don't know if we could extend it three months. Um, I think that maybe a, an alternative solution for you is if you approve this and then uh, change the ME zoning, then we would be more than happy to probably, uh, I guess the, the, the other, the, 
I don't think we want purely either, I guess is my, my, my question. It's kind of like I, why I went through the MI versus ME. You know, I think we would want a supportive housing. We would want some a, a mental a, a hospital, maybe mental hospital. Maybe it's working with, with uh, your planning staff to say, hey, what would you categorize these uses as? And making sure that whatever zone we get it in allows for those uses and we come up with a plan on how to do that based upon that kind of conversation. With all due respect though, you are, you, the, the justice complex as it is, is already in a zone that allows for all of the above. I mean, uh, has the county considered building in place? I mean, the county owns a number of facilities. Let's take the probation, or no, the public defender's office. That's uh, with the plaza in front of it, that building facing Morton Street is 8,000 square feet. Uh, the county could build up on it, move a bunch of offices into it. There's, I mean, other locations I can cite, and I'm planning to de to demonstrate it. Uh, uh, this, the north side of this building is owned by the county. Why could it not be converted to a jail use while the uh, east side of that square block where the Zitlow Center is now be torn down and redeveloped? I mean, did the county seriously consider building in place with land that it already owns? The, the answer is, I don't think we considered that. I think that, uh, and, and, and I, you'll have to give me a second, I, I, I don't know how I could answer, can we turn the north part of Showers into a, a correctional facility? I, I, you know, to, to me, to me, I, build it twice is what I'm hearing, and I don't, I don't know how that is practical. It's a, it's, a, it's a suggestion for the logistical challenge of building in a dense mixed-use downtown, which the county should be very proud of having pioneered over the past two centuries. So all I'm saying is that um, not only is there 33,000 square feet of footprint that could be used as ground floor for cells. The parking lot in front of that is 30,000 square feet owned by the county that could be built on. Uh, that's 63,000 square feet right there. That's the amount of square footage that you all said, about an acre and a half that you said you needed uh, to, to accommodate all the cells that you need. Uh, I mean, I know it's sort of a out of left field, but I mean, if you like that idea, I've got plenty more where that came well, from. I, 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 did, did, I, I really don't like that. <laughs> okay. I, I think I've, I've been answered. Thank you. I'll, I'll save other questions for after public comment. Council Member Smith, and then we do need to go to public comment. We can come back for other questions afterwards. Uh, in my role as uh, on the plan commission and discussions with Mr. Cockrell and, and, uh, and city staff, um, it, it appeared that the zone change allows the project to begin and a lot of these preliminary things and then um, when we consider uh, UDO changes um, evidently it's generally done in early spring that we can look at the things that will help the project to continue on and to develop as we all are thinking of all these good things in this progressive way and treatment and all that. So that's kind of, I just wanted to say that out loud because that, it seems like we got all over the place, but that's kind of what it seemed like to me that that was the point of this zone changes and because we couldn't do those other things that I clarified with city staff and a city attorney, it, it appears that, that that this is the path forward for them to begin this if the council so uh, agrees that this is a, a good path forward. And that's, I guess, the question still. But I just wanted to say that to kind of like give a context for what I understood as a plan commission representative for, for the council. So anyway, thanks. Thank you. At this point, let us turn to public comment and we will ask people if there are uh, participants uh, attending by Zoom, um, if you can make that announcement and anyone wishing to make a comment, please line up at the podium over here. You are 
Zoom and you wish to make a public comment, you will need to raise your hand using the reactions tab or the more tab. Um, if you cannot find that, please send a message to the meeting host and we can help. So far, there are four hands raised on Zoom. Okay, four on Zoom. And we have a number here in chambers. So let us begin here at our podium. If you would sign in, please, and state your name. We'll have five minutes. My name's Mike Carmen. This is kind of awkward for me because I have my own thoughts and comments of a few things I want to say, not many. But also, I'm the attorney for Bill Brown, who's the property owner, would be the seller of the property to the county if this would get approved. And so I can't divorce my, my comments, can't really be divorced from him as the property owner. We have common interest there. So I'm kind of dual-hatted in that sense. So that anything that you, you like, attribute to Bill. Anything you don't like, blame me. Uh, so just a few comments, kind of scattergun on this one. Because uh, this is the county's petition. It's not Bill's petition. It's theirs. Uh, you know, my, my crystal ball is, is not sharp enough to predict what's going to happen, and there's a lot of there's a lot of crystal ball geezing going on here tonight about trying to write and draft the site plan for the county and what it needs to look like and what what its limitation is going to be. And that, well, you would engage in that on other zoning petitions. We uh, every developer contract contractor de client developer I've ever represented has that same complaint. Same complaint uh, Commissioner Th Thomas was just making. The cost we spend up front because we, to find out we're not going to get approval for a project can be horrendous, and it has been from time to time, and they're kind of experiencing the, that limitation now, too. It's, it's a frustrating issue, but more domain points. If you don't allow, do the, re the rezoning, what's that mean for the property? Uh, that's from Bill's standpoint. That's the, he's owned it for 37 years. The last 35 years of it has been a PCD. That PCD allowed employment uses. In fact, the primary core uses on that list of, pre of approved uses within the PUD were manufactured and processing uses. Uh, that under the city zoning ordinance at the time, those were the categories. It's much different now under the UDO. But those were the employment uses for the most part, excluding the heavy industrial uses. Uh, and so we've had 35 years of experience of this being zoned for employment purposes, and it's not developed. And there are a number of reasons for that, but, uh, but uh, this placement of ME on this is not a new venture, it's not a new experiment, it's a continuation of 35 years of having a zone that would hopefully attract and induce what we would consider a higher employer, a higher number employer. There, there are problems with doing that. On Jackie's slide, she listed several concerns. Not a one of those concerns is be, will happen because it gets rezoned to MI, because they exist now. They exist under the ME zoning. There's not a one of those that are being uh, become a concern because of rezoning. They're a concern to the property as it is with the ME zone on it that you put on it with the last zoning. The ME zoning on there, you did. Bill didn't ask for it. It was the PUD. The, the city forced that on there as part of getting rid of what, whatever, 92 or 99 of the 119 PUDs you had uh, on, on the zoning books. It was one of those. Bill even tried to get that zoning changed to MC. You, you denied that, that. You may not even remember doing that, but we came to you at that time, MC, because the MC allowed a few additional uses that the ME did not. But you, you're not inclined. You want the staff recommendation and plan commission recommendation on the ME, and that's where we are. But. These questions about transit, and I don't, I don't want to get engaged in the, 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 the sniping of whose ball is, whose ball is the court, the, whose court's the ball in, who has to pick up that and deal with the transit issue. The, re the reality is, if you can get a higher employer with, going to put two or three or 400 jobs out there, transit's a problem. It is, it will be, and yet that's the way you've zoned it. And you, you seem to want to hold to that, and I understand that, but holding to the, to the ME zone for the purpose of having it available for a large-scale employer to come along who's going to develop that. One, it's never going to happen. But even if it would, look at your ordinance. Have you tried to count how many parking spaces they're allowed to put out there? You've got a maximum allowed parking spaces that are great discouragement to, de to develop that site with a lot of employees. It's not allowed. Talk to you people on the BZA, they're already confronting the number of variances because I can't build a 1,000 square feet of seating capacity on a restaurant and allow parking. 10 parking spaces is what I get. 
That's for staff and patrons and customers. I get 10 parking spaces under UDO. Look at that same issue on what your ordinance allows for a high level development of a lot of employees. There's no place to park them. There'll be no garage, there's no public parking, and they're not, you're not allowed on site parking because the ordinance is allowed for it. So, I mean, all those concerns, the environmental, that's all in place even now. Nothing changes with this in my rezone if you would allow that. So, I uh, would encourage you to do so. But what is part of that is, is frustrating that, and I know I, maybe somebody from BDC is going to talk tonight. They have passed on some of these things. And, I, and, I've, and I've talked to, to Clark Griner, and I understand their, their policies, their concerns about maintaining adequate zone ground. But what he'd also tell you, and any of them will tell you, that to attract a new development for high employment. And Mr. It, Carmen, it is really difficult to interrupt you, but you've been yeah, past that, You've got too many people. While. I can't go on. So 10 seconds just to end the sentence. They want shovel-ready ground. This isn't shovel-ready ground. Nobody's come. We don't even have a workforce to handle to speak employers, let alone have a site ready for Thank them. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Thank you. And reminding everybody, we are allowing five minutes, but if you don't five, need five minutes, please don't feel you have to use it all. Who's at home that we can call on from Zoom? On Zoom is Christopher Knoll. Thank you, Mr. Knoll. Honorable counselors, thank you for entertaining this. Um, we, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I am a county employee, but I'm speaking more as a former reserve sheriff deputy. I've worked in the uh, uh, jail before under Sheriffs Sharp and Kennedy and uh, have seen the conditions in there. Um, you know, this would allow the county to move forward in uh, getting uh, inmates, you know, better services and better, better conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you for entertaining this. Um, I can assure you there's been lots of county minds um, spending untold hours and really years on this subject. Um, and, uh, you know, would... Uh, I appreciate moving forward. I uh, appreciate your time and have a wonderful evening and a Merry Christmas. Thank you. And our next speaker at the podium, if you will sign in, please, and state your name. Hi, my name is Sydney Foreman. Um, I think uh, rezoning this site for a new jail is rash and has not been thought through. Uh, the current complete lack of public transportation, which I know has been a hot topic tonight, um, the routes that are proposed to this site um, mean that it will at least take time to create the roads and the bus routes. The CJRC um, claims without evidence that bus routes will be added and will be adequate, and we have seen neither plans nor budget for such a change nor any communication from Bloomington Transit. And I think recognizing that transportation for a business hub with people who are working nine to five is going to look very different from individuals who are getting released from prison at 2 a.m. and have no way to get home, and that one person every day does very much matter that they have a way to get home as well. Um, majority of the responses, oh, sorry. <laughs> the CJRC reported on a survey that they conducted with the Monroe County Prosecutor's Office, the Public Defender's Office, and the Bar Association on their thoughts about the building and the building of a new jail and two remote courtrooms at the Fullerton Pike property. And the responses of this survey should be a huge red flag to everyone who is considering this rezone. If you haven't read them, I suggest you do. Um, a more majority of the responses were not in support of the addressed concerns about this location and transportation. Um, one of the re responses as the survey said, and I quote, that is the absolute worst idea I've ever heard. There is no possible way for me to do my job properly if some courts in the jail are a 20 minute drive away. This will slow down court proceedings and the judicial process even more. The judges will be furious, clients will be furious, attorneys will be furious every day, end quote. Another one says, quote, bad idea. There is plenty of space downtown, end quote. And the last one I will quote says, quote, it would be difficult to bring inmates from the proposed location to the Justice Building downtown. I see this being a lot of work and think you need to change your plan. It just doesn't seem feasible, end quote. Um, the comprehensive plan has dedicated this land to creating new jobs. Not only would this rezone of the property be determining the fate of this property is not creating any new jobs, but even the construction of the new jail would not create new jobs. 
Jail construction is so specialized it requires contractors with highly specific skills. The contracting companies available are specific and limited, and none of them are locally sourced. For example, in Franklin County, Ohio, near Columbus, a, jail, a new jail was built that the CJRC members have cited as a model jail for Monroe County. This jail was built by the multinational corporation DLZ. Hiring DLZ or an equivalent would channel local taxpayer money out of Bloomington and out of Monroe County. Whereas the original zone for the space would create employment because building shops, spaces for offices, or manufacturing is much less specialized and could rely on local, local contractors who employ local peop people. Um, the site is supposed to be an employment center, as mentioned. There are not many other sites in Bloomington which could support such an employment center on this scale. Rezoning this property, which is supposed to welcome people into Bloomington, for it to be used as a coercion, surveillance, and control, which will not continue to, which will not contribute to the safety of our community, it is a bad idea. So-called treatment in jail doesn't work and will not make this community safer. Meaningful employment, on the other hand, is one of the things that creates public safety. By neglecting the opportunity to develop our local economy, what the ED Lit funds are supposed to be for, we are missing opportunity to strengthen our community. So I strongly encourage you all to not support this rezone tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Our Zoom participants. Next up on Zoom is Natalia Galvin. Thank you, Ms. Galvin. Welcome. Hello, and I will not need um, my five minutes. Uh, my name is Natalia Galvin. Uh, I serve as the president of Monroe County National Organization for Women. However, I'm speaking only in a personal capacity. On August 25th, Monroe County Now hosted a panel entitled Criminal Justice Reform and Policing in Bloomington and Monroe County. Ms. Margie Rice, County Council Members Kate Wiltz, Jennifer Crosley, and City Council Member Sue Scambolari joined us on our panel. It was at this time that audience members learned about the lack of engagement our county commissioners fostered with city council on this issue. In my capacity as president, I personally reached out to Commissioner Githens, and by August 30th, we reached out to each commissioner in writing to implore adding city council members to the criminal justice task force. I am disheartened to hear Commissioner Thomas's presentation tonight regarding transit and alter alternative sites. In my mind, a more collaborative process could have begun months ago. It was asked for months ago. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Galvin. Step right up to the podium. Make sure you sign in and state your name. Hi, my name's Bryn Thomas. This rezone request was sent to you with a negative recommendation due to a number of important concerns. For one, the city's very own comprehensive plan says that this land should be used for new employment opportunities. Moving the jail and the existing jobs within the jail to a new location would not create opportunity for economic growth and employment in the city. Uh, in fact, CJRC has made claims regarding the efficiency of the new jail tonight, which if true mean the jail would in fact employ fewer people. Thus it would seem that staffing the new jail would not in fact create new jobs. Other proposals for this property include a golf course and a state-of-the-art medical facility, <clears throat> which would actually provide many more jobs and be more consistent with the goals and priorities of a comprehensive plan. Moreover, this rezone is contrary to the comprehensive plan that was developed with a lot of community input and work from our city. According to the comprehensive plan, the proposed site is part of the I-69 and interchange focus area the stated function of this area is to one, offer key opportunities as premier entry points into Bloomington, two, convey a sense of arrival in Bloomington, three, welcome and invite everyone to access the whole community and not simply provide a generic respite along an interstate highway. A jail is the opposite of the message we want to send about our community. A jail, whether it incorporates a treatment center or any of the other services that people have been talking about as something that's enlightened and liberal and humane to include in a jail, it's a jail and it's fundamentally and unavoidably about coercion, control, and punishment. It is not inviting or welcoming, it does not represent, to my mind, the Bloomington community. Please respect the restraints placed on this land by the comprehensive plan developed by the community. Please do not approve this rezone. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. And Thank you. Uh, 
Hume, um, if you want to make a comment, you'll need to use the reactions uh, tab to raise your hand um, for folks just joining. Next up on Zoom is Mikol Siegel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm sorry I can't appear. I, um, I, I, it seems to be um, made technically impossible by the structure of the call. Um, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to comment. Um, I have been speaking with uh, other members of the Bloomington community as part of an effort we're calling Care Not Cages, uh, a group that opposes the expansion of the prison system for a lot of the reasons that folks have articulated already. Um, I wanna talk about employment in general and the impact that moving the jail out of downtown would have. Um, if the new jail is built at this facility, most of the actors within the, con within the existing criminal legal system um, would have to leave downtown or spend large portions of their days away from downtown. Um, we're talking here about judges, lawyers, jurors, uh, when there are jury trials, all the law enforcement dealing with uh, bringing folks from the jail, in the jail, probation and parole, bail bondsmen, uh, people interacting with the new alternatives to incarceration um, like electronic monitoring, agencies that provide support for incarcerated people, for formerly incarcerated people and their families. Uh, and this means that we would be sucking all of that economic life out of Bloomington's downtown. Because you know, currently the way we have it set up uh, with the co-location in the downtown economy, this means that all the attorneys, clerks, judges, and staff who on a regular basis um, as a part of their jobs interact with people in the jail contribute to the downtown Bloomington economy. And so the, the courthouse resting in the heart of downtown Bloomington provides an opportunity for judges, judicial staff, attorneys and others um, to go to local restaurants, shops, pay for parking, uh, and to be regular members of the Bloomington community as they engage daily with downtown businesses. The, the rezoning then would um, cause the downtown Bloomington economy to suffer, which is precisely the opposite of the goal for this property in the comprehensive plan. Also, I want to second Bryn's point that if we have the staff, if we cut in half the staff of the existing jail, um, we have a net loss in employment there as well. Uh, and and I, I, was, I want to just make a comment as well about um, why the existing jail is a terrible space. Um, in part, it's a terrible space because it's a jail, period. In part, it's a terrible space because over the years, local officials have made decision after decision making it so. So in the CRJC, there's been much discussion of how the new jail would have blue walls and natural light. And uh, the existing jail lacks natural light because about 10 years ago, the jail chose to layer metal mesh over the windows so that people couldn't see their family members who used to gather on the pavement below holding up signs to their loved ones. Why do we think that a new facility would have officials making decisions any different than the ones they made about the existing facility? I think regardless of the sort of amorphous assurances we keep getting from Lee Jones, which seemed to involve her own personal crystal ball, to use Mike Carmen's image, there's just no reason to think that a new jail will end up being any better than an existing one, uh, even if it's built with you know, beautiful high windows in some cathedral-esque way. I do not understand why the CRJC thinks that they can convince the city council they're gonna be administering treatment in a jail, mental health treatment, substance abuse, any other kind of treatment. Everybody, even the pro-jail building figures agree that treatment is what the county needs. So let's build a treatment facility instead. Or even better, let's use the existing treatment providers. Let's fund them fully and let them help people outside of a detention facility. The jail should stay downtown. The population should be shrunk to the size of a small walnut by supporting the social services that we know keep people out of jail. 
Our community boasts many effective and experienced service providers who deliver these services at high quality and would do so even more with better funding. Then the jail will have the space for programming and meetings no longer bursting at the seams. It will easily meet constitutional standards. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you can approach the podium, state your name, please. Deb Fish, thank you for this opportunity. Um, in the ordinance previous to this one, I kept hearing how cost efficient, most efficient co-locating would be, integrating and coordinating services, but a move that far away would do just the opposite. And rather than just think of transportation, I'd rather more broadly think of access. Everyone that's gonna be here, that's gonna be there, it's not just providing a bus service, it's access, when they need it, how they need it. Um, the top reason people were in the current jail in 2021 was already failure to appear warrant. It's a complex problem, including getting notices to people whose housing is precarious. But some part of it involves people's ability to get to the court and all the related offices. It's already an enormous problem. We don't want to exacerbate it. Um, the last part that concerns me, I'm the chair of the Hope for Prisoners Task Force at UU. And in the last two years, I've connected with people who run the gamut of people who are incarcerated from death row to people in a local jail from a few weeks to 30 years. And the real impact that's hidden is on the families uh, and how much access they can get to keep those connections. At UU, we have a group called CAP, Kids with Absent Parents, and they have always been involved with the families and trying to provide support beyond um, just the person incarcerated. And so that access is really, really important, and I would really hope you would vote against this rezoning. Thank you. Do we have another commenter from the Zoom? Yes, next one in is Sam Silverman. Hi, um, my name is Sam Holderman. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to ask the council not to approve this rezone. Um, among the most pressing reasons against the Fullerton Pike location, in my opinion, for a new jail, um, are its incompatibility with the comprehensive plan, which was developed with extensive uh, consideration and feedback from the public. I know that's been mentioned uh, several times before, but I do think it is important that um, the city listens to and respects the democratic process that is represented in something like the comprehensive plan. plan. Um, additionally, the inaccessibility um, of the Fullerton Pike location to those who are transportation insecure, um, <clears throat> even though it's on I-69 and that may be great for uh, an ambulance going up to Indianapolis, we need to also be thinking about the people um, who are at risk for being incarcerated, how are they going to get to the jail? And, and I-69 is not going to help with, with that. Um, further, it's distance from the courts and probation offices. Um, it's distance from important service providers such as Beacon, New Leaf, New Life, Community Kitchen, Wheeler, and so on. Um, even if all the courts and offices were move down to Fullerton Pike, which again would have a huge impact on downtown, um, all those service providers are still downtown. And so, um, yeah, I, I, that doesn't seem like a, a, a thing that is sol a soluble problem to the county. Um, additionally, uh, we know from a survey conducted of the prosecutors and public defenders offices that this location has little to no support among the professionals who make up a large part of our criminal legal system. Um, for, I guess, the sake of time, I will expand on, I guess, two of these issues, one being the incompatibility of the, with the comprehensive plan, and also maybe 
talk a little bit more about uh, the fact that this location goes against the advice of the professionals working within the criminal legal system. Um, firstly, as has, has been mentioned uh, uh, before in this meeting, it was hoped that this site would be an employment center. And I believe that this use of the land would contribute more to um, the public safety of our community than would a jail. Um, as Lee Jones noted, often uh, jail makes things worse. It um, traumatizes people. It does not. Um, it does not contribute to public safety in the same way that stable and meaningful employment does. Um, so I would ask the the, the council to consider that. Um, and as noted in the the packet prepared for the plan commission, another uh, 25 to 40 plus acres of developable properly zoned land would be difficult to identify. Um, so this land, I see it as a, a, a valuable resource for our community, um, which should be used to, to truly further public safety through employment. Um, secondly, I would just like to quote from some of the open-ended responses to the survey uh, that the prosecutors and public defenders offices uh, conducted. Uh, one person wrote, uh, this is the worst possible site. As a public defender, the majority of the people I represent rely heavily on public transportation or walk. The centralized downtown location is perfect for the large indigent population I represent. It is also close to essential areas my clients frequent, such as New Leaf, New Life, Beacon, and AA meetings. Another person wrote, the location is untenable. There is no infrastructure to support the jail facility and no safe way to travel there. The population subject to the criminal system relies on supportive services only available in, Bo in uh, Bloomington downtown proper. New Leaf, New Life, Beacon, Wheeler Mission, Community Kitchen, all these places are accessible on foot from the current court and the current jail. I do not believe it is ethically possible to relocate the jail to Fullerton Pike without major development of the proposed area and relocation of supportive services. People are released from jail without shoes in winter. Doing it on the side of a highway with the closest public utility being a McDonald's two miles away is a terrible, terrible idea. Um, yeah, there's a lot more I think that could be said, but I guess in the interest of time, I will uh, wrap it up there and ask that the city council follow the recommendation of the plan commission and vote against this proposed rezone. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, anyone else from Zoom or here in Chambers? Please step up and state your name. Hi, my name is Kevin Weinberg. Um, yeah. So, yeah, first of all, in response to the county's mantra about overcrowding, it's worth reiterating that citizens don't transform into inmates through, like, magic, but it's because the county has decided to arrest and cage them rather than do the vulnerable, difficult, introspective work as a community, but asking what are the underlying health and social problems that cause these people um, to be in this position. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, an, it's a red herring. The idea of overcrowding is a red herring, and the basic impetus for this proposal needs to be questioned because research shows that funding healthcare is both an effective anti-crime measure, but also just uh, obviously the kinder approach to issues of mental health and addiction. Yeah, fund healthcare. Um, not, yeah, care not cages. I agree with this. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a reasonable platform. Um, that said, I was pleased and surprised to see a transitional supportive housing and detox center as proposed uses for the land. Um, unfortunately, I don't recall this being part of any previous iteration of the proposal, and I've been very attentive to the CJRC so far, so I'm not sure like if this, where this came from, but it's, I'm glad it's being proposed, um, and I hope that continues. Uh, yeah, that aside, I'm, I'm just generally concerned about the urgency and speed with which this proposal is moving forward and would ask the council to take time to carefully consider this um, pretty large decision. Um, I feel like it would impact me and a lot of people I know a lot, and so I, I think it should take some, it, should, it shouldn't be rushed into. Um, yeah, so I think regardless of what you think about the appropriateness of like kind of continual jail expansion as a reasonable answer to issues like mental health and addiction, um, I think that the way the county has pursued this proposal to construct this particular facility has, it's been kind of shady. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's like, what's the word, uh, gene relevant, whatever, yeah. Um, but yeah, they've been, 
don't know, they're presenting it as this kind of race against time with this sort of artificial deadline. They've excluded public comments from CGRC meetings until pretty recently after being pressured to finally listen to the public. They hired this consultant company that just like happened to report that they support, the, that they support their employers like long-standing jail expansion agenda. I don't know if anyone's like questioning this like third party like consultant thing at all, but I just think it's kind of funny that they like paid this consultant company money and then they're like, oh yeah, we agree with what you've always been saying you've wanted to do for decades. Um, we're just gonna write it in a hundred, hundred and hundred page report. Um, yeah, but even most importantly, the county has failed to follow the consultant's advice that they hired, um, which, you know, the consultants asked that quote, the county take immediate steps to study the feasibility of maintaining the current jail facility. You know, and past the, past the um, construction of the report itself, it's not clear the county has taken any steps towards studying the feasibility of maintaining the current jail facility. Um, and I think that's really relevant here. I think it's a huge, it's a huge change from the comprehensive master plan, um, and they should have a good reason for doing it, yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, it's like city council recalls that the comprehensive plan was an arduous process, huge amount of public outreach, so many hours of discussion, I was working for CATS at the time. I was, you know, yawning, trying to get through these meetings with you all. You didn't see me, but I was back there, and I was just like, wow, you're really putting a lot of work into trying to gather um, public input about what the community wants from the town. And I think you need a compelling reason to go against that, especially at 11.15 p.m. when, it, you know, it's just like even the petitioners are gone because it's just, it's late. I don't blame them, you know? Um, so it feels like a lot to approve this right now. Um, yeah, I just also want to say the arguments made for the jail expansion are all kind of like specious in their, in their own ways. Like, that, you know, there's been much ado made about the fact that large limestone jails expire after 30 years. Um, there's this idea that like the federal government is like on the verge at any moment of like forcing the construction of a new cruel jail unless we just build an immediate one without delay, which, um, yeah, we could talk about that in detail. I'm happy to, but yeah, this just doesn't really hold out. Um, yeah, and just again, that just, you know, the idea that uh, incarceration is this sort of constant, this eternal constant, and we must just kind of continually uh, expand the jail system. You know, it's, we just, I think it's, we, we shouldn't just accept that on its face and think about creative solutions to these problems like funding healthcare. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, I'm just gonna quote again. I, people have been quoting things from this like internal county survey, but I think we should listen to experts. And yeah, I'm just gonna finish by reading um, something from someone within the criminal justice system. Uh, they say, the conversation seems oh, to I'm keep- I'm sorry, you are at your time, so- Oh, could I, could I just finish my one sentence? Go right ahead. Cool. The conversation seems to keep turning to make the jail larger, which solves no problem and poses larger concerning ones. Just talk about the really cruel conditions in the jail. Think Thank you. That should be remedied first. We had one more hand raised on Zoom from Will Bird or Thank Beige. you, Ms. Bird. Welcome. I believe. Hold on. There we go. Hello, my name is Donielle Bird, and I thank you all for your consideration of this issue. I am speaking this evening to ask that you deny this rezone request. I have um, been a social worker in Bloomington for over 25 years and um, also community taxpayer. I'm really concerned about my tax money I'm going to uh, fund something that I believe is ineffective at um, making us safer. And I think it's um, a concern for me. But also, I am on the, uh, I'm a member of Care Not Cages. I'm on the board of New Leaf, New Life. I do want to uh, call attention, uh, call your attention to a statement that New Leaf, New Life uh, very carefully uh, discussed um, with staff and board um, that is uh, in opposition to this uh, proposed location. And I believe New Leaf, New Life um, has a really uh, important uh, voice here um, because they have served uh, over 15 years. Uh, they have direct experience supporting individuals in Monroe County while they're incarcerated and after they're released. Uh, New Leaf, New Life has it 
an absolutely unique vantage point and believes it's necessary and productive to share their thoughts and concerns. Um, and also I've talked with um, a lot of individuals who are formerly incarcerated who are against um, this. And, and unfortunately their voices have been left out uh, um, of this process. And um, there's not really any opportunity other than showing up now to make public comment perhaps um, at a CJRC meeting. Um, but uh, this is a, a little excerpt here from the statement from New Leaf, New Life that I'd like to read. Uh, first and foremost, we believe that the conversation has over-indexed on building a new jail facility. For example, the size, the location, associated capital investment, when only one of four guiding principles of the Monroe County Community Justice Response Committee and only seven of over 30 recommendations in Monroe County, Indiana 2020 criminal justice and incarceration study pertain to the jail facility. Furthermore, several aspects of the current proposal, um, building a new jail in the outskirts of town for 60 to $70 million are either not necessary and or actually make it more difficult to achieve the desired justice, public safety and community wellness. Um, the first point, a bigger jail is not required, will produce barriers to improving the criminal legal system. Um, so when we have access to bigger jails and, and the proposed, uh, I've been attending these meetings, the proposal is to build a pod system that could easily be expanded uh, in the future. So access to bigger jail, they find people to fill it. Presently, the population capacity of the jail creates an external incentive for the local criminal legal system to avoid incarcerating non-dangerous persons and lengthy pretrial detention. If that capacity is increased and the population constraints are removed, it is likely that the system will respond by caging more people for longer, increasing recidivism rates, not reducing them. Cheaper, immediately available solutions to jail overcrowding remain available by simply not incarcerating people for technical probation violations, low level and nonviolent crimes, and returning to use or substance use violations. A bigger jail with a larger pretrial population accused of nonviolent crimes does nothing to make our community safer, but it does diminish our ability to provide justice for all those that can't afford to bond out. It diminishes our ability to provide services that are needed. Uh, we do need uh, more mental health care. We do have some wonderful providers in our community that are under-resourced. This amount of money um, is really problematic that it is being misappropriated um, for this new facility. Uh, the $70 million price tag for a new jail, jail is both fiscally and socially irresponsible. Um, this new bigger remote jail will not reduce recidivism and in fact may increase them. Heavy price tag does limit Monroe County's investment capacity needed for areas that will clearly move us forward toward de desired justice, public safety and community wellness. So um, I just want to just underscore that um, we can't staff our current jail. This is not an employment opportunity for our community to rezone this property. Um, this uh, is, is, while people say it's going to be more efficient, I, I'm not sure, like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. It's an employment opportunity, but we don't have to employ as many people. Uh, uh, and then Burke. the amount of money that we're spending um, transporting people is a concern. A lot of people are released from incarceration wearing uh, exactly what they were when they were incarcerated. We've had people at New Leaf, New Life show up in flip-flops and shorts in, in cold weather, very cold weather. And uh, a transit bus that is a shuttle is not going to be sufficient. Thank so you, Ms. Burke. Just, you are at your time. You. We do appreciate your very thorough comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. We had one more hand go up on Zoom. Oh, sorry. We have someone here at the podium. Let's start here. Good evening. My name is Seth Mutchler. I have been a Bloomington community member for 13 years, and I am a member of the local community group Care Not Cages, an autonomous and non-hierarchical grassroots organization uh, engaged in community organizing and activism to fight for justice in Monroe County's incarceration system. Um, I want to begin by saying that 
I'm really just shocked by the petitioner's uh, presentation and responses and how many inaccuracies and misrepresentations it had that I personally find offensive. Um, I don't want to speak rashly, though, and I did spend quite an amount of time working on my public comment, so I will read just that as I brought it to this meeting. Um, but I do want to highlight one point. The petitioner um, brought forward this uh, statement that starts with right at 36 years. It is evident that the Monroe County Jail has exceeded its structural and functional life cycle, and it continues. I just want to point out that that is the finding section of that report, and immediately following is the recommendations section that reads to develop a strategic plan that systematically guides the timely implementation of sustainable facility repairs, upgrades, and renovation. That is the recommendation. Um, so I just want to point that out, um, and then I'll move on to sort of what I, what I brought for this meeting. Um, so I do have opinions on the proposed jail, but rather than share those tonight, I would like to highlight some of the expert opinions from our community and beyond. Uh, first, I want to reference a 2021 report commissioned by Monroe County, which focuses on the estimated 75 to 80 percent of individuals at any given time in Monroe County Correction Center that have mental health and or substance use disorders and provides 39 recommendations, none of which are to build a new jail. The county also commissioned a 2021 report, the Ken Ray Report, on the criminal justice system broadly speaking. This study also provided 33 recommendations, with again, none recommending a new jail construction. The recommendation that is closest to building a new jail reads, quote, county officials should complete a study that compares the capital, maintenance, and operating costs of renovating the existing facility to new construction. This study has not yet been completed, yet the county is attempting to move forward with a new jail construction on the land in question in this ordinance. I will next turn to the plan commission, as we heard from this evening. Uh, they certified this zoning ordinance with a recommendation of denial. In their report, the plan commission was concerned about misalignment with City of Bloomington's comprehensive plan and stated that there are, quote, significant concerns about the assumptions made for this petition and lack of community-wide conversation about the impact of this map amendment and its intended use. In the criminal justice system locally, there is dissent to this plan. As um, Danielle Bird just read, New Leaf, New Life recently published a statement opposing the proposed new jail, and the public defender and prosecutor's office jointly conducted a survey of their employees, as well as the Bar Association, and 30 respondents wrote in regarding co-location between the proposed site as a jail and the current justice center for courts and offices for at least five to 10 years, which is the plan at this time and 26 of the 30 responses opposed this plan, um, including one person who wrote, and as uh, somebody else already read, quote, that is the absolute worst idea I've ever heard. Uh, the judges will be furious, clients will be furious, attorneys will be furious every day. Finally, members of the Community Justice Reform Committee, the group who originally envisioned this project, have since spoken out against the construction on this land proposed to be rezoned. At their most recent meeting, Judge Crothy asked, quote, is there a reason, and I don't think it's really been talked about, why we couldn't renovate the current jail space and the current building? And County Council member Jennifer Crossley, in reference to the Fullerton Pike plan, said, quote, I don't feel comfortable. I know it's late in the game to say that, considering that it's going to first reading for the City Council on Wednesday. I don't feel comfortable. And I just want to say thank you to the both of them for really speaking out at those, at those meetings and making the hard, hard conversations that need to happen. So I understand at this time we are only talking about the rezoning of a plot of land from mixed-use employment to mixed-use institutional. I hesitate to get too far ahead in the process. However, the intended use of this land, if rezoned, has been given loud and clear. And the council is directed to, quote, take into consideration the entire constellation of the criteria, balancing the statutory factors. A municipality must consider all factors and make a balanced determination. I desperately want improved conditions for those who are incarcerated and support criminal justice reform, as do the experts I cited tonight. But I feel, as do these experts, that building a new jail on the Fullerton Pike property is not the solution to these problems. I hope that with all of these perspectives in mind, you will vote to not rezone the Fullerton Pike property. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up on here, we have Becca Schwartz. Hi, my name is Becca Schwartz. Um, I'm a resident in Ellettsville. I'm a, a student at Maurer Law School and I'm also a part of uh, Care Not Cages. Uh, I really don't have too much more to add than what everyone else has said tonight, but I just want to add to the voices to please ask you to vote no to the rezoning. 
I think as, as people who have immense uh, privilege and power in your position right now, uh, you know, you're charged with making the best decision for our community and what's healthy and uh, kind, as Kay said, um, for the people that we're trying to serve. And so I would just please implore you to vote no to the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in chambers? Hi, my name is Maggie. Um, and I just wanted to make a brief comment. I feel like there's a lot that's already been said. But yeah, just I think overall that whole conversation with Lee Jones opening up and essentially stating that jail can actually cause more harm to the community than good. Um, and then also this new discussion that has just the first time this has been brought to my attention of potential transitional housing and mental health facility and a detox center. So at, at this point, I've never heard this before and I've been following this very well. Um, and so I'm, I'm really concerned that either there's not a real plan for this property or proponents are distracting the conversation with light talk of treatment while planning incarceration expansion behind closed doors. Um, so, and I think either way, if they would like to focus on treatment, the fact that they have not reached out to anyone doing programming inside the jail or anyone doing treatment in this town or any formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated individuals um, really does show where, they're, where, they're, where they lie in this, you know, not including any of those people in this conversation. Um, and it also just shows their lack of planning. And I mean, I, I think that presentation was just, I mean, it was an absolute joke. And thank you. Thank you. right now. All right, no one on Zoom, so anyone here in chambers? All right, seeing none, that concludes our public comment and that brings us back to council for either questions or comments or council member Vaughan. I had more questions, but I think I'm done and uh, I'm just gonna express my opinion. Um, the first question that came up here is uh, the concern that anyone has about moving a jail to another neighborhood uh, because people are afraid of living near the jail, it implies somehow that uh, the jail's unsafe from the outside, but people walk past it every day. There's never been an incident. There's never been an escape from the jail. It's, it's well run in that one respect. Uh, otherwise, uh, should we not be immediately concerned about the jail's continued presence downtown? I find that uh, disappointing that we have to put the jail in the middle of nowhere, partly because nobody wants to be near it. That's the reason to keep it downtown. I want to elaborate a little bit about uh, an alternate proposal that I began to float. Uh, again, the Public Defender's Building, 8,000 square feet, you can build up to six stories on it because the county got permission to build a six-story parking garage right next door. That's up to 48,000 square feet that could uh, house offices related to the justice complex. Step two, Existing services in Showers North could be moved to that building. Step three, rehab Showers North into a jail. Again, the footprint of that building is 33,000 square feet. Uh, if they were also to take over Showers West, the, uh, the uh, Showers Plaza that we talked about in the previous thing, that's 32,000 square feet of footprint of first floor square footage, that's 65,000 square feet. That's exactly the square footage that Mr. Cockerell said was what they were looking for, about 10,000 more square feet than they have right now serving uh, the jail. Uh, step four, tear down the clearly irreparable Zitlow Center. It's not a good building, it's not well designed. Uh, and when they rebuild, build with a jail on the bottom floors or just make it a city county public safety building. We just heard tonight how Bloomington police and Bloomington fire need new headquarters and we know that there's precedent for the BPD and the sheriff to co-locate. That would be a different synergy, but it would also be a benefit to the community. How about we also put the city's new employee clinic in such a building and expand it to provide medical services to the inmates? The city could help a lot. We could be creative about it if we just are willing to talk together. We've been collaborating with the county for years, as we heard tonight, with animal control and building permits. Again, the county could acquire, and could instead of acquiring Showers West, also build on the 30,000 square feet of parking lot in front of Showers North. They did, after all, just build 
seven levels of parking down the street six years ago at a cost of $10 million, which they'd abandon if they moved to Fullerton Pike, and who knows what they're planning to do with it. And banning it before its time, it's going to have a decades-long history. Uh, not to mention the Trades District Garage, which we all know is underutilized because the pandemic squelched the commercial development that it was meant to spur. We've got bargain basement parking spots to lease to the county for the jail that they could build in Showers North. Uh, you know, I'm ready to cut a deal, and uh, certainly they don't need that parking in front of that building. The county has estimated that it has 70 to $98 million to put toward a better design facility. The city and county have mutual interests in public safety, mutual ability to invest in the right kind of infrastructure, why did the county not consider partnering with the city to co-build public safety infrastructure? More importantly, would they consider it at all at this point? Regardless of whether the jail should be expanded, that building is in bad shape, it's badly designed. Uh, besides the jail being on top of the offices when it should be the other way around, it's a brutalist concrete building and it's unbelievable that the county considers it to be at the end of its life after only 35 years. That's the lifespan that uh, the 4th Street Garage, the old 4th Street Garage had, and it was should, that should have been a 50-year garage. Buildings should be built for 100 years that are not parking garages. Uh, I can't believe we built such a jail in 1985 that needs to be torn down now. But I definitely don't support them rehabbing the building. The main constraint that I see is the county's understandable desire to have jail cells on the first floor of a building. But they have a decided disinterest in building mixed use on top of those cells or staying downtown that anyone is talking about building a campus is problematic. We already have one giant campus in our midst run by a single authority that makes governance of the city complicated. We don't need another one. We already do in our local agreements with the county. Uh, we know how to do it. It hasn't been a matter of lack of ability. Working together has been a lack of will. The county's been under a court order for 13 years, yet they haven't looked at building up on existing property downtown. It's good that the commissioners are finally developing a strategic plan through their Community Justice Response Committee, but why is it that they can't see fit to use the word Bloomington in reference to the community? Consistently, the commissioners avoided any mention of the city in their meetings of the CJRC. Let me quote, in fact, what uh, Commissioner Thomas said um, in uh, the August meeting. And I, uh, she said, I think we need to keep this main committee of 14 as the Monroe County decision makers as we are now. She did not favor including even one person from the city, a Bloomington police captain, a member of the city council, somebody from the mayor's office on this 14 member committee. As if somehow the Bloomington Police Department doesn't book people into the jail, as if the community of Bloomington doesn't have a direct interest in everything that happens in and around the jail. Uh, so that is what makes me most disappointed. They even said uh, that they didn't even want to invite, quote, outside entities, included, which in, meant the city of Bloomington, to serve on potential subcommittees of the CJRC. And now they come to us asking to rezone so they can build a jail in a place where nobody wants it except themselves and the sheriff's office. Uh, everyone else thinks it's a bad idea. Uh, we should reject this rezone and uh, we need to, to persuade the commissioners that maybe we can be dealt with and maybe we can help and maybe we can help them stay downtown. Maybe we can build something together. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Scambolori, question or comment? Uh, comment, actually, and I'm not sure I could top that one. Uh, sure. No. <laughs> um, one of the first things we heard this evening, uh, well, actually, I will ask a question. I don't see the commissioners in chambers anymore. Are they on Zoom even? We, so they haven't notified you of that. All right. Then this will be just a comment. Um, fairly early on in her remarks tonight, Commissioner Thomas said, what, asked, what are you going to do about transit? Apparently, the city has a role. Um, Mr. Cockrell described the city police, Bloomington police, as being major users of the facility. I would go a step further and say they are major elements of the community justice system as a whole. Not just major users of a building, but actually major elements of this facility as a whole. Uh, 
we, one of the things we heard about from Ms. Scanlon was a lack of clarity around the plan for this particular site and the intended project. Um, wouldn't at least some of this have been alleviated had the city been involved in the CJRC from the beginning? Uh, I would like to think it could have been. Perhaps not everything would have been resolved, but I would like to think some of it has. Um, I have too many questions um, and too many concerns to support this rezone this evening. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, first thing, I really want to thank Mr. Cockrell for the time you've taken this evening. Um, your colleagues, they're not here anymore, but thank them too. Um, first of all, what we've been asked to do is to consider the rezone. I mean, that, that's, uh, we're talking about a lot of stuff. Rezone is what we've been requested to do. I do want to make note that the plan commission has given a negative recommendation. Just like any other land use project, I take what our boards and commission, and particularly the plan commission, I take their recommendations seriously. We don't always follow them to the T, but uh, that's what they do, and I take that seriously. Um, just remember that. Now, um, I've heard my comments about the term uh, uh, transit, for example. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Um, I would like to suggest that Maybe what is it we're going to do? I, I just wonder sometimes why we can't get to the we. Why we can't get there? The us, the we. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. Um, the US criminal justice system, jail. I mean, let's just face it. This is a, 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 a system that is intended, that is punitive. It's intended to punish. It has never been intended to be re rehabilitative. Not in the United States, it has not. So let's just understand that going in. Now, having said that, understand that there are some people out here that needs to be separated from society. They need to be incarcerated because they've done some violent things or something that is not acceptable in society. It's not near as many people as we lock up and, and separate, um, but let's not ever not acknowledge the fact that there are some that behave in a manner that need to be separated. That don't justify a whole new jail that's gonna be filled as soon as we build it. It don't justify that. There, it does justify space to uh, separate folks. Even those that, are in, that need to be in, incarcerated need to be treated humanely with compassion and with respect. Pretty simple, I think. Um, we've talked about criminal justice reform. Um, some of us have kind of always talked about that to, to some extent. Really became a big topic um, during the pandemic and the George Floyd and all the other things really became a big topic. Defund, you know, blah, all of that. We, we were all there. I've never really been a proponent to defund um, public safety, but I have been a big proponent of redistributing those funds. Um, one of the things is we're, we're getting um, uh, non-sworn officers to help to do certain things. Um, we're weaning ourselves off the need to have sworn badged officers. We're going to need them. We just may not need as many, depending on where we're going with, with our other planning and those sorts of things. But the most important thing for reform is wraparound services and programming. And I think we all recognize that. I think we all know that. We just kind of got to figure out how to get there. Um, how do we serve and address mental health concerns, addiction, substance abuse, which includes alcohol? Um, uh, how do we deal with these? Um, uh, 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 controlling violence, um, tendencies. How do we work through these without necessarily locking a person up 
on, on every given chance. Um, last thing I'll finish with, I thought it was awful telling. Um, when I asked a question earlier about uh, board of judges, public defenders, prosecutors, that sort of thing, the, the stakeholders in our public safety. Um, and I'm not so sure I ever got a direct answer. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Um, uh, well, there, there are certain assumptions that's made and a certain, okay, what they, uh, finally after a couple minutes, it was like they didn't recommend it or the majority of them. That's not the end of the world, but to me, that's a starting point to have deeper public engagement and conversation to address what it is we need from reform of criminal justice in our community. Um, like some of my colleagues said, uh, maybe eventually it'll be us. It's not city versus county, you know, black versus white, rich versus poor. I mean, those are realities, but what we have to do is engage. And what is best for all of us? What is best for all of us? Um, so it, it, it would be, we, we need a campus. <laughs> um, just like with public safety earlier, we're talking about campus for fire department and police department. I mean, so, so we do need a criminal justice that's a wraparound that has some forms of incarceration maybe, mostly programming, rehab services, you know, uh, uh, directing people to where they can get help and services and involve the people that deal with this, the judges, the prosecutors, the probation people. You know, the, these are some of the things that help keep people out of being incarcerated as, as much as possible. Um, years ago, and some, somebody in public comments mentioned this, and I used to do some work with NAACP and work with those things. One of the biggest causes for people, that, uh, in particularly people of color and, and poorer people, to go back and recidivism was failure to appear. I've hated that. In most cases, not necessary because a person that is unhoused, where's their address? How, how do we mail it to them? How do we text them? How do we do that? It was something simple years ago, and I'm like, well, I'll tell you what, if you give them a new court date, won't you put it on that card and put it in their hand while they're standing there in front of you? That, that's a, it, it, it could be a game changer. Um, but I've kind of got off track here, because we could talk about this for a while. Um, I want to thank everyone that made comments this evening that helped, I mean, uh, in support of or against. I just think it's healthy to do that. Um, but like many of my colleagues at this point, in this particular pro piece of property that we're talking about, I think right up tonight it's going to be pretty difficult to support that as of today. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I will remind everyone that we are looking at a quarter to 12, and we have a hard stop at 12. So I'm welcoming council comments, but uh, could we keep them brief? Council Member Rosenbarger. Much. I will try to just um, add in to things my, co my colleagues have said so I don't repeat, but I would love to repeat everything they've said. I agree that this does not sound like the best step forward, and I will be voting no on this tonight. One big reason, sorry, Councilmember Sims did say this, the plan commission did not um, approve this, and planning and transportation also did not recommend it, and that always weighs heavy in my book. Um, I'm a big fan of supporting our, uh, our agreed upon plans in the city, so the comprehensive plan has this as an employment center to keep pace with changing economy, and a rezone does not support that. As Ms. Scanlon said, there's been no information presented on how the population served by this facility will be able to access it and what sort of supportive activities are planned for this location. I think those are two very important things that we would need, have needed to know before, before agreeing that a jail should be so far out. As Ms. Ms. Galvin commented on, on Zoom tonight, a more collaborative approach was needed and requested, but it was rejected. 
And I think, you know, again, what Council Member Sims says, a lot of times it is um, us and us. And I think quite often this, if folks want to work together and we're not given that opportunity. Um, that's, I think, all that I have. The last piece that I don't think has been said yet, we did not get to see any numbers or estimates for renovating the current location or really take a look at other options. And I think after our, our first order of business tonight with the police headquarters and fire, it is very important for us up here to do our due diligence and to make sure a location that we're selecting for city services is the best location. So I'll be voting no, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I just think this is a terrible location for a new jail um, due to, uh, well, it's just, it's too far away. There's no access. There's, uh, it's, it, it's the comparison with um, a business and how we would accommodate transportation for a business is uh, ridiculous. Um, a jail is, uh, unfortunately, in today's society, a place where a uh, greater proportion of um, indigent people uh, end up, and those people often do not have transportation. Uh, regardless of how much money you have when you get out of jail, you usually don't have a car there in the parking lot. So it, uh, it's just not, not a realistic place um, to put a jail uh, without any guarantees of um, transit, and of course transit doesn't run 24-7, saying that um, only one person on average per day is let out um, after 8 p.m., that's still one person per day who may not have any place to go. Um, so I uh, will support the Plan Commission's recommendation and uh, deny this rezone. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Flaherty. Try to keep it brief. Um, I won't be supporting this tonight. I agree it's a, a poor location for many of the reasons uh, cited. Um, two things to follow up on. One is um, that I think what's the biggest takeaway here about a, a meaningful next step for all of us is to modify the process by which this uh, has been pursued to date to make it inclusive and collaborative. Uh, certainly, last week actually, or I think it was last week, Commissioner Thomas was here talking about how the city is the county. We are one and the same. We need to collaborate. The CIB for the Convention Center, for instance. Uh, we need the same approach here. Um, the commissioner should amend Ordinance 2021-31, which created the Community Justice Response Committee. They should do so after seeking input from the CJRC and members of the public. And they should certainly include city staff. Uh, there were suggestions of, of uh, staff from BPD, from the mayor's office or his designee. Uh, a council member at least would be uh, warranted, but um, I believe it was Maggie who made the final public comment, uh, had a lot of good points as well um, about including folks who, who work in programs related to the jail and, and surrounding um, support services, uh, folks with uh, experience um, uh, as a formerly incarcerated individual. It would be better to get those perspectives directly involved as committee members as well, or at the very least in a more formal way. Uh, so that we don't have the types of survey responses um, that, that, we are, that we are seeing that were alluded to earlier by Councilmember Sims. So I think that process can be fixed, uh, and I think that's, it would show a lot uh, to, to do that, and I think we can reach a much better, uh, more, more consensus-like approach if we do that. The other piece I wanted to mention is just following up on um, an appropriate in-depth assessment of, of rehabilitation or renovation, what that looks like. Um, it sounds like at least Judge Crothy and Councillor Crossley have been requesting that, um, at least somewhat recently, and I know members of the public have been requesting it for quite some time, actually, not to mention the recommendation within the Ken Ray report. Um, so I think that needs to be explored meaningfully as well. Again, I think it's relevant here not because we're the fiscal body, you know, for the folks making this decision. We're not, of course. It's a different role. Uh, but when we're considering rezones and where else this can go, uh, feasibility of the current site is relevant. So that needs to be explored with a, with a level of diligence that uh, would give us confidence about whether or not it's possible or not, and as opposed to sort of writing it off because, um, you know, it was labeled cost prohibitive with a, a preliminary assessment. So those are the two big takeaways for me. Um, uh, again, I'll be voting no tonight. Thank you. 
Thank you. I certainly have appreciated all this robust discussion. Uh, the matter before us, this body, of course, is not whether to locate the jail in any particular place, but whether we agree to uh, accept the Planning Commission's recommendation to not rezone our ME parcel. Uh, and so um, it is, um, it's, it's my pleasure to be able to welcome community input like this. It's very valuable for the community to understand what's in front of the county and their decision as to what they do going from here. But I too will, uh, will uh, not support that we rezone our property. That's, that's our decision to make. And we leave it up to our county colleagues to move from here. All right, so with that, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll on Ordinance 22-38? Yes, Council Member Sims? No. Scambalori? No. Sandberg? No. Rollo? No. Flaherty? No. Rosenbarger? No. Piedmont Smith? No. Smith? No. And Volan? No. And that is unanimous, zero, nine, zero. With that, we move on to um, additional public comment. There is no first reading. Uh, we typically allow 25 minutes for that. I am really hoping there is no public comment on matters not covered on tonight's agenda, but in case there are. In case there are, if there are members on Zoom who wish to comment, uh, you need to raise your hand using the reactions tab or more tab. At this time, I don't see any hands raised. Very good, and I don't see anybody rushing to the podium, so let's move on to council schedule. Anything to discuss? Hi, Mr. Lucas. Hello, uh, nothing uh, to discuss. Just want to note that the council uh, has its next scheduled meeting on January 11th uh, for your uh, initial organizational meeting. Uh, so you've got two weeks off. Uh, have a great uh, holiday and we will see you next year. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. And I do wish everyone a safe next couple of days as we approach the storm and approach the holidays. And with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? All in favor say aye. aye. Good evening, everyone.